in which it stands, one nation, and under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, that takes us to public comments. Uh, just to avoid any confusion, there are several sign-up sheets outside, and while these people get to go first, anybody who wants to talk can talk. The original uh, public comment that we'll take right now will be those things of general nature. If you want to speak about a specific um, issue that's before us later today, you should probably wait until that issue comes up because we take public comment before we vote on everything. So um, those people who are signed up for public comment now, if you want to talk now, you can. If you want to wait till your project comes up, that's fine too. Um, Fred, we talk now or you want to wait for the airport? Yeah, I, think, I think we'll wait till. Uh the, um, the issue comes up on the agenda. Okay, and that would be John and Trent as well? John, yes. Okay. Um, any other public comment at this time? Okay, we're going to close public comment and meeting minute review. Any comments, changes, or a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> okay. Um, Extension request. There are none. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Updates. Legislation and legal matters. Mr. Todd. Morning. Morning. Thank you, Mr. Members. Thank you for having me in this morning. So if I can get out of here before the rain hits. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few, a few ordinances that I want to go through today that the commissioners have taken action on. First one, 1302, which is a special events in the resource conservation area, which I know you guys are very familiar with. The uh, hearing date on that is scheduled for July 23rd. They introduced the amendment to that this weekend, which or this past Tuesday, which was the amendment that called out for a number of changes, specifically the Critical Area Commission will review the special event zoning certificate, and it added a third category as far as acreage size and the number of events that you could have so that as i said the hearing on that will be on the 23rd next one uh, ordinance 1307 neighborhood and village center the changes to the provisions on that and i want to thank Stephen helen for the work on that the uh, they work closely with uh, some of the groups out there that had interest in this and the commissioners voted unanimously to support that and the effective date is july 27th 1303 was the uh, act concerning residential densities on waterfront villages, uh, excuse me, in the waterfront village center zoning district, and the commissioners also voted unanimously on that one. 1311 and 1312, the uh, 1311. Yes, what did I say? Just unanimously. Okay. <laughs> yes, in favor. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, 1311 is the. Um, Act concerning the rezoning of parcels 99, 15, and 37 in Queen Anne's County Tax Map 48, which is the Lowe's property. The hearing on that is the 25th of June. County Ordinance 1312 is also a, a rezoning, and that's uh, the Allendale rezoning, and that is scheduled for a public hearing on the 25th as well. And 1313 and the amendment to 1313 were also approved on this past Tuesday. They have to do with volunteer fire companies in Queen Anne's County, specifically Graysonville Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, they had they combined their volunteer ambulance department and their fire department together, which resulted in a need for us to change the ordinance to remove um, any reference to volunteer ambulance departments out of the ordinance. So that was <coughs> that was uh, voted on and takes effect on the 27th of July. Voted unanimously on that one in favor of. Uh, ordinance 1315 commercial forestry amendment was introduced on uh, the 11th with a public hearing on the 23rd and ordinance 1317 and 1318 both have public hearings on the 25th 1317 is the electrical construction regulations for electrical exam examiners and 1318 is the tax credit for certain businesses under section 510 of the code of county laws we had uh, legislation put in place in the, at this past session that reduced the amount of employees required to get that tax credit if real property improvements are put into place so i want to actually thank faith uh, rosing for spearheading that and getting that done so that concludes the ordinances on a couple other notes uh, the commissioners will strike the budget next Wednesday. They had scheduled to do it this past Tuesday, but there's still some discussions with uh, what to do with Board of Education specifically. 
and staff has been working closely with uh, staff from MDE and MDP on different funding strategies for Route 8 Sewer. That's a, always an entertaining time to meet with those guys. And the third one, the courthouse, we had a pre-bid this past Tuesday with the architectural firms that were selected to bid on it. So we're moving forward with the circuit courthouse. So any questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. I really didn't have anything uh, additional for this month unless Chris had. Steve, I had one question. I, I read in the newspaper that the <coughs> flood maps were out for review and that 100 properties that weren't in the floodplain went in, but 2,000 properties that were in the floodplain came out. Is that accurate? I Ugly accurate? It, Except I'm not exactly sure about those, those numbers you put out. Um, but in general, the floodplain maps, um, the area of the county covered by the floodplain has been reduced. Um, many we were kind of expecting the maps to go the other way that larger areas of the county would be included in the floodplain but it actually um, uh, we saw it recede in, in certain areas um, based on the methodology that they used to put together the floodplain maps and um, the, a new datum the a GIS datum that they used so um, but no they, the maps are changing the county will be holding a public information <coughs> meeting on June 24th at Queen Anne's County High School um, there are notices going out to people in the floodplain um, of the meeting. Um, and then there is also um, a, a web page people can go to to search their address and their property, which is Maryland Floodplain. I think it's MarylandFloodplain.org or uh, Maryland Flood Maps. Um, but it's MDE's website where you can actually go on, take a look, put your address in, and, and um, um, determine whether you're impacted by the new floodplain maps. Um, but the Department of Public Works is heading up this initiative and they'll, they'll have a public outreach meeting June 24th and then probably one later this fall as these maps move through the process. Mr. Cahoon, you said June 24th at Queen Anne's County High? Yes. And did you give us the time? I'm sorry. No, I, um, six, six to eight. Thank you. It's not directly related to the flood maps, but just so everybody knows, there is a line of strong storms coming across the state. If, in fact, we lose power momentarily, we will uh, pause the meeting until all the equipment comes back up. If it's longer than that, we will continue with the meeting. Those applicants who have something to share with us who don't want to present their project can choose to defer that, and we will move through with the rest of them um, anyway. Chris, you got anything? Nope. Quiet. Okay, uh, that brings us to the Airport Commission. Uh, welcome to them. Welcome, Helen. Um, just as a preamble, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. Um, as I um, indicated in my memo to you, the, this, this is an opportunity for you to meet with the Airport Commission and understand their mission, but also an opportunity for them to express their concerns about Map Amendment 1312 Ellendale, which is a request to for a zoning change from um, Stevensville Master Plan Development District to Urban Commercial. This particular map amendment was reviewed by the Planning Commission at, their, at your April 11th meeting. I believe there was quite a bit of discussion. You did send up a favorable recommendation to the county commissioners on this. Um, at that time, the airport commission didn't have an opportunity to review the application. Subsequent to that, a recommendation to the county commissioners. Um, Steve Cahoon and I met with the airport commission at, at their May 9th um, quarterly meeting and went over the project and the um, where the proposals are also, I mean, not the project, the uh, rezoning request. And they requested an opportunity to meet with the planning commission to um, explain the runway and, and all of the issues related to the property adjoining um, the airport protection zone, which is um, which they'll explain to you. So uh, Linda Steiner, who's the manager of the airport, is here. We'll introduce the members of the um, airport commission. And then um, I do have a PowerPoint with some of the items on it. And I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with that thing. 
Ms. Spinelli, may I ask a question? Sure. You keep calling them the airport commission. Is it an advisory committee? Yeah, it was a commission. It became an advisory committee. And part of what they write in their um, email is their, um, <laughs> I don't know what kind of died, um, was that they had new bylaws. And their bylaws allowed them to review uh, projects. Uh, do you know if they are appointed? Yes, they're appointed by the county commissioners. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay, there, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, this is the airport and um, aerial, which it was which shows, actually it shows, what it shows is the runway here. It shows the um, airport protection and Ken Island gateway zone. That's this area. This, the A, um, the airport protection and Ken Island gateway zone was created as a result of the Chester Stevensville plan. Um, this is, this is Ellendale. And this is um, SMPD. Let me get this back. Stevensville Master Plan Development District. And then um, this is Countryside, which is where um, Kent Manor is. That was property that was rezoned as part of the Chester Stevensville Plan. So let me go back. Sorry, this keeps flipping on me. OK. So. Um, this view here is from URS. This shows, um, and URS did a airport study for, which is what, um, a large study that allowed us to go ahead and um, realign the runways, realign all of the, what was, what's going to happen is the roadway is going to be realigned for um, Pier 1, the, you know, the, the, this roadway up here, the, the hangars are going to be moved from the south side to the north side. So there's a large study done. And this is one of the views from the study. And I just wanted to show you. This is an airport flight easement area that Reliable, which is um, Allendale, agreed to as part of the their project. So there's an actual deed easement on the property. And I'll um, hand these out. This is this is a a, a, a noise easement for um, takeoff and landing, I believe. But um, and there's an explanatory statement. So, and then this is this is a noise exposure area, which was also in the URS. Um, plan that was developed for the county to um, enhance the airport, and so I wanted to be able to show you that. But I'm sorry, it doesn't uh, doesn't show up very well. But I'm going to flip back to the first slide, and only because I'm going to ask the airport advisory board, formerly the commission, to come up here and, and uh, speak to you of their concerns. You did get a copy of the letter that they submitted. Um, to concerning, they sent it to the county commissioners, but I attached it to my memo concerning the um, <coughs> this rezoning request. Ellen, could you put your slide back up over here? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I went back too far. Thank you. Um, Ellen, is there, could you mention? Why, if at all, this didn't arise before well, the Planning Commission considered the text amendments? Right. I mean, uh, the map amendments? The map amendments. Um, we, <laughs> we're the owners of the property, the county commissioners, so we sent an, um, an adjoining property owner notice to ourselves, which is, is normal. And it, you know, it didn't go to the, to the advisory board. It went to the county commissioners. And 
you know, basically they didn't know about it before the Planning Commission had their public hearing. You did have a public hearing. All map amendments require a public hearing, and your public hearing was on April 11th. So. Was it, was it posted? Oh, posted, signed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it was definitely posted. Um, but they're here, the uh, advisory board is here now to speak to you, so hopefully. Start again. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Linda Steiner and I'm manager of Queen Anne's County Baybridge Airport. And I have with me today four of the five airport advisory board members. And Fred Lagno, who is our chairman, is going to speak first. And then we have Sean Veltman, uh, Mark Whalen, and Trent Ward. Okay, we'll bring all the chairs up. Thanks, Linda. So they can all sit up. Yeah, come on up. Sorry. Thank you so much for being here. I'll just hand these out. slide that shows the two properties in, okay. instead of that one yeah okay so you want um, the, the slide that shows the two properties that we're talking about oops. Yeah. there you go there you go this one. and that's that's the slide that you just <clears throat> handed out yes okay hi well my name is Fred Lagno and um, I am the chairman of the airport advisory committee uh, on my left uh, here is Mark Whalen he's a, a board member uh, John Veltman and Trent Ward. Uh, as Helen pointed out, uh, we were not <coughs> informed of the uh, upgraded uh, zoning until after it happened. <coughs> and uh, this, uh, our meeting was on May 9th, uh, and that's when we were told about the, uh, the changes. Uh, at that time, uh, after some discussion, we uh, pretty much decided that we were opposed to any kind of structure uh, within, that <coughs> within that safety zone, within that clearway. And um, of course it happened and, and uh, <coughs> nothing can be done you know, to change that, uh, but we would like to uh, voice our concerns uh, as to w why we don't want this to happen. Uh, the, um, you know, normally you expect uh, that a, me, a problem that occurs will occur you, yeah. on. Could I ask you what you mean by clear way? Sure. Yes, that approach, uh, you, you have the uh, form in front of you, this, this right here. Okay, and you can see the runway on the left. That fan that goes out there that, that widens out like a funnel, that <coughs> is the clear way. The and center one or the outside one? The outside one is a noise one, is that correct? This, no, no. No. These solid lines. Yes, that's that's the clear way. That that's the area that has to remain um, within certain limits. Um, then what is the center one for? The, the, there's two more that are that are. I think I he's understand. talking about lines that perhaps are created by the FAA. Correct. Uh, Maybe. Are you looking at? This yes, point? I am. I have okay. the same yeah. thing. Okay. okay. You, you have the center section where there's two lines that go up. Okay. Why don't you point at it on the screen, please? Yeah. That yeah. Would be better. Yeah. Okay. Well, the color version right. looks a lot different than. Correct. You can see the the white set. And then there's two center. Uh, go in. There's the exact. Yeah. That's that's the lines on both the north and south. That line you're touching there now. That that just delineates the two properties that you're talking about. Oh really? That's not that wasn't part of the. Uh, no, this is the, the whole clearway. Okay. Well, yeah. wait a minute. The, these are just. Yeah. Let's be clear. Yeah, because I think there's. They. Sir, if you point at the white space right there, that's owned by the county. Okay. Yes. And to the east of that, to the east, to the if you back up just a little bit, it's colored yellow, I think. Right. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. That is that is what's proposed to be, to as I understand it, that area to which the gentleman's now pointing, 
would be open space, I suppose, if you want to call it that. It would be moved from the areas that are proposed for rezoning. Correct. To extend the, essentially, the, that which is white, which is owned by the county. And then further to the east of that is the property subject to the easement that you just got. But I gather that's not as expansive as the lines to which the gentleman was pointing. Could you point to those two lines again? That one and that one. And is that something that the FAA created? Uh, yes. Okay. This, yeah, that's correct. Now, those lines are not a zoning line or a or a no. or a easement line. It's a, what he says is a clear view that the FAA has. This this concept of clear view. I mean, when I hear that yeah. word, it sounds like nothing's supposed to be there. Is no, that uh, that's not entirely true. <laughs> it's an approach corridor, and, and there are restrictions. And when they come up with, you have another form that I gave you, uh, which is a, an approach chart. When the FAA designs... Uh, All right, I, I don't know if you need to stand in the light. I just wanted you to, to point at what we were talking about. If you want to stand up, that's fine, but otherwise... No, no, that, that's fine. Okay. When, the FAA, when, when the FAA designs the approaches, um, they base it on what's there. Uh, and the FAA is not very proactive at all. In other words, you can put whatever you want there, but as soon as you do, the FAA is going to change uh, the approach criteria for that runway. Is, is so um, on, on this, just just to clarify, maybe the, maybe a, I think I understand now. Mm -hmm. In this clear way, there's a progressive list of numbers, and that's I'm assuming correct. that that means that that's the maximum height that something can be in exactly. the clear way. Okay. Yes. So the clear way is really up in the air. Yeah, for the most part, for the most Where part. Where the planes are. Hopefully. What you have to be careful of uh, with those clear ways, um, right. there are limits. It's right uh, there. And, and you can look at this chart, okay, and the only thing you need to look at there, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on there, and I don't want to confuse you with anything, but uh, if you go down on that chart, you will see the number 380-1. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Can somebody put this chart up on the screen? I, yeah, well, I guess we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. I want to go up there and point at it, Fred, because they're not going to want to know where to look at the approach plate. Mr. Drummond, the easement will not be affected by this one way or another, would it? No. It, I mean, what is either owned by the county or that which is proposed for open space to be moved or that which is subject to the easement, none of that, is, as I understand it, is a subject of this rezoning request. Okay, right here, this number, 380-1. The 380 means 380 feet. So an airplane on an instrument approach, and what that means is in the clouds, this is with no reference to the ground, an airplane may descend on this profile and at a given point, which the GPS in the aircraft uh, will, will indicate, he may descend to 380 feet. Now, at that point, the aircraft has uh, two choices. If he sees the runway, he can land. If he does not see the runway, he has to execute a missed approach. This 380 feet is a critical number. <clears throat> it's what they call the minimum descent altitude. And um, at Bay Bridge Airport, on a cloudy day, rainy day, whatever, uh, they descend to 380, they see the airport, they land. <clears throat> The problem that, that we have with it, <coughs> excuse me, any further building in that open area is that as soon as you put something in there, that number goes up. <coughs> and I'm not talking about 10 or 20 feet, I'm talking about a couple hundred feet. So it makes all the difference in the world as to whether an airplane is going to get in there or not. Um, for whatever reason, and I, I can tell you this from experience, often the uh, uh, weather at Bay Bridge Airport shows a 400-foot ceiling. Don't know why. I don't know whether it's warm air from the ground lifting clouds or whether it's uh, uh, winds. I, I don't Proximity know. Proximity to the bay. I'm sorry? Proximity to the bay. Yeah. Yeah. So we often have a 400-foot ceiling, which means if an airplane comes down to 380 feet, 
it will see the runway. If it comes down to 500 feet, it won't. Do you keep statistics as to the uh, percentage of uh, IFR versus VFR landings? The percentage of IFR versus VFR? Can we uh, can we clarify? It's overwhelmingly instrumentation uh, landings versus. I, I'm not a pilot. <laughs> oh, the, uh, instrument the landing by instruments versus uh, VFR visual flight routes. Meaning you can yeah. you don't nice. have to use your instruments. Uh, uh, it, it's overwhelmingly uh, VFR. However, the airplanes that do come in there IFR are usually uh, corporate types or uh, more importantly the uh, the uh, state police medevac helicopter. Uh, we do have the Navy come in there with uh, some helicopters. Yes, Isn't the requirement for VFR is 1,000 feet and three mile visibility, well, yeah. so mm -hmm. any time the weather gets in down order, below that, you're required to. Right, if, in, in order to qualify as, as a VFR day, a visual flight wind day, the visibility has to be a minimum of three miles and it has to be a minimum of 1,000 foot cloud cover. Uh, okay. So, so uh, which is, which is really point. bare minimum. But, but we're talking about you know, those bad weather days when, and we often have, uh, I, I think Linda can attest to this, our airport manager, we often have uh, the state police medevac in there, uh, wouldn't you say? Oh, at least every week. Yeah, at least every week. So um, there you have it. The other problem we have too um, is was a concession that this airport uh, board made some years ago, and that was with regard to the uh, traffic pattern, which uh, we now have to fly over um, two miles south of the airport to avoid the uh, housing development there at uh, uh, Bay City. Um, <clears throat> because of that, we, well, we grudgingly agreed to it, but because of that, uh, should an airport, or, or excuse <coughs> me, should an aircraft have an engine problem there, uh, two miles south of the airport, it's not going to make it to the runway. But guess where he's going to try? Uh, only because uh, human nature being what it is, uh, pilots very much prefer hard surface runway to a farmer's field. Uh, and and there again, you, it, it brings you to that open area there just before the runway, that clear way. That's where they're going to hit. Uh, and we had one do that that very thing. Uh, I think Trent has that, that report, which he'll tell you about, and it's, it's happened over at Lee Airport in Edgewater. You just ask the people at the bank there, they can tell you how thrilled they were to see an airplane coming through their back door. Uh, it, it just, those are dangerous areas. And, and so is, is your problem the rezoning, or is your problem that anything could be built here? Well, yeah, really, that's, that's what it amounts to. <laughs> I mean, those are totally different issues. I think it's yeah. Cool. I mean, one yeah. is one is your only option is to buy that property, and the other is whether well, the rezoning really makes a difference. If if anything built there is going to force this this clear area farther up in the sky, and that creates a problem, then it really doesn't matter about the rezoning. Okay, but doesn't rezoning up the value of the property? I'm not sure that it does in this particular case. I mean, they have a pretty good zoning to start with, and it does have some restrictions on it. Uh, it may or may not increase the value. And we're talking about urban commercial um, versus uh, SMPD, which is our highest density zone. I, right. I don't know what other restrictions apply there, but a lot could, in theory, yeah. be built there anyway. Well, see, well, my point there, I mean, uh, which really has nothing to do with safety, but, but my point there is... Um, if, if uh, the county has to buy that property, at what rate are they going to pay? Can I ask a question? Does the FAA set this minimum um, altitude for VFR versus IFR based upon what could be on the ground given the zoning or what is actually on the ground? It's actually. Actually. Oh. But they don't it's anticipate for VFR? what could happen. No, for IFR. On the Allendale no, no, he said for probably force the runway to go 200 feet shorter. We, we can't Say use the no, it's when the FAA came in and re-evaluated re the airport after the, ex the extensions to the airport and the Ellen, uh, Ellendale. Ellendale was done and completed. They moved the approach into the runway 200 feet. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. We less. lost 200 feet of runway. We lost 200 feet of runway. Instead of having 2,900 foot graphic. runway, we've got a 2,700 Maybe we need runway. another graphic for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's, we'll put that back up. <laughs> Um, so they'll come in periodically and review the airport buildings, structures, towers, cell towers, whatever in the area. 
Now that presents another problem. Uh, we used to have 2,900 feet of runway. Um, because Hold on, let's get the graphic up so we can understand. Okay. There you go, Helen. Yeah, right. okay. Um, is that okay? Is that the That's graphic fine. you want? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. This, this runway length used to be 2,900 feet. <coughs> because of the restrictions, the FAA required <coughs> us to displace this runway 200 feet. So now the threshold is considered to be here as opposed to here at the beginning of the runway. That's got um, nothing to do with Route 8 and cars going through there? I'm sorry? Nothing to do with Route 8 and, and traffic? Yeah, well, it, it, it probably does. Oh, okay. Yeah, whatever, whatever reasons they had. It could be cell towers just south of there, too, if or you, future. If you start building here, Mr. I think it is due to the roadway. All right, well, let, we'll get, I'm sure there's Mr. Foster has his comments on this, but okay. let's. If you start building here, uh, there's every possibility that's going to be increased. Now, what we're looking to do at Bay Bridge Airport, what we would love to have there is 3,000 feet. And the reason I say that is because um, insurance companies love that number. And uh, right now, there are uh, aircraft that will not land here because of the runway length, it being under 3,000 feet. So we're trying to scrape up every inch we can get, and we don't want to lose any more. But you'll never get 3,000 with that road. Uh, we may get 3,000. We may. Um, off the other end. If you look at the oh, out into the water. Of, right. Yeah, the full length okay. of the... Right. Um, so I'm a little confused. When, when the county purchased that property in front, at that time, was that what the restriction line was? I can't remember. It was I mean, almost when they years ago. first purchased the airport. Uh, you're no, no, the, pr the property across uh, oh, Route Eight. Uh, yeah. That was bought from the Breedings. Yes, the, the Breeding Farm. Yeah, I remember that. Ago. And um, yeah, I think that restriction was there then. Okay, because I mean, I don't recall seeing that second set of lines. Yeah, I think that restriction was there. I'm trying to remember, but I vaguely recall that. One thing, can I, can I ask you, that, can I mention this? Uh, again, I'm not clear as to whether the FAA, you say the FAA is concerned only with what's on the ground, not with what may be on the ground. That's right. That's right. Even if the building height in the, is my understanding, Ellen can correct me if I'm wrong, the maximum building height as between the two districts is the same. Mm -hmm. Is that right? In yes. fact, they had a com yes. if I'm yeah. right, yeah. and a commercial structure couldn't be any taller than the townhouses in Ellendale, for example. That's true. Mm -hmm. I just so yeah. But the FAA doesn't say, oh well, <coughs> you can't go any higher than the townhouses. No, no, we're trying. We're trying to protect the airport. The FAA is just going to sit back and watch. Okay. And uh, when you do something, the FAA then will will take action. All right. Okay. So, so you're you're. Back to my original question, your, your issue is you, you don't want anything built on this property. That's mm -hmm. true. We'd prefer that. We would prefer that. Okay. Go ahead, John. Uh, I'll, I'm going to let John uh, tell you a few Fred, things. I um, he's got one yeah. small question. Well, oh, yes. You as a flight instructor know what this is, but when you're coming in on the, the, DM, or the uh, uh, GPS approach, mm -hmm. what is the legal angle off the center line that you can be? And can you translate that into feet? We've got a window here, 200 um, feet wide. Okay. You know, it's not a precision approach. Right. And, and, uh, uh, and that's a good question. I don't know. Not being a precision approach, uh, you can come in from almost any angle, uh, not legally, but... but uh, in an emergency. You know, sure. you know, you're, you're, you're striving to be on, on the, the uh, published center line. Uh, but uh, unlike, uh, for instance, BWI or uh, uh, well, any, any of is, is what half a degree or something like that, or no, probably another type of and it gets tighter as you as you get closer. But yeah, I mean, there's 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 error there. Sure, is the error potentially as wide as 200 feet, which is the width of yeah. that thing there's at the neck? Error for all yeah. pilots. That's what they. Mr. With a strong wind. <laughs> and guess what happens to that 45-foot house that you build there? I'm a pilot's property. wife, so I understand, but I also know that, you know, you guys are that fly are trained to come in on a straight line. It would mm -hmm. be an emergency yeah. situation for mm -hmm. you to, to be this coming a, in. This on. is a training airport. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Veltman 
to say a few words because he has some things that he'd like to point out. Can I ask a general question first before Dr. Beltman speaks? It's Mr. Lingo. Yes. Why can't the planes come in from the west well, over the water? Depends on the wind. The wind's blowing. Depends on the wind. Wind, wind direction. So they. You have to land and take off both into the wind. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you land over right. the bay. Sometimes you have to land right. in another direction depending, depending on the wind. Coming. Thanks. Okay. What if it's a north wind? It's called a crosswind. <laughs> That's a crosswind. And that, yeah. that yeah. takes a little bit more finesse, but we do it all the time <laughs> at Bay Bridge Airport. Yeah. So you can take off and land as long as it's a crosswind, but you can't take off and land. It's much more difficult, uh, Mr. Howard, to take off or land in a crosswind. Yeah. Which is uh, frequent. And there are, yeah, th this, this yeah. happens. Yeah. This is part of the reason that we need to have that wider yeah. convergence yeah. zone because you don't always have the wind down the runway. As a matter of fact, that's seldom that you have the wind exactly down the runway. Yeah. Uh, come in like this. Yeah. Uh, I'm John Veltman. I'm a Queen Anne resident, uh, live and work in Queen Anne's County, longstanding member of the Airport Commission, uh, now the Airport uh, Safety Officer. I would like to strongly urge the Planning and Zoning to reconsider their zoning upgrade to the Ellendale property for these reasons. This action was taken by Planning and Zoning without regard for the safety of the citizens and without input from the Airport Advisory Council. Medevac choppers and medevac personnel will be unable to land in bad weather, which happens frequently in that part of the county. This is the only approach in that area of the county where they can get down low to take people out. People will die because of this decision. The second thing is, this is not a question of if, but it's a question of when aircraft will come down short of the runway. It has happened before. It will happen again. The next issue is Let's be frank, the two pieces of land that you see there are very small. By upgrading the zoning on these pieces of land, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to build something in there. However, the upgrade of zoning is, to your point, uh, Mr. Waterman, will allow a marina so you can have sailboat masts in there. You're going to have to deny the person who gets the zoning upgrade the ability to put a marina in there. When that occurs, this land is going to have to be bought by the county or with monies coming from somehow the citizens of the state of Maryland. This puts you in a, in a state of conflict of interest, basically, because you know this is going to happen. You're going to have to deny what goes in there, otherwise people are going to be hurt. I'd like to also make the point that Planning and Zoning takes this stance against the unanimous opposition of the Airport Advisory Council because of safety and economic reasons. I waive my time. I just like to put in you guys have a responsibility to pay attention to what happens around the airport mm -hmm. there's no legal requirement for us to have notified you and granted in hindsight we maybe we should have but you guys should have seen the signs posted on the property and I, been I, here when we had it in front of us the I, first time I, I disagree think, I think there is a legal requirement there is a legal requirement uh, based on our bylaws and Greg and also by the, your bylaws are, by, uh, they, they, the county was notified I guess it didn't make it through the. I, I understand in hindsight but to come in here and tell us that we failed to do something there's a sign on the property you guys go by it all the time you I mean, it's the same notification that we give to every property in the county uh, I, I take a little offense to think that we did something wrong in that environment um, I'd just leave it there. Uh, in the future, we'd well, be happy to notify you if something happens around there. But how, how big an area you want to do, do? We need to notify you on. You know, we, we well, should have some idea of what what you're expecting from us. Mr. Waterman, with all due respect, I would I would hope that being in planning and zoning, the planning would encompass the safety of the citizens. I would fully agree with that. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, well, kind of, it's kind of obvious that there's an airport there. I mean, I, you say I didn't see the sign. I'm sure you saw the airport. Um, but this it, is it, it completely on the other reason. side of the road, well, and, and there already is, um, you know, <coughs> the county already owns a significant portion of that. I mean, we could go back to the question of why the heck didn't you have them buy this before they wanted to do anything with the property if you knew that no one, nothing could be built there. To wait until somebody's ready to do something with the property seems uh, a bit disingenuous, and, and and hoping that you can benefit from them not taking any action. Yet. That's a million dollar question. Well, and, and also the airport was there long before Ellendale was ever plotted. 
Be, you know, before, you know I, I like to say something before we throw any more, with all due respects, out there. <laughs> Does it really matter? I mean, my, my point is the, the height structure in the previous zoning and the new zoning is the same, is it not? That's but the, the, the density but of what you on, put just, in there is I'm different. I'm talking about the safety issue. Okay. The height restriction is the same in both zonings. So if, in the zoning that was there, if they could have built something for height, you're saying there's a safety risk. The new zoning, it's the same height, it's the same safety risk. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why we're having this conversation in the first place. I mean, I understand your point, and what we were presented with showed that center area, and that was what I took everything by. Okay, well, we're not infringing upon that right away, so we're fine. Now we see a larger fly area for the first time, personally for me, and maybe I missed it in the, on, the, on the original, but the height restrictions are still the same. There is no change there. I think your point is now the land is worth more, so if you have to buy it or the county has to buy it, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I think that's a different subject. Okay, well, that may be a different subject, but I would like to have Helen go over the difference in the two zonings and what can be built there, mm -hmm. Mr. Moran, yeah. because it's a tremendously different thing. It might be denser, but it's not higher. Well, is, the, number of people in fa the number of right, people so you're, you're are going to be impacted by your decision. Yeah. You, but you're, but my, again, you're concerned with Safety. instead of... Ten people working in a business, there might be forty people working mm -hmm. at a bowling in homes. alley or, oh, okay. or uh, right. so a, just a so marina or okay. something else. And sir, I'd just like to yeah. add that you know we see these conflicts with airports all the time. Sure, Absolutely. airports are built Definitely. for the for the good of the community, mm -hmm. and then everybody wants to build around the good of the airport. And so every time you build something in there, you're jeopardizing safety and the, the longevity of the airport. So these aren't new conflicts; they happen around airports all the time. What happens, though, is when you do have this congestion and you have a problem, it's a bigger problem. Sure. I'm just, you know, I just want And that's wanna... our point. Mm -hmm. I think um, the point is, is that, and I pointed it out in the staff report, is that it, is, it, it goes from low, very specific uses that are allowed in the Stevensville Master Plan Development District, which are outlined in the district and are specifically um, aligned with the residential uses. In other words, the language actually reads, the Planning Commission shall approve the type and size of commercial development uses proposed as a component of the overall mixed-use development plan. So the intention behind the SMPD and the com commercial component is that they be presented at the same time or at least be in conformity with the intention of the residential component of the development as opposed to moving to an urban commercial, is our most intense zone. It moves it to 40% floor area, FAR, um, where it's 2.5% in the uh, SMPD. And the high commercial uses, medium commercial uses, and low commercial uses are all permitted. And the high commercial uses are um, bowling alleys, package stores, selling liquor, beer, soft drinks, retail stores, mm -hmm. shopping centers, gasoline service station, taverns, bars, shopping, uh, regional shopping centers, light uh, manufacturing, assembling, just a, a, a whole bevy of very, very intense uses. So what, what, what was presented in the staff report um, had the concern, and it was it was couched in the concern for the airport. But the point that was really made in the staff report was a change in mistake argument, and the argument which we we put it forth in the staff report that we didn't believe there was a change in the neighborhood that was inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, or that there was a mistake in the original zoning, and that really the only two grounds you can find. Uh, for a rezoning outside of the comprehensive planning process is either change or mistake. So, but um, those are the those are the intensities that would be allowed if you increase it, increase the zoning from um, SMPD, which is a mixed use, to a purely commercial with high, medium, and low <coughs> commercial with increased floor area. The height of the buildings is the same, and, and the height goes to the midpoint of the slope of the of the um, roof, so it's not, it's not 45 feet. It's the midpoint of the slope of the roof, from the from the ground level. Any other questions? Uh, I would like to just add that as you look at this corridor, that's what that is. That's a corridor. So in bad weather, that's where your airplanes and helicopters are coming. About a month ago, we lost a life flight um, helicopter on the west. If you remember seeing it in the news, it lost. 
it landed in a parking lot, destroyed the aircraft, but nobody got killed. That particular life flight had been on an IFR plan. He's coming down this corridor. That's where he's coming. He's not coming from the side. He's coming down this VFR IFR corridor. If he loses power coming in on that corridor, he's coming down somewhere here. So the more density you have here, the bigger problem you have. Now, luckily, they came down in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Open space, nobody got hurt. The, the, the helicopter was destroyed. If you've got a heavy density uh, building here, and he comes down, he has no choice. He's coming down because he's coming down this corridor. And so you have an issue where you maybe have a broken helicopter, or you might have a, mm -hmm. people hurt. So again, these are not new arguments around airports. They happen all the time. Generally, looking this back, people go, to be why did we like put this. that there? It would, we could have saved. So that's really okay. what you need to look this at. Is good. Could I make one other uh, point on this also? Uh, I'm, I am a pilot, uh, unlike some of you, and I am an IFR pilot. And at the speeds which a normal aircraft would come down that corridor that uh, Fred Lagner showed you a little while ago to that 380 feet that he showed you and then a descent to land You have about four seconds or five seconds Okay, that's not a long time when you've got rain in your face. You're bouncing around in turbulence You may well be off that center line putting higher density in there and increased People is just not a smart move from a planning standpoint I feel like one person. Um, This you can see an approach now trend you took this picture from what point uh, that that sign right there is is the, the sign coming out of the uh, uh, Kent, Manor, uh, Kent, Manor, Kent Manor Inn and it says you know hi and I'm just across the Kent Manor Inn road right there looking at the parcel that you're calling uh, was it 152 acres what do we call it 152 AC. Point one five two. okay so if, if you if you look at that where am I standing um, I'm standing in the across the road from that, looking across at a tree that's roughly about 25 to 30 feet high, and you see an airplane coming down the approach slot, which is just over another 50, 60 feet. Now, incidentally, uh, one of those light sport aircraft similar to this crashed there in uh, 2008, and so, it totaled it totaled the aircraft. Um, Pilot lost control, inexperience with that kind of airplane or whatever it was, but it was a cold day and he had engine problems on final, and he went into a spin. Why don't you show them where you were standing? I think um, this is the other. I, I don't understand what we're doing. I mean. So Frankly, I get a little nervous hearing about all the accidents in airplanes. I know how to buckle my seatbelt and I know where my life vest is um, <laughs> when I fly, and that's about the extent of my knowledge of uh, being in the air. <laughs> This guy's got his wing crack down. He's stepping on full rudders. He's coming into about this point. And he's bouncing all around like he's on. So it, if I could interject. I'm going to put some guy 50 feet away from his wingtip. This is about right. 40 feet. So if I could, Mr. Chairman, please, please. say a couple things. <laughs> this has been really interesting. And I've learned a lot. I think having dialogue between us is really important. Um, I think we're, we're trying to um, decipher between gray and black and white mixed, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, you're worried about safety, and I'm glad you're worried about safety. Uh, but it seems like if we're going to be worried about safety in these two properties that were rezoned, that can't jeopardize the, the, uh, 
the approach or the clear view or whatever the correct terminology is, it's not going to change that, then we, we might want to be worried about what's even behind that in the approach. And at what point do we stop worrying about the approach? Because if you're coming in for an approach and your plane loses an engine uh, a mile out, there's going to be people underneath you. Hopefully not, but there could be. Certainly, if you ever flew into National in Washington, D.C., there are a lot of important things underneath you when you're coming in on that approach. So I think this is really good information. I don't know if there's anything that we should do differently, in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. at this point. But I think that we should stay in contact with each other as we deal with properties around the airport to make sure everybody's informed. Well, that, yeah, we, we would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, in, in answer to your question, though, Mr. Warner, because you, you did ask a question before that and made a lot of sense, and, and you, you were uh, asking about, well, what do we want? Do we want nothing built there, or do we want to, do we want to just prevent uh, a, a zoning change? Yeah, ideally, we would like nothing built there. <clears throat> Realistically, we know that's not going to happen. And, and I'll be frank with you. I, I, I have no faith in that uh, ever being totally clear. Um, but we did uh, state our concerns, uh, and they were safety concerns. And, and so um, from here on out, the best thing that we can do is uh, uh, make our recommendations to the county commissioners, as we're supposed to do, and um, let you folks do your job. Um, and and uh, hopefully, and I'm, I'm sure you do know what's best. Um, so I, I think we can leave it at that. Uh, uh, unless I would just urge that you reconsider your decision based on what you learned this morning. Uh, gentlemen, about 20 years ago or thereabouts, the same concerns were raised. I don't remember exactly the context. It may have been when the <coughs> county was considering purchasing part of the so-called Walmart property, perhaps was even before that. I think it was Sunny Shores. Um, and there was then talk even about relocating the airport. Um, and I remember sitting, I don't think we were in this room, I think it was even before this, it was yes. back at the old, yeah, at the county commissioner's building, or even before that at the old health department. It may have been that far <coughs> long ago. So completely understand your concerns, but, uh, you know, they're not new, and mm -hmm. um, I think it was after the Kmart, as I recall, that this debate came up, but was also when the Bay City residents were all over the county about noise. So it would have been in the, right around that time that yeah. produced the change in the re your request to pilots that they go two, two miles south. So, um, and then there was actually a piece of property that was talked about near Centerville to move the airport, as I recall, and it was when there was a racetrack being proposed, a car racetrack, and the airport was to be next to it. So, you know, mm. you know, the Lee Airport stuff has been going on for 50 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, I, I to, to that point, the, one of the reasons the airport was not moved was its strategic location. I for, remember all those conversations. For Absolutely. the evacuation of the island right next to the bridge where you have a lot of accidents. This is a place where medevac choppers do come in frequently, as Linda will tell you. This, the reason that we didn't move it was that portion of the, the county needs to be served by an instrument approach. By uh, putting something there that, that would degrade that approach, you are putting people at risk before the it was before the IFR was I know but we airport. have we now have that we, yeah. we fought long and hard to get this approach this just didn't happen overnight I know and by degrading it we're we're going against the, the I, well again I don't think we're degrading it number one and number two the three acres that's in the yellow now has now been included in open space to to nothing being built there is that correct yes yeah. so that's I mean proposal well, we, we proposed so what I'm saying is I mean we're, we're actually the plan actually increases the area, not as wide, but on the, on the old aspect, it is. So, I mean, you know, that, that's another, whatever that may be, it's, you know, three acres, it's, it's, it's increasing the safety if somebody that's not off path. Excuse me, but wasn't that in the approval for Allendale itself? 
because they did, couldn't build in that area, so they wanted that a children's playground. They wanted they couldn't build houses, so they originally wanted to put a playground in there. Trent's right. Is that correct? I don't think that's, that's right. right. Yeah, I don't think it is. That's I mean, what got down to either way, I mean, a, a playground full of kids is the same scenario as a can, bowling alley yeah. full. Yeah. Of can, I just, can I just <laughs> ask another general question, which really sure. is not going to change anything? Wouldn't a medevac, a helicopter, and again, not a pilot, no idea, less than Mr. Howard is my knowledge base. Wouldn't a helicopter need less of a descent space or or um, width than a depending plane? upon because depending our upon first the responders, I understand y'all y'all are throwing out two scenarios though about a medevac issue mm -hmm. and then a safety issue where uh, I don't mean to say an average pilot, but a pilot would come in and it sounds like there are two different things. And I do think our first responders to our area is a huge priority and I'm not saying I'm not trying to diminish the fact that a plane accident would be huge as well that that depends upon the weather conditions normally um, yeah a helicopter uh, <coughs> excuse me a helicopter could hover um, under instrument conditions a helicopter flies pretty much like an airplane um, it, it's it's uh, you've seen a helicopter move forward well there's two kinds of lift there's there's vertical lift and transitional lift. In, in, Let me in just preface that I work right across the street from Shock Trauma, and I see okay. them drop on the yeah. roof. Every and you time. see them come in. You right. see them come straight down. Right. Yeah, uh, and that's under under visual conditions. Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, you can't do that under instrument conditions. Un, un, that's under not. under, I think that ship, when Fred first stood up there and he had the map of how airplanes can come in, you know, coming down to that 380 feet. Yeah. When you're in instrument conditions, that will be the path, the safe path, for a helicopter to come down. The helicopter has to follow. They the they same. they change the rules as as the, I don't see your name tag, so I don't know who you are. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when <laughs> he didn't introduce himself either. Uh, what 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 happens is when when you go from visual flight rules to instrument flight rules the helicopter then becomes bound by a whole different set of laws, priorities, rules, everything else to come down that, that, that thing that we're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I think we all understand that, that whatever's built there is, is a uh, safety risk and whether someone gets uh, a, a disabled plane in their deck or in their um, office office uh, it's a problem so um, because you're asking us to reconsider um, a vote on this specific project I'm going to al allow the applicant to come up the original applicant tell us what his thoughts are and then we'll take public comment and then we will make some kind of decision just real quick we didn't advertise or post this as a continuation of the public hearing or yeah. okay no well nor are we going to make oh, a decision so no, right? it's well a I don't know yes. uh, but I think under Robert Tools of Water who made the motion what so, so back to that. <laughs> well, there is no motion. <laughs> like to I'm just saying, if so, if you wanted to reconsider, it would have to be the motion would have to be made by the. Um, but let's. I think it would have to be original. made by the one who made it or seconded it or someone who voted in favor of it. Is it, is it also possible that the planning commission? can send up a letter to the county commissioner saying we've heard from the airport commit board and you know um, we'd like to recognize that they've expressed some concerns I think that would have to be made by a motion right done by a motion you, to Jim. reconsider that which was done in April well, I, okay I don't know about reconsidering gentlemen I thank you for your time and and you might want to stick around here um, in case there's some other question can we I have. just say one other thing sure, I, sure. I would just like to say that as a commission, we would be remiss in our responsibilities if we didn't come here and tell you, Absolutely. as the experts in aviation, what, what our opinion is. Now, we've told you our opinion as experts yeah. in aviation. It's up to you to make your, uh, a, a, your opinion. Um, but we just want to have the ability to come up and talk to you, and, and we don't think that we had that ability earlier on. For whosoever right. issue it was, I'm glad we, we, we got appreciate you coming. And, yeah, and, thank you. and the other thing I would like to make sure is that if there's anything beyond this zone mm -hmm. that you think you should be notified about, if you let us know, we'll make sure you're notified of anything that happens, whether it's okay. on this property or some other pieces of property. We don't. I didn't know where where you guys no. were concerned with. So you let us know, and we will make sure that you get notified. Anything right. adjacent to the airport, uh, Mr. Waterman, we would be very very interested in what's happening with it. 
within a mile. By, within, by, I mean, this is well, well, adjacent. this is to directly adjacent to it. Yeah, directly. The, the Wilson adjacent. development the, in particular. The Wilson development for for the winery or whatever that's going in over there. We are very interested in what goes in over there. Okay, thank you very much. It's visual for, obstruction. It's crosswinds. Way the way the winds. Well, you know, we talked about crosswinds. You build buildings in there, you're going to cause these airplanes to do more of this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. thank you very much for thank your you. time. Thank for, you. For thank you. Planning Commission and the Airport Commission's benefit, um, our application for all development review projects. If a project was being proposed within half a mile of the airport, we require the applicant to submit an extra set of plans that we send to the Airport Commission. So that that is a policy. That is a a, on our application and in place. This being a, or no, this being a rezoning petition was a different application process. But we, we have it in place for development review applications and we will put it in place for petitions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Michael Foster uh, for the applicant and I have Barry Griffin with me here from Lane Engineering. Um, just a couple of preparatory things. Number one, I think procedurally, you've advertised. First thing, I file with the commissioners. The commissioners send it to you for a recommendation. It's advertised. You make your recommendation. It's now back up before the commissioners. So I question even whether you have any continuing jurisdiction in this. But with respect to the um, uh, Aviation uh, Commission, um, I'll address a few of the things they brought up. And one of them, they were upset that they didn't get notice. Well, when they show you all these plats with these wide restrictions of 40, 50, 60 feet, I've represented the owners of this property for the last 15 years. They know that in 1991, they conveyed some land to the county, which is that original trapezoidal uh, extension of the runway. Um, other than that, they don't know anything about these um, uh, FAA widened areas or things like that. They've never been approached about restricting their property further. They've never been approached about an easement. Um, the only easement is on there is what Helen gave you, and that was because uh, there were concerns by the airport. I represented the developer in 2006. There were concerns by the airport. We agreed, and the concerns were mo mostly because of their Bay City experience from a residential perspective. So we voluntarily agreed that we would agree to a restriction that there could not be any residential development north and west of the connector road. Now, so that would be that whole area essentially east of Route 8 and south of the Kmart. Um, we agreed further to recognize that that is a flight approach area and we agreed to execute this easement saying Guys, if you do it safely, which it sounds like from the testimony this morning, there's a lot of potential for unsafe use of that approach way. But if you use it safely, we acknowledge that you're going to be approaching across our lands. There was the clear understanding with the county, the clear understanding with the planning commission, that we were not giving up any rights to that land located north and west of the connector that it was going to be utilized, and, but it would not be utilized for a residential purpose. It was zoned SMPD. Barry's done the calculations, and I'll let him briefly speak to that, but, but basically in that whole area, which ironically would also include the, the direct extension eastward of the runway beyond the restricted county-owned area. That is SMPD. We are free to do anything in that area. I really thought that the airport would like our rezoning application because in the rezoning application, again, we're not basically the commercial component is going to be the same. 
um, we're not going to be able to get a marina in there. Uh, the commercial component is going to stay exactly use-wise. If you could have a restaurant before under SMPD, and Barry will testify, you can have a restaurant under VC. Um, but by asking for that, we were then going to take that just shy of three acre restriction, density restriction, that we had used under the, for the residential development of Ellendale. And we were gonna put that at the end of the county's property so that that yellow that you see on that plat would effectively be the county getting three additional acres restricted and they're not paying anything for it. So I really thought that this was one that wasn't gonna have any, like, opposition, but I guess in today's world that is a, a bit optimistic. Um, so I'll have Barry just briefly address uses under SMPD and BC. UC. UC. I mean UC. And what we can do there now. And Barry, if you want to just briefly touch on that. Sure. Uh, Barry Griffith Lane Engineering, the project consultants for Ellendale since the uh, project began. Um, I don't. I know we nobody wants to re-debate the rezoning. We went through that back in April, and the Planning Commission agreed that this was an appropriate rezoning for the property in terms of planning and land use issues, uh, in terms of uh, uh, a better way to approach uh, commercial to future commercial development of this site as UC versus SMPD. I would just point out that under SMPD, I'm allowed to have restaurants, offices. Uh, any number of uses which would generate maybe the same types of concerns that the airport committee has uh, about people being in the vicinity of this of this runway uh, as I would under urban commercial. In fact, of the of the 4.5 acres north of this wedge that we're asking for to be classified as urban commercial, if that 4.5 acres remained SMPD at the floor area ratios allowed under SMPD. I could have four 10,000 square foot sit down restaurants in there. The, the uses aren't as, I think, dramatic as perhaps Helen in, a, a, has indicated. Uh, I can do intensive things under SMPD that I can also do under UC. It's just with UC, we have more standardization of the regulations than we do under SMPD and more certainty about what we can and can't do because the SMPD was envisioned to be a commercial component sort of uh, as a mixed use tied to the residential. And when the county put the con made us put the connector road alignment in, we physically separated this area from the residential. So I just, I just want to stress that I don't really uh, accept the premise that uh, under SMPD, there's very little activity there. And under UC, there is intensive activity there. Uh, I, it depends on what comes in, and you'll see it either way as a site plan. Uh, but you can do you can do development there that I think probably these gentlemen would object to, whether it's SMPD or UC. And just one quick comment, because I know you've got a full agenda here. You're already behind time. The 200 feet in runway that they lost was not due to the construction on Ellendale's property. That was due to the expansion of the width of Maryland Route 8 coming <clears throat> off of um, um, the overpass. And so it took a new measurement from the side of that roadway, which I think probably can still be widened even further because it is state-owned land. So if the state does any improvements within that state-owned land, it's going to further restrict uh, the runway. And last but not least, um, there is a similar property, two hours, that property four acres to the north. If you continue in a westward direction north of the existing airport and runway, there is about an eight or ten acre parcel in there, now known as the Vineyards, that is owned by the county, that the county invited solicitations for proposals to do commercial development. What's the zoning on the county's property? UC. No, it's not. Or BC. No. Airport, Airport protection. Can I? No, no. I don't. I don't on yes, the. I rezoned it. Okay. Well, it had been zoned. 
I'm sorry. I, I think it was zoned UC. But again, regardless of the zoning, it allows the same type of use. And in fact, they're talking about one of the proposals in that area is that they want to put a hotel on. Uh, which is obviously a higher structure than anything that would be contemplated on our respective property. I think we're asking for something that, considering the concerns, I think what we're asking for actually gives the airport another three acres of a protected approach zone that they're not going to have otherwise. And again, I think you've already made your recommendation and it's up to the commissioners and I would urge you not to change that recommendation at this time. What's the distance in feet on the three acre section that extends the safety set? It's you mean to the looks like about 250 feet, but it's, it's running not, uh, west from east. West that's about east. right. Yeah. So you're just, you're extending it basically out to Route 8 is about 750 feet and another 250 on top of that would give about a thousand feet of safety net. Well, that and, and the fact that the other lands running uh, eastward are actually in the critical area, uh, unlikely to be developed. And then the, the, the Ellendale had uh, given the county commissioners uh, a four and a half acre open space parcel further east going to the water. The water's way over there. We're, we're, we're nowhere near anywhere we can have a marina. Um, so we, we thought this clarified things, kept uh, identified where the commercial development would be on either side of this of this landing approach uh, versus being able to have it at the end of it. And Mr. Perkins, if you look at that plaque, you'll see some look like buildings located east of the yellow. That is the original farmhouse, the original barn, and there was an original grain silo there, which predates the airport by about 50 years. Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone from the public want to comment on this topic? My question, this is Trent Ward. Uh, you need to keep your voice up over the uh, rain. Okay. Yeah, come. My, my question would be the UC versus the, the uh, light commercial, the, the designation that it is now. Uh, what's the advantage? Why do, why do they need it? We, we're saying it doesn't make any difference in terms of building height or whatever, but why do they need it? Right now, it looks like a way we're encouraging a builder to come in there and do something. And we don't want that. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah, the, my point echoes Trent's in a way. Um, if he can do all this under the existing zoning, why does he need to upgrade the zoning other than to increase the value of the property so that when they get denied to build in that area because of safety, they're going to get more money for it. Any other members of the public? Okay. Any discussion from the Planning Commission? Does anyone care to make a motion on any? I mean, our options are to ask Mr. Drummond whether we have the legal authority to reconsider an action we've already taken. To, uh, or or to just move on. Is considering doing that? I don't Move on. Okay. We're going to move on then. Thank you all for coming. Next topic on our agenda is uh, major site plan 01101000007, an amendment to Merrick Farms um, conditional approval seeking a. Five minute break. Okay. Um, while we're changing the tape and uh, that you guys are coming forward, we're going to take a five minute break. In from our attorney that it was properly <coughs> advertised in the newspaper, and um, as soon as we find him, we will do that. He's coming. Yes. Like to you may jump in there. It's still raining out. Yes, it is. Lightly. 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 No. It's over. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the following notice was published in the Record Observer uh, 531 oh. 67 and in the Bay Times on 65 
2013. Um, the Planning Commission for Queen Anne's County hereby gives notice pursuant to the Code of Public Local Laws of Queen Anne's County, Chapter 18, Land Use and Development, Section 181-95E2, that it will hold a public hearing concerning a conditional use application for proposed sand and gravel major extraction and washing operation located on the east side of Maryland Route 313 between Merritt Corner Road and Ingleside Road in Ingleside, Maryland. Uh, the application was submitted by Petitioner Roland Carbom and by his agents, Sean Callahan of Lane Engineering. Petitioner's proposal is made under the procedures of Chapter 18, Article 27 of the Queen Anne's County Code. Um, goes on to state that the uh, notice that the application shall be considered by the Planning Commission at a public hearing on Thursday, June 13th, 2013 at 9.30 a.m. and is now 10.06 a.m. in the conference room. Um, goes on to describe that it's in uh, public under the Open Meetings Act, the regulations, and that the um, site is accessible for um, hearing and individuals with hearing and other disabilities. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm satisfied that the notice requirements have been met to hold the public hearing. Thank you very much. Therefore, we will open the public hearing. Holly, thank you. Good morning, everyone. This, this project has been um, around for a while and gone through a number of reviews, number of approvals, and just so you know, uh, for everyone to know, that this staff report I prepared, and I put it in the staff report, uh, is essentially the same information uh, that was presented to the Board of Appeals uh, back in 2010, and I have tweaked the staff report to reflect the revisions to that approval that they wish to amend. So, without further ado, what just for going, it went through already through the Board of Appeals. Yes. And the, was it? Yes. The history is well. The background information with the dates that I supplied, uh -huh. basically, it had come in and been submitted, and then it went through all the processes that I had to go through, so it went to the Planning Commission, then it went to the Board of Appeals, mm -hmm. and it did receive a conditional use approval. And what happened was, and this is the project history after all those dates, um, I'll just read it. The, uh, the information contained within the staff report is essentially the information that was provided to the Board of Appeals, Appeals in October 2010 where something has been amended to reflect the most current submittal that is under review of italicized that information. The reason for this amendment, specifically this is the big, the, the whole reason we're here, is text amendment uh, number 08220. That added to the code in April 2009. This required major extraction operations to be approved in 20 acre increments. That section of the code has since been removed pursuant to a decision by the Maryland Court of Special Appeals, and therefore the applicant is before you today to approve their amendment under the old code, essentially the new old code. Does that make sense? So they're seeking yeah. to go from a 20-acre approval to to get the full. Acres or whatever. Yes, yes. So they no longer have to come back in 20-acre right. in increments. So they're. They have to start with you and then go back to the Board of Appeals to do this. Okay. Okay. For other modifications, in addition to just going from 20 acres in, in Yes, to extensive. Acres. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> ha they have a number of alterations to their plan. Uh, the the site plan number 01101007. The conditional use uh, CU 01007. Uh, the Specifics to, of the property is located at tax map 31, parcel 44. The parcel is approximately 150 acres. It is located on the east side of Maryland 313 be between Merritt Corner Road and Ingleside Road. This is 313 along here. This is Ingleside Road here. And this is Merritt Corner Road here on the north side. 
<coughs> the zoning is agriculture, and this is in the first election district. The applicant today is seeking a favorable recommendation from the Planning Commission to the Board of Appeals to amend their existing conditional use. They wish to remove the 20-acre limit and to continue operating at the existing facility that they have right now and to expand the mining operation to approximately 89 acres. The existing site This is uh, the existing uh, property in question today, parcel 44, and adjacent to it is the Greystone subdivision on parcel 73. Right now, what exists is a permitted ag uh, by a five acre extraction on each of those parcels separately. Those don't need the approvals that we're talking about today. Uh, but those exist out there now. And this also, this is what has been approved under <coughs> the first uh, Board of Appeals is this 20 acre area here, uh, but it, there's a smaller five acre area within that. This proposed uh, use requires a concept plan and a conditional use approval under sections 18.1.114.C7 and 18.195. E. The subject parcel does not have any encumbered areas or deed restricted areas or any other open space on it. Uh, the adjoining parcel, of course, it does because it is uh, a cluster subdivision. But none of this air, uh, none of this would impact this area. The proposed site. Can you see that? The proposed site, the applicant uh, would be working with the first 20 acres, of course, uh, which already has the, the current approval. Uh, then they would move into approximately 50 acres about here, and then eventually move into the, the rest of it into their 89 acres. And they are saying that approximately 1.3 million cubic yards of aggregate could be mined for the phase one and uh, ultimately a total extraction of 5.8 million cubic yards. Mm. <coughs> the end use plan, oh, great. I think that's a fancy color. The end use plans may be hard to see, it's actually not the same. But um, this all would be landscaped around it and would be essentially just a pond and all of this would be the forested area around it. So it would be reclaimed. <coughs> the proposed use is subject to a number of setbacks, 50 feet from any lot line, 125 feet from any street, and 200 feet from any uh, residential district boundary. The closest residential property is approximately 400 feet to the east, and the processing plant is approximately 200 feet from the closest property line. The mining operation is proposed to eventually encompass most of parcel 44. No blasting is proposed, and an electric hydraulic dredge is the primary method of extracting the sand. The operation is estimated to continue for 20 years, but not greater than 28 years, uh, with an annual removal rate of 728,000 tons for an average of 100 trucks per day. The majority of the product being extracted is sand, and the processes involved would be washing, screening, dewatering, and storage. The proposed hours of operation are from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Saturday. The Board of Appeals conditioned that the hours would be 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday and Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon with no Sunday hours. The proposed height of the processing equipment and storage piles is 35 feet. 45 feet is permitted. Other structures on the site include an office trailer, scale house, restrooms, So, okay, 
this is, there we go. <clears throat> uh, there is a previously approved septic area on parcel 13 on the cluster subdivision so, uh, property, and uh, the parcels would be administratively joined so that the septic is on the same parcel as the operation, and that was required by the health department. The applicant has submitted an administrative subdivision to accomplish this, so they would have the septic area. And also, the health department is asking that the well be located on the subject parcel. So that administration, uh, administrative subdivision is in for review at this time. The agent contends that any noise generated by the use would be consistent with normal agriculture operations with respect to the equipment used. It would not exceed 65 decibels at the property lines in accordance with COMAR. Uh, the applicant has submitted a full noise study. Any noise reduction would be accomplished by using modern mining equipment, including polymer coated conveyor equipment, which assists in deadening sound during this processing operation. Uh, regarding air emissions, no odor from the operation is anticipated as required by environmental health. Stockpiles of material must be designed to prevent wind drift from leaving the property. A stormwater management plan has been reviewed by DPW, and DPW staff has recommended approval of the conditional use as long as all of their comments are addressed. Major extraction declarations, a state surface mining bond, and a performance guarantee approved by the Board of Appeals for Reclamation will be provided before final permitting is granted. Regarding traffic, circulation, and parking, <coughs> the Previous approval had the primary point of ingress and egress. Okay, here it is. Um, down here on Ingleside, actually, get my finger on the screen, right down here, and the plant operation would have been in this area. Uh, the new point will now be the existing, which was on the other sheet, where they're doing the existing. That is, that is one of the big uh, amendments they're looking to do, is not to construct the facility down here, as was previously approved, and to keep the facility that is up here and have that remain where it is. The existing haul road uh, must provide adequate stacking of trucks waiting to exit onto Merrick Corner. The area around the processing plant will have to provide adequate parking for trucks and all the employees. Based on the discussions with the roads department, the applicant has agreed to designate the Merrick Corner entrance as the primary access with this amendment, and they will also, and the applicant would repair, resurface, replace, or other as necessary to identify by the roads department for any and all in existing road damage along Merrick Corner Road associated with the existing extraction use and to gate the existing entrance for limited controlled access. There was a traffic study done which is part of the requirements for the conditional use. This was done by Traffic Concepts and it indicated that intersection capacity would continue at the A level of service for Maryland Route 13, uh, 313 and Maryland Route 19. The State Highway Administration concurs with the findings of the traffic study, and the applicant would have to reconstruct Merrick Corner Road per the findings of the study and as a condition of the site plan and conditional use approval. Uh, regarding the landscaping, design, buffering, uh, lighting, I, that was on the end use I showed you. the. Uh, applicant is proposing landscaping berms at the entrance to at, on along Merritt Corner Road. Three rows of landscape screening are proposed along the southwest of the mining operation facing Greystone. That would be all along this, this area here. And the applicant is proposing to plant this strip of landscaping as each new phase begins. The plantings would consist of a mix of trees and shrubs. The site lighting uh, will consist of security and safety lights primarily surrounding the trailer office, skill house, and processing plant, especially during dusk and dawn time frames for fall and winter. And the applicant states that the lighting would not cause glare or spill over onto adjoining properties. Uh, environmentally, the site is not impacted by the critical area, threatened or endangered species, steep slopes, erosive soils, or the 100-year floodplain. 
The site drains from the north to the south in a large agricultural ditch. Water from the extraction and processing operation is recycled back to the mining pits. The water in the pits is constantly moving from both the recycled water <coughs> and groundwater to prevent the water from becoming stagnant. The remaining land of the site will continue in agricultural production. The forest on site includes a variety of hardwood species. Mineral extraction activities are exempt from the Forest Conservation Act. According to a response from the Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife Heritage Service, no state or federal records for rare, threatened, or endangered species are found within the boundaries of the project site. With regards to conformity with the 2010 Comprehensive Plan, uh, 2.0 sensitive areas, goal one states that undeveloped lands where mineral resources are found remain available for recovery activities accompanied with appropriate reclamation plans. Map ESA 7 maps the site as upland deposits and section 2.0 vision for water resources. The Queen Anne's County will remain a rural agricultural and maritime county because it restores, enhances, protects, and conserves its valuable land air and water resources through such matters as conservation and protection of agricultural lands, open spaces, <coughs> woodlands, wetlands, mineral resources, wildlife, and their habitats. I have included all of the recommendations that the Planning Commission made in 2010, as well as uh, the Board of Appeals, their recommendations as well. and. Uh, I did remove a few that had nothing to do with this any longer due to the revisions. Uh, essentially, I, I can go through them if you'd like, or do you want me to read all of them? No. no. Okay. And that's it for me. Did they get this? Yes. Okay. Here's the applicant. Okay. Good morning, my name is Stephen Meehan, uh, and I am here on behalf of Merrick Farm, LLC. Gary Griffiths here with Lane Engineering, uh, our consultants, Mr. Carbaum, and then Al Scotts, our facility managers of their questions. He's here to ask any questions. Just uh, briefly, uh, we, this started out as a minor extraction, or two minor extractions, and a, a plant up here. And in about 2009, Mr. Carbon started, started studying going to a major extraction. And at the time, I think his estimates were that there was good sand and gravel traffic demand that would justify building a big plant down here and a uh, out with ingress and egress out to here and then upgrade Ingleside Road. And it takes a while to go through the planning process, as you know. So by the, between 2009 until we got we got our approval in 2011, things really had changed. Uh, government construction had basically come to a halt, which is your and which fuels much of the sand and gravel industry because bridges and roads need for concrete and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, you need sand, but if you're not building it, it's not happening. We weren't building major buildings in the state of Maryland, and really the, the sand business became very flat. Uh, and for Mr. Carbom, heading into 2011 after we got the approvals and really going back to the lenders and figuring out how are we going to do this, it, it, it was obvious that this, this approach would never be viable. It would, it would be, I think, an economic disaster. So. In 2012, we went back to the Planning and Zoning Department, told them our quandary. And the reason it's taken, we, our first submittal was in July 2012, but it, it, it's taken a while to get road studies done. We've had to do borings, and essentially Merrick Farm is going to rebuild the Merrick Corner Road from here, just past the entrance, about 100 feet past the entrance. The, this, this road, it's an old road built long before modern standards there are you know there's uh, problems underneath that need to be corrected so it, it makes sense just to go ahead and do the, the upgrade we, we will be uh, you know funding that and we will be paying once we have our final approval there's no appeal 
will be uh, paying the funds to the county, and the county will construct the road. Um, but in essence, what we are proposing is uh, to keep our wash plant here, to um, asphalt. One of the issues in sand and gravel is dirt on the road, and we have attempted to mitigate by using heavy stone to knock dirt off as trucks come through. Uh, let me back up. We, we <coughs> sell material, we sell our cover material, we save our topsoil, sell our sort of uh, cover, uh, overburden is what it's called. Junk dirt is what they call it in the industry. That goes to the landfill, the Delaware Solid Waste Authority landfill at Sandtown. So it doesn't get wasted, it goes to work meeting their needs. Uh, and then the sand goes to the market. Our, our major sand clients uh, locally are Chesapeake, Burial Vault, and Gillespie and & Son. And I've got letters. Where the part? These are originals. Um, I have letters. Uh, I can just. I'll get back on track. From Gillespie and Son, our other major uh, client uh, for sand. when you're dealing with the overburden is the trucks come out in the field, they get the mud on the, on the tires. So we've constructed a, a, a basically a, a, a length of road that has heavy stone that knocks the dirt off. And uh, I was just out there the other, yesterday, and we put that in probably in February, would that be about right? And that has had a great impact on reducing the the mess. What will also, once we get this all the plant facility asphalted, that should play a major role in, in resolving any of the dirt on the road issues. Um, uh, so the um, so and it back to the our proposal. We, I don't know if you all, not all of you were on the commission when the county commissioners, the last administration, changed the sand and gravel laws and made it very restrictive to even mine. The Court of Special Appeals uh, struck that law down because of the preemptive effect of the State Surface Mining Act. And so we, would, we had originally proposed to do 20, a series of 20-acre uh, uh, phases um, what we are proposing now is just, is just to go ahead and get approval from you uh, for the whole piece. And then, so you understand, that this, is, this is a very heavily regulated industry. The Maryland Department of the Environment Surface Mining Department uh, regulates this. They're the sole regulating authority. Uh, permits are involved. Reporting is involved. There, there are site visits. They did their annual site visit in February. and really encouraged us to, uh, there's this two minor pits, they wanted to see everything on one property merged and was hoping that we would have the authority just to keep moving. And then they actually expand in about 20 acre in in increments, the, the Maryland Department of Environment. That's how, how they will allow us to expand. So that, our expansion is regulated by the Maryland Department of Environment. Um, just to address it, if, if, if we do, uh, there are from time to time we hear complaints from the community about the trucks. And of course, we're the, you know, we're the only, we are locally, that's, there are a lot of dump trucks come in and out every day. But along there, actually along Merrick Corner Road, and across 13 and going on, there's a lot of grain truck traffic because of the Purdue uh, granary at Robert Station, at Robert, the Robert Station. But we do, uh, we are aggressive about encouraging or, or requiring drivers when they are leaving our facility. They, they can, it's left turn only, takes you out to 313, 
and we have a posted sign, and I'll go through these photographs real quickly, but we require drivers either to go north on 313 or south on 313 to, um, to get to their destination, unless it's a local delivery. You know, there's some houses being built back here, driveways and that sort of thing. Uh, and we uh, submitted a letter, which you should have a copy of, from Mr. Carbomb dated June 12, that describes our sign. Um, the other issue that we are asking uh, for clarification on is hours of operation. We allow, we, have, we allow stacking at 6.45 in the morning, and we start loading trucks at 7 a.m. We lock that gate at 5, and that's Monday through Friday. And on Saturday, not much traffic, but we allow stacking at 7.45, loading at 8 a.m., and then we shut the gate at noon. But one thing came up in discussions with the county is, and this is really raised by Mr. Barton, is what does hours of operation mean? And we, uh, because of the nature of the plant, people get there at 5 a.m. to get to make sure everything is working, up and running the employees. And there are some days where there's such a demand, because this is a very demand-oriented, market-driven business. This time of year, lots of construction going on. There's a demand for concrete. There's a demand for sand. Um, there will be days when we will make sand or, or process sand after 5 o'clock. Um, and and there, there are days when the plant needs maintenance and it may take all, you may spend all day cleaning the, you know, fixing the plant and then we'll turn on and process sand in the evening so there's something for the truck drivers to haul away in the morning. And, uh, and we're going to ask the, the Board of Appeals just to clarify that that is um, permissible. It's sort of, in many ways, it's like restocking the shelves is the, the way I, I look at it. Holly mentioned we have, we, are, we used to be an all diesel facility. It's very loud. We are now all electric. We have uh, three phase power. We brought that in. We have an electric facility. And it's, it's amazingly quiet. Um, uh, and, and you really appreciate how loud the loaders are, the loading equipment, and the trucks are when nothing is going and it's just the plant running and it's sort of a hum. The dredge lies, and I'll if you pick up this photo packet, I'll run through it. We, uh, we use a dredge. Oh, sure. Is that This is a dredge built in Baltimore. Uh, we use a dredge to, to extract the sand. The, the material flows over to the, the plant. I thought I had a better here. See the plant over here. Uh, this is the view toward, toward, to the plant from the water. We have a little dock. We've actually begun our reclamation. You reclaim as you go. Uh, this here, this area here has been, been this wall has been reclaimed. Um, also, in terms, we've had prior conditions about notice to drivers, uh, and this is actually the scale ticket. The ticket comes out of this machine, so when the driver pulls that ticket, he gets a notice. No parking on Merritt Corner Road because it's a big issue, and no modified exhaust because that's an issue for neighbors. Uh, and if there are people who offend, uh, Mr. Scott or the scale house operator will go out and confront them and say, look, you, you, know, you can't operate like that. Here is our signage about, this is our, the uh, departure area, signage about using 313. And it's hard to read there, but the left turn only. Here's some, just a view of our landscaping. We've had a couple very hard years for landscaping. But at this point, our berms in the front are in place. The landscaping along the road is very healthy. And uh, there's more along the road. More along the road. Uh, this is actually from the uh, edge of the facility. You can see in the back, the trees are, are, are beginning to grow and cover up the piles. 
And then the last two photographs I just want to show you, we've, we've essentially taken, we're about here on the landscaping. And we'll just continue as we dig, uh, go forward. But you can even see in these photographs, uh, they do, you can see the value of the landscaping because we do, here's a truck here that is uh, now you know, blocked by the landscaping. And this is a broader picture of the landscape. So, um, so essentially what we're asking permission to do is stay where we are, uh, make some improvements to address the, the, the issue of <coughs> dirt on the road, and, uh, um, and then be permitted approval for the whole facility, and then just let the state of Maryland regulate us as we it, it, you know, grow. So that's, that's all I have. Yeah. <clears throat> as, as far as the state of Maryland regulating you, that's what the court decision basically said. Exactly. So that's really not a big issue for us to discuss whether or not they can go from 20 to 89. Is that correct? That's not on. So, so what, what we're talking about is whether we want to send a favorable recommendation for you to relocate, to not relocate your correct. processing plan. Could, can you go into a little more detail about why you originally were going to and now you're not going to. Well, I now think... I understand the market. You don't have to go into the dynamics. You, you're not going to sell as much stuff as you thought you were. And to build a new one costs more money. Is that all there is to it? You, well, it's but it's uh, it's a lot of money. I mean, the road, the, the, the plant is probably about a $2 million plant. And by the time we did all this, it was we were close to $3 million, which was going to be fine in 2009 when we were dealing with our, our capital and our banks. But come 2011, there just was not the market for it. Uh, we can sustain very nicely, you know, with what we have. And if, if, you know, if the economy improves, you know, we may be back here five years from now saying, gee, we, you know, we need a bigger plant. But for those of you who are in business, you have, you know, sometimes you have to make a decision. You know, even if you want to do the big, incredible project, the, you know, these last few years, the economy, the, you know, if you're going to survive, you got to be serious, you've got to, you know, you've got to check your ego and operate in a way that is going to make sense so you're viable. We employ seven full-time employees, and, you know, there's a lot of truck drivers who live in this area, and they come here and they haul. Uh, we do, as you'll see, a letter for both Mr. Gillespie and Mr. DeMoss. Uh, we, we provide a very, we are very well located to meet these concrete producers' needs and get a cost-effective product. So okay, back, back to my, I just want to be, make sure I'm clear. The reason you're not going to relocate and build a new plant is because you're not going to build a new plant at all. You got it. So you're going to stay with what you yeah. got because you can make money doing that and you won't make money if you build a new plant. You got it. Okay. Was part of relocating the plant to get closer to the other road instead of going on Merrick Corner Road? And is, is that being overcome by your agreement to build a, a fixed Merrick Corner Road or is that something that was required already? It, this, yeah, we, we're, wherever we were going to be, we were going to have to, we knew we had to upgrade this road, these roads. And so, yeah, we would have had to upgrade Ingleside Road and we're upgrading Merrick Corner Road for the same reason. But um, there's nothing, this is woods here. Nothing goes on here. This is woods and big deer hunting there, that sort of thing. So that will not be disturbed. There's no entrance there now. Okay. Um. Carbom's letter referenced the Vibrotech sound report. What is that? That is the sound report we submitted to the county, uh, and we had a sound engineer go out with their monitors, and they go at different points along the property line, and they come in, and they produce a report that says this is what your decibel levels are for your, your dredge and your um, uh, uh, processing plant. <clears throat> Okay. And, and that, uh, as, as his letter indicates, says that you're under the legal limits for daytime or nighttime limits for mining operations? Well, no, it, sound levels. I understand sound levels. Are the sound levels set for mining operations or are they for commercial Every, operations? Everyone. I mean, you have industrial, yeah, you, you have sound levels that are, are approved sound levels for daytime and nighttime operation. <laughs> I'm not a sound engineer, and it's more complicated than 
as I, but. This doesn't take into account the trucks though, correct? It's just the plant? Well, it's the plant, uh, right, it's the plant. I mean, the trucks come and go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure they take into account the loaders because they're on site during the day to, to fill the trucks, but um, uh, so that's included in it, but. Did, by you changing, I don't understand if you're going in phases, so excuse my ignorance, by you getting an amendment for the uh, to not have the 20 acre limitation, does that increase the amount of trucks per day? No, so the, it's 100 trucks a day regardless of? Right, it's just the, it's, it's, the plant only can produce so much. Uh, you know, the, these, the plants are, you know, they're sized. They're little plants, medium plants, and mega plants. We're kind of a little plant. Well, I have some questions. The, what is the life of that pit? I don't know. Which well, one? The whole 98? The whole, the whole 89 acres, I think it is. The way things going, uh, 20 years, maybe? Uh, 20 years? Or? I think about 20 years. 20 years? Okay. And you said the trucks per day right now are running about 100? Uh, it hit and miss, up and down. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's a not, range 80 not. to 120? Uh, 80 to 120, is there a range? Uh, it could be, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, it's up and down. It, it, and I guess all the materials probably already state certified because you're taking it to concrete companies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's good, good material. Yeah. And I, I noticed that we have two letters from, uh, <coughs> uh, who is this company? Uh, Chesapeake uh, Vault and uh, Gillespie. And I know Gillespie does precast, they do concrete. Right. Is there anybody else that, I mean, it seems like you would, you're making a whole lot of material. No, I, that, we are making it with 120 ton an hour. Yeah, right. right. We're yeah. running about 120 ton an hour. Right. What we're running. And and there's does any of this material head over the bridge or is it all state? Oh, yeah. Really? I mean, would you say 50 percent of it? I take oh, uh, I take her pretty much all shoot through. She's got about eight cement plants. Right. And so they're probably your largest customer. Oh uh, no. <clears throat> No, I take care of all Wilmington and all that up there too. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, let me ask you a question then. If you were to build that new plant, would you need to be doing any production during the off hours? Was a, was a new plant going to be able to produce but more sand and gravel? The, the problem with the big plant, with the way the industry is, mm -hmm. it's no way it could pay for itself. Right. It, it's so high maintenance, they take about a $4 million dredge to put in there, a $2 million plant. And um, but if you had that, I, I would have to run. I would have to do business twenty four seven to pay for that for plant. No, okay, that's no. that's what I was looking for. So and so regardless of the size of the plant, the bigger plant just means you need to produce more. And in any way you shake it, you're going to have to right. produce off of off hours when trucks are coming and going. Right. And and air plant where we sitting now, if if we want to make, uh, we have to change our dread to a bigger dread. Mm -hmm. And we could do it right there on the same plate. Our screen is fine. Our classified tank ain't big enough. Mm -hmm. We would need about uh, classified tank need another 20 feet on it to go up a you know up the side. Mm -hmm. so this is my second dredge in there. The mm -hmm. first dredge uh, we had in there it was uh, it's the same size, but it it didn't dig as deep. It was only a 20 footer, and I threw that in there because I had a landfill job. To build the base, 43 acres of uh, sand, two foot thick, and uh, I mean I couldn't supply. I had to I had to buy it elsewhere. But air product, just to give you an example, um, is a little different than a lot of people's product. We uh, we have no junk sand, almost zero, uh, and that's what I call fines. Mm -hmm. And if you go up to Kent Sand and Gravel, you see that big mountain up there. That junk. Right. It, it ain't no home for it. You can't even give it away. That's how bad it is. Uh, what little bit I got, uh, the farmers in the neighbor get get it. Uh, I've actually <coughs> need fines in my material to uh, uh, to make the FNs right. Mm -hmm. And air material, since it don't have so much fines in it, that and the reason I'm picking a lot of these semen companies up and and have. Is because they can do their batch mix and they do it once a year and once they do that batch mix they stick with you because they, they got to pay to have it certified again 
every year. Just so everybody, what he's, what he's talking about is like when they make concrete, you have different size sands and gravels and everything right. else. And once they get certified for a certain supplier, if the supplier can meet their demand, they yeah. can continue to it keep costs, their certification. It costs them the, about three to 4000 just to get take my sand, have it tested, and mix their mat, batch. But <coughs> using my sand, what they found out, they're saving about $6.60 a yard. And they're not so passing they it on to the end user, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they can put less concrete in because of the size of the so, FM. So with your new dredge, you're able to go deeper now. Uh, I mean, yeah, we I, go, uh, it's 33, 33 feet. 33 feet. 33, 33 yes. 33. Yeah. And, and at the end of this project, uh, you've got an 89, let's just say an 89 acre site that you're going to dredge out. at the When you're when it's all said and done in 20 years from now, what's going to be left on that site? It would be a, a lake area. I mean, the full 89? <coughs> okay, and how deep would that be? Uh, right now, the only way I could go <coughs> deeper is put a bigger, uh, you know, bigger snorkel in. Right, but how, so how, deep. how deep is that? How uh, probably the same material, uh, it, it varies. Because, just to give you an example, right now the sand is almost on top surface. Uh -huh. And we only got back to the of the, what I call junk dirt. Uh -huh. And before, when we started, it was... 10 foot, 10, 12. yeah, 10, 12 foot of jump, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a hard to... Well, how you know. far down can you dredge go right now? Uh, we dredge, right now, we dredge, we dredge 34 feet. Okay, so the, 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 for sake of argument, the, the pond's 34 feet deep? Grading yes. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, because when I look on the plans, I notice that the slopes on those... Yes. How does, that, how does it maintain that slope? I mean, I figured oh. if it's sand, it would want to go into a, a 3 to 1 or a 2 to 1. Well, what, what it does is, is uh, we, we come up a so far and we cut that slope okay and that material so hard down there it's unreal really you get to 22 feet you ain't gravel 12 inch of gravel yeah. hmm. and i mean it's i mean it just takes that big dredge and just throws it around yeah if i if i might sure. um to coin a mr howard phrase this is very interesting nonetheless <laughs> um the traffic study that was done was this done prior is it strictly based on Merrick is the traffic study still good based on the sole Merrick entrance and exit it, yeah the tra we've a we, we did a whole oh, no. everything we did for this round we did last round and it did for, not take into account the Ingleside well the last one did but this there is no activity on Ingleside at least from our our Correct. effort but the traffic study focused solely on what would be the impact if we continue to operate on Merrick Corner Road. And A, understand, A is is like the lowest of traffic activity. It's in the in the traffic study world, it's A, B, C. C being very high and A being, um, you know, just free flow. Yeah, kind of free flow, I guess. And we have, we've had meetings, <laughs> State Highway, the county roads. This road's been studied by everybody and we've had borings done and so that's what why we ended up with the road construction project which I, would handle the that is designed that upgrade is designed so that when we're done they, the county has a nice road it's it's they'll be able to take the weight it would be like having a, a, a modern county road right and I understand that the excess funds you're going to do a one uh, lump payment and excess funds will go into a maintenance fund correct with the county will be in the control of the correct. county then. so is your client agreeing to maintain this road for the duration of your 20 to 28 years of operation no once the count once the once we pay the money over to the county it's going to be the county's road and the county's job to maintain I have a couple other it. questions. Go, go ahead. Yeah. You're doing good. Um, dust and wind drift suppression. The le I'm referring to the letter that was submitted by Mr. Carbom yesterday. I'm saying his name correctly. It says water truck and other resources utilized for dust suppression are deployed as required. What would other resources be? Uh, uh, sweeper, you know, getting. Ice. Pardon? Noise? Noise issues at all off a sweeper? No, the sweeper is like a, it's essentially it's like a bobcat with a with a broom up front. It's not a vacuum or anything that would be real. I also had a couple of concerns with regard to your um, 
timing of your operations. I think you sort of addressed that, but I think you were a little bit evasive. Um, some evenings, I, I'm just kind of concerned about the noise that's going to be going on. And also with regard to the neighborhood or whatever that is up there, um, lighting. Is lighting 24 seven? And with regard to evenings, what would the noise be like in the evenings? And how late would that run in early on a Saturday? It, it's it, the noise. It really is. You almost have to go there to, to, to believe it. So, if you want to believe it, but when you when you're doing nighttime or you're doing, just, all you're doing is dredging and processing the sand. The noise is very minimal, and that's all what what we're talking about. We're talking about a guy out on the dredge, running the dredge. Okay, talk to me like I'm a fourth grader. If I'm in okay. food lion and you're the plant, am I hearing you? If I'm no. sleeping over there you, in food lion. If, if, well, if you. No, no. Okay, can I yeah, see what is your, are your lights shining in my window? No. The lights are... Shining at the plant. Yeah. There's no, sh they're, they're, there's no houses behind I'm not going to hear you and I'm not going to see you? No, no, you would not. And the lights are, you know, the county wanted minimal lighting. OSHA wants certain kinds of lighting. But it's really not invasive. I mean, it's not this big, bright... It doesn't look like the Food Lion Shopping Center in and the middle of the like, night. It's like the yeah. dredge. It's down in... It's down in the dredge is, and the lighting coming off it is shooting on the water. The plant light is shooting on the plant, the and land, all we got to do is watch the in the elevator. The landscaping that was um, planned for phase one that's going to continue. Yeah, yeah that's. Oh, yeah. And I understand there's been some problems with regard to the weather conditions, but y'all are taking <laughs> care of that. Well, I've done replanted two, three times. The, the plantings, um, it's basically a evergreen perimeter buffer, and that was under the original approval, as well as under the modification. And, and so that runs the bonded. perimeter of the property or the perimeter each phase. It's, it ultimately runs the perimeter of the property, and but it'll go it's down extended the side north the south too. as the as the phase as as the dredging moves south. Not put in up front. Put in as they move. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone? And I can tell you that there's been some reports from neighbors. Nobody from planning and zoning has been there. That the dredge operation is operating late at night on weekends. Whether that's true or not, I'm just reporting to you what's been reported. Can somebody from staff explain what this paper is? This, um, it's an anonymous. I don't know if you guys got this, but we have a paper that was received on the 13th that talks about uh, June 4th, 12th, uh, and when you were operating. This was submitted anonymously. Quite frankly, I think anything submitted anonymously right. should not be included in our record in the future. I don't know whether we have the ability to do that. Sure, I mean, you can choose what you want to um, Because there's no way for anyone to defend it. I don't know if you guys got a have copy. Have you all seen it? No. But what? It, it indicates that you, that, that operate, it doesn't say that trucks were coming. It just says no, the things no were trucks. operating. And, and I don't, I mean, from your letter, I'm, the, the, the Board of Appeals sets your time limits and what they intended with that, I, I have no idea. And, yeah, and I think it's up to them to, to tell you what that it, is. And that's our, we just wanted to put it on the table so we're, we're you know, we're talking about it. But if I, and I can, and Al, Al will, can explain this also, um, you, we, you, you're generally, if we are going after five o'clock, because most of these people have been there all day and want to go home, it's, it is, it's, it's generally a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday type situation because there's just a big demand and you, it's, uh, you, know, you, you, you want to have something to to uh, load in the trucks in the morning, so that's... Well, other than, than the trucks coming and going, I, if you can't hear it and see it, I don't know that there's any reason for someone to care. Now, someone obviously believes that they should care, and whether it's just because they think you're violating what, what your requirements are, or whether they say you're wrong and you can hear it, I'm sure we'll hear from them shortly. But um, back to Shannon's question about the food line, what about the, the closest house to your plant? Can they hear your operations? No, and I don't see Mrs. Joy. After hours, they should not. Yeah, they, uh, they should not hear it. You yeah, didn't hear that. You, not, not I mean, if they the, can't hear it and they can't see it. So we ran that test night and day. I, and I don't remember what, what the decibel level when we were talking about outdoor events, but it was like 50 decibels was a normal conversation or something along those lines, and this is saying 65 decibels, if that's accurate. I yeah. think that it's... 
So, but the state standards. Hey guys, in there a couple days. Well, well, whether it's the state standard or not, whether you're, the, the real question is, are you renewing anybody? I mean, you have the right to mine the stuff. We already know that. You have the right to expand it. We already know that. And if you're not annoying anybody, and no one's going to be here to complain about it, I, I can't see why we would do anything other than, than, tell the board of appeals to take into account whether you're annoying people. Um, not that they're entitled to not be annoyed necessarily, <laughs> but that's. That's it. That's the only issue that I think, um, other than the trucks. Well, I, I I agree about trucks. Come you know five o'clock. They we don't need trucks. You know, uh, I don't have a problem. You know about these trucks. A lot of air drivers come three thirty and four o'clock. They're done. You know, uh, if they come in, they preload, they leave for the next day, and then they ain't in there in the morning. And all. So, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, mine's quick. I go think. ahead. Uh, the only thing I had on your letter was when this was before us before, you were going to have some kind of a, I don't know how it was going to work, but you were going to have a trough that people were going to drive through and wash off the dirt. Um, uh, and now you're saying you're going to do this with heavy stone. Well, I, and the, the real question to me, and, and I, I don't care what the answer is, but I think that I would like to see any recommendation we send to the Board of Appeals say that whatever you do has got to be effective, and if it's not effective, you got to do something different. So, yeah. are you all st tracking mud out on the roads well, now? Well, I, biggest I, problem. I, let me talk a minute if you don't mind, Steve. The biggest problem we found out. We did build a little trough down there and try to. The you know, biggest problem we found out. Anytime we created water, it created yeah. mud, yeah. and it actually it got too sloppy. You know, because every truck go through there just created more, and they just a little longer, a little longer, a little longer. You know, and that's why we thought we would go ahead and and blacked up our entrance and around and, and we went down back put bigger stones all the way down I know it's rough and hard on the truck but side point and we we have slowed down there only other than black top and we haven't done that yet we we're waiting on to figure out what we're gonna do with the road and kind of go like that so some of the mud that's uh, on Merrick Road near the entrance is also being kicked up from current turning motion out of out of there uh, uh, hitting the shoulder and we're going to be putting a better radius on the entrance uh, in addition to the Merritt corner road improvements that are going to make it where the trucks are staying on pavement as they're coming in and out so the traffic study did it take into account the graystone development and the tr 20 lots that'll be on Merritt corner road yeah, yeah, I believe the traffic study does. The problem with the Greystone project is that that project went bumped several years ago. Sure, so but but the lots are still they're yeah they're still there. there. Yep, and at some point there'll probably be houses there, and so as a commission we need to keep that in mind that there are 20 lots there, 20 plus lots that will will be entering on Merritt Corner Road. How many? Tons of sand does your machine withdraw on an hour? Did you, you said make about 120 ton an hour. Okay. But then you have, uh, then you have other product come off. You know, your stone. Money, including the weight of the uh, water. Uh, well, you you average in that the water runs out overnight. Well, that's what I mean, when, when it comes and out, you got 120 tons of water. Uh, well, we 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 got 120 ton, ton of sand. Okay. So, yes. so where I'm going with my questions, so you're not yeah. wondering, is that if you're doing 100 trucks a day, about, how many hours of operation does it take to produce enough sand to put on 100 trucks? Well, see, the, the, the problem is um, you, you, you need a reserve stockpile. Sure. Because some days, if it takes off rain, they're bomb or they cancel all loads. Right, right. You know nothing but come the next day they'll want more mm -hmm. but you've got to have product on the days you can't go out and run just like this storm just went through we lost we have come out you know we got shut down um uh, any lightning and uh, then come winter time when it's freezing we can't make sand we got shut down but we got to have material on the yard and the goal is, is trying to get 250 to 300 ton extra every day to keep us 
when the days we can't make sand or like we'll be shut down here for a week just rebuilding and we rebuild about two to three times a year and uh, that answers my question really well okay. thanks and I, I just want to say that um, I live at the intersection of 544 and 313 maybe eight or ten miles north of this gravel pit but I live in between Kent sand and gravel and this gravel pit so I have dump trucks on my road all day long and uh, I don't find that obnoxious I don't know how many dump trucks go past my driveway every day but it's it's not uh, intrusive to us operating our business uh, there so uh, and I, I will tell you probably 50 percent of them trucks are coming from us and, and, and I and pretty much tell you 544 is the shortest gap from 313 to 301 so the tra that's their access to 301 and it's it's you know it, it, sure it's nice to just hear the crickets but sometimes you do hear right. the trucks and it's not that up not these trucks spread out through the day or do they mostly yeah, come nah. so, so you're dealing you with, got, with 10 or 12 trucks an hour uh, you got sometimes you got a whole hour nobody around right. and all one you know here they come but a lot of times most of them will make two rounds a day they first thing in the morning they make the rounds other than the trucks are going to the landfill every day to cover trash up They'll, they'll, we've got what four to five every day run that same run and they get properly right around eight loads to nine loads a day are they mostly bringing back stone if they go to the western shore are they oh. coming back with stone or something well good? we take we bring uh to the landfill we bring crushed concrete back from the western shore stone just so high over there we can get we get it out of pennsylvania well, i thought about you but uh, oh. like it's hot for uh yeah he western. runs out of us too He'll, he'll, but they bring it back and come yeah, back empty. They, uh, they go usually, they load and then they go up Perryville and pick up uh, gravel and take it down to tires, uh, line it, and then, yeah. So one of the concerns I have, um, not just for this gravel pit, but any of them, is the staging of the trucks before they open. So y your gate is shut, and if I own a dump truck, I want to get as many lo loads hauled as I possibly can in a day to make my truck profitable. So I want to get there super early well, to what, be early in line. I can answer that question. Yeah. What usually happens <laughs> is we got some guys that, that dump off down the lower shore. They must dump off, I mean, early in the morning, four in the morning or something. Actually, I, I know where they dump. They're right in the, in the town. Then they come from there and come up to us. What they do... They'll come rolling in there. So the park, letting them park on the road, air gates are open. We let them pull in there and park. But we do not let them go out of there. I mean. And they turn their trucks Oh, off. yeah. They turn and shut, they shut the trucks off. and just So all the staging, and I think it's addressed in the report, all the staging is taking place <coughs> off of Merritt Corner Road. So there are no trucks on the side of Merritt Corner Road right. at 5 o'clock in the morning yes, sir. waiting to get through the gate. Yep, that's just what our game plan is, is to have them in the, in the gates sitting. I just want to note that one of the Board of Appeals conditions was that there should be no truck parking on yeah. Merrick Corner Road and no stacking or parking outside of the gate, and that the applicant had to post a sign regarding those restrictions. So on that note, um, if trucks are parked on Merrick Corner Road, what's, what's, what's the repercussions? Violation. Of their conditional use. Now, of all the compl of the complaints that planning and zoning receives regarding this use, I don't believe that's been one of them. Okay. Well, they and and that a call about a um, motor vehicle violation would probably go to the county sheriff's office versus planning and zoning. Okay. And the um, county owns this road. Yes. So the county wanted to post a sign that says you're going to um, be fined if you park on the side of this road. They can enforce that. Yeah, and uh, Public Works, I don't know if we've gotten any complaints about parking on the side of the road. We've yeah. gotten complaints about the condition of the road as a result of truck traffic, um, but not on park. Complaints okay. about trucks <clears throat> showing up on the other county roads that when they're supposed to be encouraged not to go on those roads. We've gotten those complaints. Yeah. And, also, just to clarify a point on the um, hours of operation, that issue has just come up and come up in this letter in the last couple of days. And that is something that I think will the Board of Appeals will need to um, get additional information from staff and way on. And on. Um, it isn't an issue that we've had time to really evaluate. We've always considered hours of operation, you're open or you're closed. 
pretty black and white, cut and dry. Um, and we would interpret the original Board of Appeals hours operation as that, you're open or you're closed. This open for truck traffic versus open for the plant operation is, was not part of the discussion before, but it will be part of the discussion as it moves forward right, to the Board of Appeals. I mean, at any, any other business, you could go and wait in a parking lot 15 minutes before that business opened. So I, I don't see the problem with trucks uh, on their property waiting to... I think the, the question about hours operation is more about the dredge operating, the, um, the sifting machine operating and running and manufacturing um, on out, yeah, after dark you know, or on the weekends and, and those types of things. Uh, the queuing of traffic, yeah, I, I agree. That so they, are as long people as complaining that they're hearing that noise at that time? Like, I don't really understand what that the letter that doesn't have we, a name or... We were getting complaints, yes. We were getting getting notified that they've, they're they operating at all kinds of different hours. So... Whether it's because they could hear it or see it, whether it's because it was an annoyance or because they're aware they're in their opinion they weren't supposed to be operating at that time we don't know the motivation for the calls just that we're getting okay. and the hours of operation is a condition of the major operation which is what they're going back to the board of appeals on which they want to get clarified you know in our we don't have the sound expert here today but i, I think we'll bring the sound expert to the board of appeals to discuss the sound issue because um i mean other than the sound they're really, I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere. I mean, really, I mean, in, in Queen Anne's County, you couldn't get a more remote location, probably, but near a state road, which is good for the county. Um, and uh, and we'll bring Tim to explain the sound issue, but it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's just the guy out in the dredge doing his thing and the machine processing through. And it's, we, the, the, these guys have made a real effort. This sound, we understood that sound was a big issue and getting to the, the three-phase power and going electric, it, it is from, the, I think, mean, been part of this from the beginning to now, and it, it's, it's night and day. I mean, it's really quite amazing how much Yeah, I originally had a big generator there, uh, big V6 run, and you know what Detroit is, loud. And finally, I got the power company, and I, we, they drawed it up, and I paid to have that three-phase current put down the road and got rid of that generator and uh, um, are dump truck drivers um, inherently more dangerous or drive faster than other truck drivers I, I, my my experience is most truck drivers are professional and they don't want to lose or they're heavily regulated and they, they try to be safe uh, I remember at our original hearing the truck drivers who take it seriously really take offense to being you know uh, the last time I was here, there was complaints about them speeding and, and coming through other areas. And I don't know that I've ever seen a dump truck involved in an accident. I'm sure they do. Also, but I don't know that I've ever seen We haven't had no accidents out there. Knock on wood. Any other questions for them? The biggest thing with the trucks is a lot of people think a truck is running 50 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone because of the sound of the truck. Right. And that, that is, I sympathize with you with the part. I used to be in the grain business. Truckers want to get where they're going. They want to get loaded as fast as they can. They don't want anybody to get in their way. And they don't care about dirt on the road. They don't care about anything like that. So the truckers are a lot of your problem. I don't think the pit is too much of a problem. I'll tell you, some of them are right hard hit it, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I've been there. And, All right, and, well, um, we, would, uh, we thank you. And um, we would like to take any uh, public comment at this time. Thank you all for your time. Can I just sit here? Yes, please sit down, tell us who you are, where you live, and uh, you have uh, anything you'd like to tell us. I'll be fast. Uh, Virginia Wealthy, and I live on Schultz Road, and I travel Merritt Corner Road and Woodyard on to Ingleside Road. I want to I'm make sorry, could you repeat your name? Virginia Wealthy. Thank you. And I travel Ingleside Road and Merritt Corner Road. I just want to make sure that in the new plan, now that they're stating they're not going to be putting an entrance on Ingleside Road, that that will show up in their new plan. Um, Merritt Corner Road, there is still dust and there is still mud, and I realize they're working on that. And I'd like a time frame written down on when they're going to make that repair. You know, it's been a couple years and we're going to fix this, and it hasn't. 
been done. So a time frame for that and a time frame for the road. Uh, there are a lot of ruts in the road. They are repair, but it does take time. And it's not that the truck drivers are bad. It's just that the weight is heavy and those roads were not engineered, designed, or built to withstand that weight. So it's nice you have um, a vapor promise and an IT. That's a promise that's in someone's head. And that's kind of what I'm hearing here. It's a vapor promise. We're going to do this. And we're going to turn this money over to the county for those repairs. It would be nice to have a date put down as to when that money is going to be turned over and when those repairs are going to be made. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Carl Donnie signed up. Is he here? Yes. My name is Carl Downey. I live on 316 Merrick Corner Road. It's approximately right in the middle between 313 and uh, can't think of the name of the road. Sorry, <laughs> that's all right. Big Woods. No, not Big Woods. The other one down the end is uh, Angleside Road. Angleside. No, no. The next road, we got it. Goes into All right. Anyway, my concern is the trucks coming up and down there. It's approximately about 25 or 30 of them a day now that come up and down there. We got one little bend right up past my house. Now, they were talking about you don't know how fast the truck's going. Well, I've been in the trucking business all my life. You can tell when a man throws a jake brake on on a small curve, he's going too fast. And the jake brakes do make a lot of noise, but I'm not concerned about that. There's 12 to 14 children that live on that little road. It's a narrow road. When those 10 wheelers come down there, half the time, not half the time, a lot of times they're over the center line and you got to run in the grass and it's not much grass there to run in. And who is going to maintain that road when these trucks get to be more coming up and down there? Up at the other end, before you get to 313 on Merrick Corner Road, it's starting to get tore up. Across 313, a year or so ago, it was so bad that it was there for about, I know, months on end before anybody fixed it. And all they did was dump a bunch of slag in it, number two big slag. And it wasn't a very good patch job. That's my concern about it. And all the people of America Corner Road feel the same about their children. If you got more trucks running up there, there's going to be more chance one of those children is going to get hit. That's all I wanted to say about it. You I have no problem with this mining operation, just those trucks coming up and down there. What? You live directly on America Corner Road? I live directly on America Corner And Road. it's a double yellow line road? It, it's supposed to be, yes. <laughs> It's it's tar and chip. There's not much line left. How far back is your home from the road? It's only about, I'd say, 70 feet off the road. Thank you. Majority of them are. Are you on the north side of 313? On the north side? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm on the north okay, side. So, in other words, trucks are coming out of the pit down Merritt Corner to two, 313 and then crossing over and still staying on Merritt Corner? Yeah, they're, they're going across They're going across 313 straight, Which is down, still a county road. straight down Merritt Corner to... Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I know the road you're talking about, but you're... Right where the brain But is. they're crossing 313 and staying on Merritt Corner Road, which is a right. county road, which the owners of the pit are trying to correct them from doing it, but the truckers are doing it. Right, and they're coming up there, some of them, I don't know what name of them are, but they're black dump trucks, and they've been coming up there at 5.30 in the morning. And a couple mornings I looked out there, we had foggy mornings, the kids are standing there at 6.30 in the morning, and I know them, truck, them trucks can't see them kids there. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else from the public have comment? Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm Alan. I'm plant manager of Merrick. Uh, we're trying to address the problem he has here with the dump trucks coming in early in the morning. Uh, one of the neighbors closer that's right on 313, he had spoke to me one time about the same black trucks the gentleman just spoke of coming in early. 
and uh, using Jake brakes and this that the other. I addressed it with them. They no longer use their Jake brakes. We're trying to keep all our trucks off that road. Um, you know, it's down to the point where a truck driver is saying to me, "Well, we're paying taxes on a road. It's not a restricted road." But my my statement to the to the guys are, if you want to run for us, we want you off the road. We want you on 313. So. We try, you know, if anybody ever has a complaint or whatever with a truck driver, my office is right there at Mary Corner. We address them. I mean, if we hear a truck come into our facility, it's got a jake brake on, coming into our facility, either my scale operator or myself are at the door because we, we don't tolerate it because it's a nuisance. I drove for, I drove professionally for 16 years, so I kind of know trucks. Uh, I don't want to tolerate it because I know that it's always something that's looked at as a big vehicle. You know, and I don't need attraction to the trucks. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to address the issue about the road improvement. Um, our proposal is once there's an unappealable decision by the Board of Appeals, we would settle with the county within 30 days. And then the county will, you know, they've got their own, you can't build a road overnight. It's, but. Why is it uh, unappealable? Meaning, if uh, we go to the Board of Appeals, get a favorable decision, and someone in the public were to appeal that to the circuit court, uh, they go 30 days to appeal that decision. Um, we don't have a final decision, but uh, lenders aren't going to allow, or aren't going to lend you money for a, you know, two hundred thousand dollar road project without a, without finality as to whether or not you're going to be able to do the project. So. Wait a minute. No, we can't have the, the, this. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this woman was. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. She, she wants to come forward so we can hear what she says. That will be fine. In your final. If you'd identify yourself. Virginia Wells and again. Um, in your final proposal to get this forward, will there be a date in there as to once this is proposed, like X amount of months, X amount of years before you have that road repaired? Uh, it's when we get a final judgment that cannot be appealed so that we can move forward with the project we will within 30 days settle with the county on the road money and in the county will you know they'll, they'll have to the roads got to be in mean, there's a process to constructing mm -hmm. roads so I would assume it's going to be relatively quickly though but uh, that would be the game plan. We can, uh it's only been in the last Barry Griffith, the plan engineer. It's only been in the last few days that um, the developer and lane engineering and uh, county department of public works have actually come to a full resolution on exactly what is going to be done with the road. And it's a very substantial upgrade, particularly on the one side where the weight has caused some uh, some that edge of the road to sink, and there's about six tenths of a mile it's not just an overlay it's not just laying yep. down it's some patching removing base material replacing base mm -hmm. and a wedge fill on that one side so it's going to be a substantial road improvement the county's comfortable with uh what was agreed on there's actually been a contractor mm -hmm. at the site looking at it providing cost estimates it, it is moving forward all right that's what i needed to know mm -hmm. I thank th you i should point out that these road improvements and the other conditions of uh, conditional use approval are supposed to be completed before this operation moves beyond or into its major operation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. And I'm, well, I'm hoping the recommendation is once we've paid the county, we can move forward. I, mean, I don't want to be a ho hostage to. But once, once no. you've paid your money, you. You've done what you're supposed to do. Right. Well, that's up to the Board of Appeals. Yeah. But okay. There's not Any other public comment? Okay, we're going to close public comment. And uh, yes. For clarification's sake, the only thing we're looking to do is to remove the 20 acre limit. That's already gone. And state okay, state for, state. The, for this, yes. And they're not necessarily expanding their operation, correct? What we approved previously was they were going to build a new plant. Right. That's really the big thing. Here. Okay. They're going to not build a new plant. They're the going to leave the plant where it is, and they got to upgrade the road. Is that? Is there anything else substantially new in this? 
And, and the gray stone. That it would be for the full 89 acres as opposed to 20 acre increments. Right. Yes, but, but, that's, but that's, that's beyond our control. control. Yeah, we we got to approve control. that. They don't even need our blessing on it, right? Well, we're going to approve it because they're asking for it, but we don't have a choice. Right. My only concern is that the um, the trucks and traffic, and if Greystone is right there, and, and they're going to have a 20 lots and let's say 2.5 or whatever, and they already have 12 to 14, but they're trying to address the trucks, so I don't think that that's necessarily the plan. Okay. So, any other discussion? We need we need a motion to um, send a favorable or unfavorable recommendation with whatever conditions we want to send. So we were well behind, so someone yes. jump on it. Vice Chairman, this is your Ballywick. My Ballywick. Well, that's a nice one. All right. Resolve that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Merrick Farms LLC to amend approved minor and major extraction conditional uses for the operation of sand and gravel mining on approximately 89 acres and as more particularly described by Department of Planning and Zoning File 01-10-11-0007 and Board of Appeals File CU-01-0007 hereby forwards a favorable recommendation to the Board of Appeals under 18 one dash nine five dash e and i don't see any conditions that i would put on there well you can amend it we had quite a list of conditions which i think enabled the applicant to operate in a way that was conducive to the neighborhood and so i i think it's important that we put on the record a through p can we just cut and paste <laughs> A through R. A through R, I'm sorry. You With the right following there. recommendations of uh, A through R. In the staff. <laughs> In the staff report. But before that gets seconded, well, no, we can. Robert's rules. Does anybody want to second that? I'm going to second that. Yeah. There you well, go. Discussion. So. In N, the hours of operation is limited to 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. through Friday with no trucks allowed on site until 645. And I think the applicant was trying to get some... Uh, Didn't Steve say that that was up to the Board of Appeals, that they were discussing that now? I think it's two different issues. That's running the plant after hours, and this is the trucks coming on to the plant Well, I think morning. from our perspective, all we need to do is modify exactly. N to say the Board of Appeals should pay special attention to hours of operation and what that means and when trucks can and can't come. We don't have to say what they, what those hours are because they're going to have whoever opposing this there to say what their beef is and what they think should happen. So all we got to do is say you should pay attention to that. And, and if it isn't in these letters here already, they should pay attention to uh, dealing with um, mud on the road. We don't, have, we don't have to have an answer for it. We just want them to pay attention to it. I would move that we amend the motion by including what our chairman just said, which is that the Board of Appeals should pay attention to the hours of operation and the times that trucks are allowed to enter the property and that they should sp pay special attention to the road uh, care as far as dirt and mud and gravel out on the road. There's a second to that. Second. So we have a motion as amended. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, motion passed. Thank you. Ac actually, Barry, um, we, I made an amendment. We have to vote on the amendment, and then we vote on the main motion as amended. Okay, Aye. we're going to vote on the amendment. Everyone, if, it, it, There's already a second on the amendment. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the amendment carries, and then we're voting on the motion as amended, um, which has already been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us um, to the next text amendment. This is a public hearing as well. Yes. Okay, this is a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Drummond is going to um, Chairman, change tape. Change tape. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, Mr. Chairman. Are you recusing yourself, Barry? Or no. Uh, <laughs> for, for a moment, you're recusing yourself. <laughs> more important business. 
Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I know. I know. Uh, the uh, following notice of public hearing appeared um, for two successive weeks in the uh, uh, Record Observer and the Bay Times, two uh, publications of general circulation in Queen Anne's County uh, uh, beginning on May 31st uh, of this year, ending on June 12th of this year. The notice of public hearing is as follows. To chapter 14.1 of the uh, County Code, particularly uh, sections 14.171 and 74, the Planning Commission gives notice that it will hold a public hearing for the proposed text amendment number 16, oh, sorry, number 13-16, growth allocation, additional criteria for lo location of intensely developed areas, uh, the uh, proposed amendment to uh, Title 14.176D5A adds criteria to further define where new IDA areas may be proposed. The hearing will be held on Thursday, June 13th at 10 a.m. It's now 11.26 a.m. here at the Planning Commission meeting room in Central Maryland. The purpose of the public hearing before the Planning Commission is to provide an opportunity for all interested persons to be heard on the proposed change to Chapter 14 of the County Code, in particular 14176 D5A, for the purpose of adding criteria to the growth allocation process when new IDAs are proposed. My turn. The notice of public hearing goes on to indicate that the proposed text amendment uh, and supporting documentation may be reviewed during regular business hours at the Department of Planning and Zoning here in Centerville, and concludes by indicating that the uh, hearing site is accessible to those with disabilities and gives instructions to those with uh, hearing impairments is how they how he or she might acquire assistive listening devices. I'm satisfied, Mr. Chairman, that the notice of procedural prerequisites to the convening of this public hearing um, have been satisfied. Before you begin, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'm informed uh, that the uh, there's approximately 30 people here who are awaiting um, consideration of the uh, uh, site plan for the proposed McDonald's. Some members of the public of, of that group want to know whether it will be heard now or after lunch, and should may they come back after lunch? And I think that's probably a good idea. Well, to Sir, to that end, for talk. for um, right now, the this agenda item is a uh, agenda item which is a public hearing for your, and it was a pub published public hearing. Um, I would suggest that we just open the public hearing, accept any comment, and defer deliberation until after lunch. Is there any? We'll still have two other projects scheduled in front of them, um, and unfortunately, we got tied up on the first one this morning. Yes, so while yes, we did. I suspect those other ones would be. Um, I, I think that we could safely say that we won't take that one until after lunch. Is that anybody have any other thoughts? Well, Steve, could you explain what your idea was? Our, our idea for the public hearing to move move things along would be to um, open the public hearing, accept any public comment, and then defer deliberation and discussion by the Planning Commission until later in the day. <coughs> um, that would move us to the next project, which is a uh, review of an open space um, relocation, and then the uh, Dunkin' Donuts. I would think the public would want to be here for our deliberation. Well, they would have the option. That's if someone speaks on it. I don't know if there's any on the yeah. IDA thing. I don't know if there's anybody here on that. But the, the people who are asking are here for the McDonald's issue. Correct. So they just want to make sure they're not going to miss it. I think after lunch is fine. You see any, I mean, we're not going to get through to that before. Well, the Dunkin' Donuts might take a little bit of time. So yeah. I'm not moving the open space probably won't, but. No. Uh, Okay. Um, then I, I think that we could safely say yes. We will we will hear the McDonald's plan after lunch, uh, whether it will be immediately after our lunch break or sooner will depend on how long the next two projects take. So we will hear them all in the order that they're here, but um, that one won't be until after our lunch break. So, so no. When it's here no. for for the McDonald's. Um, um, they can well, safely assume they, that they can. They they can safely assume that they may go and have lunch now and be back here um, by 12:45 when we will resume. Okay. okay. Um, so go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Good morning, still, I think for a little while. Nancy Scazzari, Senior Community Environmental Planner with the Department of Planning and Zoning. I'm before you today to um, introduce and, and hold public hearing on proposed text amendment 1316, growth allocation, additional criteria to the location of IBA <laughs> areas. Um, a little background, if I might. Presently, our local critical area program, as well as Comar, requires that um, IDA areas be 20 acres in size. This is, um, it's, it's been in definition form for a long time. Um, we've certainly seen projects come through here that are less than 20 acres and have been commission, uh, critical area commission approved for growth allocation. However, uh, today the way the regulation reads and the way it is being more strongly enforced since 2008 when the Critical Area Commission was granted regulatory authority is that if a parcel is not directly adjacent to other lands that are currently designated as IDA and comprise 20 acres or if that lot or parcel itself is not 20 acres, it at this time cannot petition for growth allocation. Um, it, it's, it seems practical um, within our growth areas uh, where we have infill lots that are oftentimes, you know, much less than 20 acres to allow for um, some movement in the direction of, of having some additional criteria that it would, would allow a lot of less than 20 acres to be come in and petition for growth allocation. So. Um, that's that's pretty much the background there and um, the objective there then is to uh, of this text amendment is to have additional criteria that would allow those properties wishing to petition for growth allocation to IDA intensely developed areas uh, to do so with this additional language um, the approved proposed amendment to chapter 14 um, would would read as shown in your staff report that, um, and this is section 14176 of Queen Anne's County Environmental Code Critical Area Program under uh, D, review criteria. When locating new intensely developed or limited development areas, proposed development projects may be signed growth allocation subject to the requirements of COMAR 27010206 and shall use the following location criteria. Locate a new intensely developed area in a limited development area or adjacent to an existing intensely developed area. The changes being proposed are the property or parcel may be less than 20 acres in size and must be located in an existing growth area and must be served by public sewer, must be consistent with the goals and objectives of, adopted, of our adopted county comprehensive plan and must have an overall economic benefit to the community. In addition to these criteria, we'd, um, we'd add to the existing definition of intensely developed area to allow for, for those criteria where it would say an area of at least 20 adjacent acres except as provided in 14176D5A as modified or the entire upland portion and, and so on for the definition. Um, we've uh, reviewed this with critical area over time. Um, this has come up time and time again. It's been problematic for some sites and actually um, you've uh, heard in recent months uh, Eastern Shore Genesis project um, which uh, and, and there's other projects as well in the pipeline that um, really where it had never been uh, held, held their feet had never been held to the fire before critical areas is really holding us to it we're discovering through our mapping exercise that there are places where uh, IDA may have not originally been mapped um, for the county and again create you know uh, problems for properties and you yourselves I think um, a couple months ago when you heard Eastern Shore Genesis decided to send them back to the drawing board so that they could lessen their amount of growth allocation request why take more when when more is not needed so with that um, you know I would hope that you would um, recommend make a favorable recommendation to the county commissioners so speaking of that specific project part of the issue there was it wasn't adjacent to other IDA 
That, that's, that's correct. That, that's not going to continue to be a problem. It's, if, as long as it's in the growth area, then it would be eligible for an upgrade. It still needs adjacency, but speaking specifically to that property, there's properties to the west that um, that are that did get growth allocation to IDA. Uh, there's the the um, D Donato property, K Wilson's Rudy Building, and and technically that IDA would come to the road, but as it's mapped today. The, the road, Shamrock Road, is LDA, as is the Eastern Shore Genesis property. So uh, technically, Critical Area is saying you don't have adjacency, nor do you meet the 20-acre requirement. So with the mapping update, um, we've proposed that that road will be IDA, um, as it really should have been mapped along with those growth allocations. But um, so that adjacency issue does, it doesn't go away. That adjacency uh, criteria still exists, but it would allow a property that doesn't have 20 acres um, to come through for petition for growth allocation. Okay. Any other questions for Nancy? Would there be no minimum? We haven't discussed that, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think we're all just sort of thinking of infill lots that we have in our growth areas. Um, and I think just by the way of zoning and what can be done, there's typically, you know, a minimum lot size that, that these lots presently consist of. Okay, anyone from the public like to comment on this? Mr. Thompson. Mr. Waterman. Uh, Jeffrey Thompson on behalf of Eastern Shore Genesis and um, I think Nancy you know pretty much stated our position and that's that you sent us you did send us back to the drawing board and it made perfect sense why ask for more if you if you need less I don't think there should be a minimum um, I understand a minimum if you're going from from RCA you know you're going to create a new growth area if you will but if you have these small nodes that you'd like to cover why have to grant more growth allocation than you actually need and I question how much how many 20 acre parcels there are in the county anyway I mean, I don't think you really have any. Um, none that I can think of right off the top of my head. Um, addressing, Mr. Chairman, your specific point on adjacency, um, maybe there could be another statement in this amendment we're making that says if you're adjacent to IDA or you're adjacent to a road that's adjacent to IDA. I mean, do you really want to burn up growth allocation on, on roadways? It doesn't make any difference. That's, that's one recommendation I would make in light of your comment. Thank you. Is the change of that road going to dig into our growth allocation bank, or that's just a that's part of the clarification? Mapping, I think. That um, there at that location, because of those properties to, to the west of it that were already granted growth allocation, that would be done as part of the remapping exercise. And uh, but if if there if that wasn't IDA on the other side, and they were coming in, their request would. Um, it would be their property, but it would take the growth allocation mapping line to the center line of the road. It would seem to me clear? that every, every road, by, by the very nature of being a road, is an intensely developed area. Not as mapped, no. I know it's not mapped that way, I, but it's a I, road. I, I understand. How much impervious coverages are in a road? I understand that, and, and actually that's um, a discussion that we're having with um, Critical Area Commission currently through this mapping exercise, that in our growth areas, uh, maybe we need to look at the roads in our growth areas being IDA, or at the very least, all I, our LDA. Uh, you know, some of them are actually RCA. So um, if you want to take a look at, uh, I, I don't want to prolong this if, if need be, but um, we have uh, several properties that, um, that have received growth allocation in the past. This one is um, uh, Friendly Food Store gas station in Stevensville opposite the Western Auto was granted um, growth allocation in the past under 20 acres. Um, this is uh, th this is the project um, Eastern Shore Genesis. These are the properties. This red um, designates the, the existing IDA. And then we have a property in the um, KRM Business Park where the red you see is the county um, sewer plant and, and parks maintenance building surrounded by RCA, which is the Terrapin Park, a little bit of LDA. KRM owns this lot, and if they were to, to come in um, and request growth allocation to IDA, 
because they're not, their lot line follows this, where my cursor is, does not, is not immediately adjacent. Technically, under the regulations today, they could not petition for IDA. We've discussed this with critical area mapping, um, and we've, um, you know, we've really, uh, you know, made it clear that that this IDA really should include all that road and all of that area that was developed with the sewer plant and the and the county maintenance property. Therefore, it would give that property adjacency. But otherwise, they wouldn't be able to petition for it. Would putting any language in this reference adjacency to a road that's adjacent to IDA be helpful or not? Um, we, you know, we could certainly clarify that. I think we could do that. Um, the question is whether Curtis Clare is going to shoot that down. Yeah, uh, and, and honestly, we have had very little um, feedback from them at this point with regard to this amendment. So um, there may be some tweaking that happens. But for the most part, um, they've worked with us and suggested language that we, you know, be consistent with our comp plan, um, you know, in a growth area is sort of the obvious, obvious criteria. Personally, I think it would be a good idea to include okay. some language that talks about adjacency to a road that's adjacent to any IDA is, is I mean, it wouldn't make sense to me for uh, the Genesis property to, to have ended up being excluded because the road was not IDA, or for us to have to give IDA out of our bank to a road that's a public road that's already paved. So if, if that might even might be helpful, I, I would be in favor of putting that in there. Okay. okay. Thank you. And that's the might I'm thinking about. If it isn't helpful or if they decide they're going to go ahead and include the roads anyway, then there's no harm, no foul. I mean, but if they don't, then at least we've got a fallback position. That's if, all. if, to speak to that, Jeff, if it um, is not determined by them, critical areas, to have been a mapping mistake, then it would use the county's growth allocation to make the roads. And that's why IDA. if we put it in here, though, it, it wouldn't necessarily right. use the growth allocation. So the so extent you're not burning growth allocation, then... So that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Any okay, other any other questions? public comment? Um, okay, then we're closing public comment, and uh, what we would need is a motion to send a favorable or unfavorable recommendation to the county commissioners with any amendments that might suggest. That would be an amendment that you include with the road. How, how would that? Yeah, it would just you would just recommend that we make a favorable recommendation with a modification to add some language. Blah blah blah. <laughs> what they yeah. said. What they said. <laughs> you remember, well, no. Do you remember? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that if a property less than 20 acres seeks growth allocation, uh, pursuant to uh, sec whatever that section is that it will be considered to be adjacent to an um, it will it could be considered to be adjacent to IDA if it's adjacent it to a pro road. provided that it is adjacent it is provided that the basically that the, that they're on opposite sides of a public road um, I'm not being very articulate but uh, you getting the message across. Yeah, I mean, the other option we have to not doing it that way is to send them back and have them do the language. I don't think we need to do that. Mm -mm. Matter of fact, I, the chair will make a motion that we send a favorable Thank recommendation you. to the county commissioners uh, on text amendment 13-16 uh, with a recommendation that uh, language be added to that that uh, indicates that any property less than 20 acres seeking IDA designation which is adjacent to a road which is adjacent to other property which is IDA will be considered adjacent. Yeah. Second. Gotcha. Second what he said. All in gotcha. favor. Okay. Right. Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you guys don't pay attention. <laughs> I want to say you Okay. That takes us to uh, major subdivision 0313-04-0006. Um, Thomas Wiesman. Yes. Sure. Did I? I can do it. I did. Shannon. Okay. Shannon's first. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to pick over the open space of this subject. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
He's picking your bones, but don't worry. How many times is the open <laughs> space on this thing going to get picked on? It's never been. Well, this is only the first time it's getting picked on. What? This is the first time it's been before you for an open space change. Go ahead, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> this year. <right? laughs> You're thinking of Brown Point for expediency. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, um, Peanut Gallery. This is uh, Major Subdivision uh, 03130406. It is an amendment to McKinney Forest. It's the open space. The file name is under uh, Weissman Thomas. The tax map is 44, <coughs> parcel 57, lot 1. The property is located in McKinney Lane and Doom Clark Road, west of the town of Centerville, north of Route 18, and direct access to the lot is off of McKinney Lane. Lot 1 is 103.6 acres and includes 102.5 acres of open space and 1.5 acres of unencumbered land. This is the Agricultural Zoning District. Specifically, the applicant is requesting to relocate the 1.05 acres of unencumbered land within the deed restricted open space. The applicant is requesting both preliminary and final subdivision approval for the amended open space plat. The applicant has submitted a letter uh, regarding the request that meets the rules of the Planning Commission. Uh, background information, phase four of the final subdivision approval was back in February of 2010. This application was submitted in April of this year and went through one stack review. Project history is the Planning Commission reviewed a phase four major subdivision to McKinney Forest back in early 2010 which involved the second phase of non-contiguous development to create two new cluster lots, uh, 17 and 18, in an area of unencumbered land on lot one. That unencumbered land and or the building pad is the 1.05 the 1 acres and is what we're here to relocate. Uh, the specific way they are doing this under the code is within cluster subdivisions only, the open space may be administratively reconfigured to accommodate changes for building pad sites, perk sites, and lot lines, but may not be used to create additional lots under section 18.1.12d. As this subdivision was approved by the Planning Commission, this otherwise administrative amendment must be approved by the Planning Commission. The previous approval of Phase 4 was the second phase of non-contiguous, as I mentioned, and therefore no further subdivision is permitted. Additionally, the applicant has provided two notes on Sheet 3 of the plat that reference and explain that there are no further lots that may be created. <coughs> The lot would be served by public well and septic. Uh, there are no areas of floodplains, streams, steep slopes, historical sites, or threatened endangered species found on the site. Approximate 125 acres of forest are conserved within the deed restricted open space via the previous subdivision approvals. Uh, applicant states that no impact will occur to any non-tidal wetlands. Uh, should any impact be necessary, the proper authority will be required by MDE. Under the 2000, I'm sorry, it's 10 comprehensive plan, not two. The proposed relocation of the uncumbered uh, area building patch not create any new lots within the existing ag cluster subdivision, but concentrates development on property already developed. And that is it. My only question is if the current building pad appears to show that there's a house in it. No, that's the proposed. The other way around. That's the proposed that's one. Yeah. The dots but we're just are showing where approximately. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. That's where we're showing where the approximate uh, house location is going to be within this the existing. This is so the, what you're proposing is north of the non wetland. That's, yes. that's correct. All right, I apologize. I made the same mistake. Just so you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make any sense to see, to go to lot 18 and ask about a shared access? Um, I mean, we could certainly do that. I, th I think Mr. Wiseman would prefer to have his own lane. He's not going to be impacting any wetlands. It's been looked at just um, actually last week. We had the wetlands re-looked at to make sure we weren't impacting. Right. And actually, he's already got an entrance in there. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Because it says proposed entrance may be relocated. Yeah, but he's already put an entrance in. Oh, okay.
Any questions for Holly? Thompson. Yeah, um, uh, Jeff Thompson on behalf of Thomas and uh, Maureen Weissman. Uh, one of the conditions I think that was placed on the original approval uh, there's Mr. Uh, Vitalis. I don't know if he's here or not, but uh, they're the owners of lot, two. of lot two. And one of the concerns he had was that the house not be located too close to him. So we went ahead and sent him a copy of this plat. I see he's here so he can speak for himself, but he emailed us back saying that they essentially don't have any problem with us relocating the, uh, the house. One of the reasons our client wants it, it's, it's, it's a nice area to put it one, so you understand it's all wooded. And he wanted to get a little further away from, you know, lot 18, you know, more positioned in the middle of the middle of the property because he owns a, a whole property. It didn't make any sense to position his house, you know, uh, like Mr. Vitalis, who didn't want it next to his house, he doesn't necessarily want it to be snuggled up to, to lot two, or lot 18, I'm sorry. And, um, and that's the whole reason for the request. We aren't changing anything you know, other than that. Mr. Vitalis speak for himself. Anything to add? No. Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak? <clears throat> All right. Close public comment. Do we need to do something to do a final, uh, a preliminary final at the same yeah, time? Yeah, you're supposed to mean? make some findings and then. Um, we're supposed to find something. I don't remember what it is, but going to walk through that. Know that they've done everything they need, and there, there's no uh, uh, no point other than uh, delay and the expenditure of additional time and money to um, put it off to another meeting. Mr. Chairman, I'll walk through those five. I think it's five conditions. One is that the such waiver is in the public interest, and I know in the past, citing from the Southeast Creek case, um, you stated that it was. Uh, but it saves the county from additional unnecessary re review and processing, and that's the way we feel. There's nothing else to be reviewed other than this move. Two, uh, stated special reasons ex exist for a departure from the, the policy of the commission. You know, same answer. We don't have anything else we need to do, and we're, it's such a minimal move, if you will. Three, those reasons do not involve to any degree any delay or in inaction by the person for whom the policy is waived, and we haven't done anything. Uh, we've essentially provided um, the staff with all, everything that they need. Uh, four, that the purpose of providing prior notice of the action to be taken at a regular meeting will not be unduly compromised. I think it's important that Mr. Vitalis is here and he chose not to speak. He was the only opponent really at the initial hearing, the, the original approval of the lot. And five, the Department of Planning and Zoning has certified that no further time is required to make any determination required by the Queen's County Zoning Ordinance, and I believe they've done that. Yep. Can I have that? Yes, sir. It's, 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 your your it's in our letter. It's in the okay. letter. It's in the, it's in the Let's have you a motion. A, you need a motion on to that. Do that. that first, and that requires a supermajority. So okay, everybody, you need five. So if you don't, so the motion do is to. You have to do a preliminary first. Then then. Right. Right. You have to you do a preliminary, preliminary first. first. Right. Then you make a motion that you consider final at the same meeting, which requires okay. a, a supermajority. And then if that passes, then you consider final. So there's a total of three motions. Got it. Okay. So we're first dealing with preliminary approval. Which is this. Yes, I think. Well, this, this is both. <laughs> this is not. This is not. Preliminary is just preliminary. Right. For the, for the move. Division approval. All right. So let's see That's if it. we can. That's the first one. All right. Let's start with that. Resolve that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Thomas and Maureen Wiseman for preliminary for preliminary and final amended no just for preliminary open space plat approval to relocate 1.05 acres of unencumbered area within the deed restricted open space along McKinney Lane and Doolin Clark Road west of the town of Centerville and as more particularly described in Department of Planning and Zoning file major subdivision 03 dash one three dash zero four dash zero 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 six and more particularly described in department of planning zone whoops i'm sorry and amended by amended hereby fines there's with, no findings necessary no for findings. preliminary just that you is approved and hereby grants preliminary yes. amended approval contingent upon the following conditions no we don't need that either period fine. period, period. Okay. second for that one second okay. any any discussion all right all in favor Aye. 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 Now, a motion as to whether or not you wish to now consider final subdivision at the same hearing as the preliminary, making the findings set forth. Sheree's got that one down. Okay. I saw her pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make a motion that we would grant final. Consider final. Consider. 
consider final subdivision approval at the same meeting. Consider final subdivision pr approval at the same meeting. Uh, and, and that contingent that's... upon the following conditions. No, no. I'm sorry. This is the first time we've ever done this with some of the new group. So there is either we have because the rules or we have the. the so, so these rules here. Because because so, there it is. The planning commission makes the following findings. Yeah, she has it. These five. These, okay. The planning commission makes the following. Allowing this, number one, allowing this project to receive preliminary and final subdivision approval in the same meeting is in the public interest as the project is ready to receive final approval and will save additional county review and processing time. Number two, departure from the policy is requested because we believe at the time of the Planning Commission meeting, the only outstanding issue will be final plat signatures and it would be illogical, it would be logical to approve the project once. And it's not that that's requested, it's that you find that to be the case. We find this to be the case. Right. Three, the project was first submitted to the Department of Planning and Zoning in the April 15, 2013 for the original submittal and review. The June 13th Planning Commission meeting was the first regularly scheduled meeting in the development review cycle after the April 15th submittal date. We find there has been no inaction on the part of the applicant. Four, the request for preliminary and final subdivision approval was made at the 25-day submittal of this project. There have been no substantial changes to the plats since the 25-day submittal. There will be no substantial changes to the plats after the submittal to the Department of Planning and Zoning for distribution to the Planning Commission. The public has had adequate time prior to the Planning Commission meeting to review this project. And five, the Department of Planning and Zoning has deemed the project complete, subject to any minor conditions, and they are recommending preliminary and final subdivision approval. Is there a second? Two. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that motion carries. So now we are looking for a motion for final approval. You got that one. I got that one. Same one you did before, but like now the condition. Final. Right. Condition. Okay. All right. Resolved that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Thomas and Maureen Wiseman for final amended open space plat approval to relocate 1.05 acres of unencumbered area within deed restricted open space along McKenney Lane and Doolin Clark Road west of the town of Centerville. And as more particularly described in Department of Planning and Zoning file, Major Subdivision 03-13-04-0006-2013. Amended hereby fines. Within cluster subdivisions only, the, the open space may be administratively reconfigured to accommodate changes for building pad sites, perk sites, and lot lines, but may not be used to create additional lots, 18, 1-12.2.d, as the subdivision was approved by the Planning Commission. This otherwise administrative amendment must be approved by the Planning Commission and hereby grants final amended approval contingent upon the following conditions. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Public Works be reviewed and approved. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the Department of Planning and Zoning be reviewed and approved. The amended deed of open space easement is executed and submitted for county commission approval. Any required bonds, sureties, reviews, and inspection fees must be submitted to the Department of Public Works and the Department of Planning and Zoning as appropriate, and all required signatures must be attained. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. That procedure needs to come up much more often when we're actually we're considering subdivision approvals. So. <laughs> That's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Should get better at that. Yeah. Uh, we'll take this next one, get it over with. Just tell sure. Is Joe the grinder? Tell us what to read, Molly, next time. Joe, what is it? I don't know. We'll okay. Joe the grinder. All right. Here. <laughs> you don't know what a grinder is? <laughs> For coffee, I assume. It's a sub. <laughs> it's a sub. It's a sub. Submarine sandwich. Yeah. Oh, there you go. He's not from around here. No, you got that right. <laughs> Plain subs. Show the ground. All right, Holly, you're up. <laughs> okay, this is the Dunkin' Donuts. Kent Island, Minor Site Plan 0413040001C for Critical Area. 
The property is located at tax map 57, parcel 103. The parcel is located at 1132 Shopping Center Road, north of 5301, adjacent to the Kent Island Shopping Center and south of Maryland Route 18 in Chester. The parcel size is approximately 1.06 acres. The zoning is town center and it is in the critical area IDA intensely developed area. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the applicant is requesting to replace an existing 3,756 square foot restaurant with a new 3,500 square foot restaurant with a drive through and they're requesting minor site plan approval today. Uh, and as you uh, probably are aware, we've done this a few times before, minor site plans that are along the 5301 corridor are coming before you uh, for approvals and also for the review of the uh, adherence to the design standards and guidelines. This project was submitted back in April of this year and we sent them back comments uh, a couple of weeks later. And before that, they did address the APFO uh, ordinance. The site, if you're not familiar with it, uh, I'm, you, I'm sure you must be, it's the existing Pizza Hut, and that is along Shopping Center Road, which is parallel to 5301. It acts as a, the road to the Shopping Center, also it's a on and off exit ramp. The Town Center Zoning District percent, prevent, sorry, permits 40% floor area, and the subject property would be able to have up to 18, 1,556 square feet. Uh, the existing square footage will be demolished, and as I said, uh, there'll be a 3,500 square foot built, uh, building that will be built, so that would only be about 7.5 FAR. The impervious surface area permitted is 80%. The property would permit up to uh, 37,111 uh, square feet. Uh, there are approximately 39,630 square feet of existing impervious, which is not conforming and over what's permitted. During the redevelopment, the property would come into conformance uh, with the proposed 30,254 square feet, so that would be about 65 percent impervious area. The property would be served by existing public sewer and a private well. The existing structure to be demolished is not a historic structure. The maximum building height is 45 feet. The proposed structure is to be a maximum of 21 and a half feet. Lighting on site would consist of the same fixtures that currently exist that would be relocated with the redevelopment, as well as new lighting uh, for signage in the proposed structure. A uh, lighting st uh, study was submitted and reviewed. Proposed signage and calculations have been provided on the plan and also reviewed. The parking that is required for a fast food restaurant per the county code would necessitate 78 parking spaces. The code doesn't consider fast food restaurants with drive throughs uh, The applicant has submitted a parking study that was conducted over a two-week time frame, during which the number of cars in the parking lot were 10 and the, uh, I'm sorry, the parking lot were 11 and 10 of the drive through Per the TC code under section 18.128.D.1, the applicant is requesting that the Planning Commission modify the parking requirement to the 27 spaces that are proposed. The stormwater management will be provided on-site via ESD practices and is fully described on sheet 5 of 9. The site also meets the 10 percent reduction as mandated by the critical area. And, uh, regarding environmental details, the subject property does not have any area in the 100-year floodplain, has no hydric soils, no steep slopes, no streams, no wetlands, and no habitat or endangered species. This property is entirely within the IDA, and all the areas not covered with impervious must be in vegetation. Therefore, the landscape surface area will be 16,135 square feet. Uh, the landscape area required for TC is 20 percent. They'd be providing almost 35 percent. There are no forests or woodlands on the property. Uh, the applicant must simply comply with the IDA vegetation requirement. All of the parking lot, street buffer, and on-site landscaping have been provided and as shown on sheet 6 of 9. Prior to the site plan being submitted, the applicant uh, submitted a request for an exemption from the APFO based on the fact that uh, they already exist. The request applied a detailed review of the peak hour trips from the existing restaurant 
to be demolished as well as the space that will come available when the new restaurant and drive through is built. The existing Dunkin' Donuts that's in the shopping center uh, area is 3,000 square feet and that would become available lease area space in that shopping center. And the existing Pizza Hut of course would be demolished and the proposed Dunkin' Donuts would be the 3,500 square feet. The rev review revealed that there would be a reduction in AM peak trips and a slight increase in PM peak trips. However, the net increase was far less than the 25 peak hour trip that would have required a full APFO study. The State Highway Administration raised a concern regarding location of the relocated access points along Shopping Center Road uh, and P Department of Public Works concurred with the concern and both agency requested further information. The applicant did supply an additional study, an access study, which looked at the turning movements and possible queuing issues from 5301 onto Shopping Center Road and the adjacent bank access points. And essentially that is this access point right here off of 50 and these two points here. And the bank is over here. And that was the concern. Uh, and the, based upon further review with that access study, the agencies determined that they were satisfied with the additional information and that the existing intersections were adequate. Under the town center design standards and guidelines, the applicant has submitted a narrative, uh, both from their engineer and architect, that seeks to address the guidelines and standards that are outlined in the code under 18.128.D5 and the TCUC design standards handbook. Uh, I have attached those to the staff report. The applicant has already uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, has also submitted color architectural elevations that we have reviewed and that you will be reviewing today. Under the 2010 comprehensive plan, the property is located on map LU5 and it's mixed use. LU6, it's in a county planning and priority funding area. Map LU7B, it's commercial and mixed use. Map ESA-1, it's in critical area IDA. Map ESA-6, it's uh, got S-1 current service area for sewer. Map DBT-1, economic development tourism, it is in Chester. Under the 2007 Chester Stevensville Community Plan, Map 2-4, it's Chester existing land use, it's commercial. And Map 5-1 planning area, it's the 2005 planning area. That is it for the report. Do you have any questions? I do. Okay. Um, the town center design guidelines, do yes. the architectural guidelines apply? I, I note that the architect's write-up um, is here, but you all don't have any comments on whether you think it meets the guidelines. Does it not have to meet the guidelines because it's a replacement, or does it have to meet them? It would need to meet any guidelines and standards because it's technically new development. Does staff believe that, that, that this building as designed does? We had discussions uh, about some of the colors. There was a lot of bright colors the first go around, and we asked them to tone that down. And I don't really feel comfortable saying staff has one viewpoint or not. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we bring it to you. Okay. We didn't have any problems with it further, I should say. So we felt that at this point it could move forward. Okay. All set? Yes, sir. Thank you. Joe Stevens, um, Centerville, on behalf of uh, the applicant. Um, and we will uh, go over the architecture. I, I, the staff and the uh, architect um, and the applicant did meet um, uh, reviewing um, those plans, and I, I believe that they incorporated any comments that came from staff. Um, so we were comfortable moving forward at this point, recognizing that whenever we bring something to you um, in the um, uh, subject of the design guidelines, that you know the, the planning commission often has comments and 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 um, and expresses their comments. So I know you've had a long morning, so we'll kind of cut a little bit to the chase here. I do have I do have. Um, 
Perry Artwell, who is the engineer. And I'm just going to ask him to talk about the stormwater and the uh, and uh, what was been done for sewer and water improvements. Then I have the landscape architect and the architect, um, and then also uh, the owner. If you have some questions of the owner, it's uh, Todd Lelumier. He's right behind me here. He owns the Dunkin' Donuts right now. That's on Kent Island. That's going to move to this location, the one that's in the shopping center. Uh, he also owns a few Dunkin' Donuts over on the western shore. So, um, Perry, can you give an overview of the stormwater? Yes. I'm Perry Otwell from McCrone. Uh, we basically, as you know, reduced the site impervious area. Uh, we're doing a combination of water quality swales and bio uh, retention to treat stormwater. Uh, the existing site had no stormwater and very little imper impervious area. We're increasing the vegetated area about four times the size. So it's greatly increasing the stormwater management. Uh, it's in the critical area IDA district. We're required a 10% pollutant reduction. Uh, we're re achieving a 27% pollutant reduction, so we're far exceeding the critical area requirements. Uh, Roby Hurley of the critical area has reviewed it and had no comments with our design. Uh, we're doing the landscaping around it to uh, shade the parking area to re reduce the water temperatures coming off the parking lot so it would be a much cooler site. Uh, there were really no shade trees along there so the parking lot was pretty much wide open. Uh, the sewer system, there's a, a shared <coughs> manhole between Pizza Hut and uh, Hardy's next door. Uh, the manhole's old, uh, outdated. Uh, there's a belly in the sewer that leads from the manhole to the vacuum pit, so there were constant problems with backing up of sewer uh, and sometimes even flowing out of the manhole, uh, which would then have to be routed. The owner's going to be replacing that manhole, replacing the sewer line, and updating the valve pit to the new current valve pits, which would be a better, more efficient unit. Uh, but the sewer system will be entirely replaced, so We'll have a, a watertight manhole, which won't allow any infiltration into the county system. Uh, so it would be a great improvement to what's there. And that's pretty much it site-wise. Do have any questions from a ESD and New Zealand water rights standpoint? Okay. Vernon, do you want to go over the sure. Vernon, the architecture? Sure. Do you want to access the computer? Or yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. I'm Vernon Husted from Landscape Ar Husted Landscape Architecture. Um, the planting design, we really had a bare slate. There's very little in the way of vegetation out at the site. Um, but the planting design meets the on-site landscape requirements, the parking lot, and the, sh and the street um, right-of-way requirements. Um, I will say that there are some sycamores along Shopping Center Drive, so we, to complement that, we use some London plane trees throughout the site, especially along the front, to sort of supplement that. Um, we've used a variety of tree shrubs, uh, perennials, to add some seasonal color throughout the year, as well as um, accentuate entrances for vehicular access as well as pedestrian access into the building and also to provide a foundation planting around the building itself. Um, we do have a dumpster in the rear and we've, in addition to the board and board fence that screens the dumpster, we've also <coughs> provided some plant material there to sort of help massage that. Um, I do have a rendering. I have yeah. to do that to them. Okay. Is it one or two? Okay. I'll we'll keep one and we'll put it up on the board if okay. you want an extra one. Thank you. I have a rendering as well as some aerial photographs showing the site as well as some of the adjacent buildings and the overall shopping center in case there's any questions. Um, one other thing Joe wanted me to mention was there is a unspoken sh to me, unspoken sharing of some of the parking um, with the Hardys and the current Pizza Hut. And so um, one of the ideas that uh, the civil engineer had come up with is to sort of maintain that so that, you know, at peak times, the Hardy's probably uses some of the parking on the Pizza Hut side and vice versa, I would think, so we've maintained that. Um, we do have a fair amount of shade trees in the parking area um, to provide shade and help cool water for the storm management. 
What, what's there for landscaping now? There's really nothing. There's a, a few oversized shoes at the front, but other than that, there really is nothing else on the site. And it's mostly asphalt, which I think shows up in some of the aerial photos. Okay. Go through the photos? Or? Yep. So this first one is just some pictures of the site uh, and, and mostly the parking that's there. This one is an aerial photo with an approximate location of the property line. In this case, the property line goes across the shopping center road and, and touches the right of way for 301, but we sort of consider this the front. Uh, this regional can map you, was just... Uh, can you hold that up again so I can see where you consider the front? The shopping center road is down here. Yep, great, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, this one's a little bit larger, just showing the bank site adjacent to it, as well as the hard easel on the other side. And then the last one is more of the shopping center. And I don't believe that the Pizza Hut is part of the shopping center, but just wanted to give you that kind of reference point. It's not. It's a separate lot. Can you show that one again? Sure. I'm trying to keep up with the picture. Okay, sorry. I don't think I have that one. Oh, yeah, we do. Okay. okay. And the Dunkin' Donuts now is at this end of the shopping center and is moving over to here. So this might not be the question for you, but I'm having a tough time finding the front of this building and the side of this building based on this picture. Let me bring, let okay. me bring up Jeff, if I can. Uh, Jeff May. May, or, and he can describe the dimensions. Because it's a little confusing when you look at that because it shows a front view, which is actually from the side. That's exactly right. But they called it the front because of the way cars are coming in and the view that you get. I think we have those. All right. Better upside down. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Actually, that's how the contractor will probably try and do it first. So the front, if you will, that face um, faces or is. Uh, parallel to Shopping Center Road is actually what's called side elevation in the upper right hand corner. So up in the right there, that, that is the face, the shorter face uh, with the monolith feature and the glazing that'll be upper parallel, right upper right hand corner, that will be parallel to Shopping Center Drive. With the door. Well, the front labeled at the bottom, the drawing at the bottom, which is the front, is actually uh, parallel to the Hardys and faces the Hardys and is the face that is on the parking. So as people enter, um, and that's where the entry doors will be located into the space. As I understand it, though, you can't tell. There's some articulation in that facade. Yes, there is. And actually, I brought some, um, we just did a couple. These are some of the 3D models. And this is kind of the view. I'll put, I'll put, I don't want to put under there if you want of that front, that corner, which encom encompasses the two, two entries or two faces that we're talking about there. So, so this, this is looking north then. That is uh, south. south. That, as That's if you're south. entering, yes, yeah, so you're as you're heading on shopping center and turning into the building. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So this doesn't really depict the relief that's in the building. So you're behind the building there. No, this is out if you're on Shopping Center Road, making the right into the shopping into the center from. Shopping Center Road is Route 50, right? It's parallel to Route 50. So it's for all intents and purposes. It, it, route 50. If you were traveling west on Route 50, this and look to your right, this is the view you would see of the and building. And so Hardy's on the top pictures is to my right. Correct. And the drive-through for this is on the left-hand side of the building. On the back side, you wouldn't. So your drive-through is by the bank. Correct. Sorry. Does uh, um, Dunkin' Donuts have a um, what do they call it? Uh, not a specimen building, but a, a prototype building. Pardon? Prototype or standard prototype, building? Yes. They do. Um, is it? It is not. Um, <laughs> It is, uh, it's actually modified both in layout, shape, and uh, in exterior treatment. There are some elements here, the monolith features. Um, the mon you're talking about the... Uh, the two, the two towers, if you will, right. yeah. Um, are, are these awnings? They are awnings. So, 
we used to have a planning commission me member. Her name was Mary Kerr. And she always did such a great job with making sure we had um, the terminology was Eastern Shore vernacular. Was, was that is that correct? Um, and um, and I thought you know she she was really the monitor of that. Um, and obviously she's not here now. So it's I, pursuant to the design standards in this zoning district. Thanks for adding that. And it seemed like there was some sloped roofs that were a part of that. It seemed like some colors were a part of that, and they are. Um, your, your window with the spilled coffee, that, that seems a little, um, doesn't seem like it would go with what we're trying to create for a, uh, a throughway on Route 50. So I'm not, I, I don't like your building. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to say that in a nice way, um, but that's, and I, I think we should try to do something better with that. It's my opinion. I'm only one member of the Planning Commission. Um, but I think we should try to, to make it look like it would fit in of what we're trying to create in this area. And the Safeway is often used as an example um, of what we're trying to create. And I'm not seeing that here. Now, I might be all wet and wrong, but I don't feel like I am. But I think the challenge, especially in comparison to Safeway, is that they have 50,000 square feet, right. five, you know, 400 feet of frontage. We're talking about 3,500 square feet, of which there are 40 feet of visible presentation. Um, and to I, get multiple gables going and all that, it's just, it just right. can't happen in, in I, 40 and I, feet. I, and I commend you uh, for, for on the project because you're improving a lot of things. You're improving a, a lot of things uh, environmentally. Uh, but it seems like, I'm not an architect, but it seems like we could improve this somehow. And I wish. Aesthetically. Yeah. It's ugly. <laughs> so, d does any other planning commission have thoughts on? Um, well, I, I personally am not a big proponent of the government telling private property owners what their building should look like, but the rules were there. And you got to follow the rules. And if, if you can explain to me how how this building fits in with the architectural guidelines, standards, I, I'm, standards I, I'm, I'm certainly open to hearing that. But what I see on, on uh, the one side elevation, and I, I guess that's the back of the building, is just a bunch of blocks to make it not have one flat thing. But when you look at that building, it's just one flat boring piece now if that's the back it's the back i understand that there is one the one side on the back sure and then the other three i mean but all sides your, have your change front, in planes your front elevation which is the, the bottom one on this page is actually the right side of the building that yes. would be facing hardy's correct um i mean is there a reason that you have to have a three quarters of the building be just siding on on that it without any kind of uh anything well from a practical standpoint, that is the kitchen production facility so there's no public back there it's not retail that's not seating or anything back there and there will be landscaping based on this correct correct that so whole is all landscaped across y'all should there's, have done an overlay because this, this is ugly there's a the sidewalk is out on the parking and then there's a landscape bed there um, certainly there could be additional uh, windows that would be blacked out sort of false windows if we wanted to add some additional breaking that up. Could your um, monoliths have maybe had like a gable roof on them or something that would seem well, to be more in character? Well, again, the, they... it, the, the challenge is that this, the distance and the amount of space and, and then the angles and the kind of false, almost like you're creating this triangular peak that's just going to be very thin and very tall and narrow. I, you know, so. I'm, again, I'm not an architect, but I think we've, we've worked with some people in this area that have created a really nice looking building that have complied to these standards. And certainly if you have a really steep roof, it's going to look like a peak, but if you have a slower sloping roof, it, it wouldn't quite look like a peak. And um, that's coming in from- In regards a, to a mansard, or some form of a mansard, that is allowed under the design guidelines as well, standards, guidelines. They've got their standards until you read through them and then some of them say, you know, you may do this or you shall, or you right. shall right. pick one of these elements and so on and so forth. Can you talk about the roof for a little bit? Because, I mean, it, it, even as we look at doing some revisions to this, which it looks like that's what you're going to be doing, um, 
the, the roof issue, because this is a cooking facility, is for, for their regional, uh, has a great deal of equipment on it. I, I, on, a, on a building this size, and from what I've been told both from the owner and from the architect, uh, doing a peaked roof on it is going to be something that's going to be very, very difficult, if not. It would have been helpful then uh, for the elevations to show the equipment on the top. I assume it's all going to be sticking up. Well, no, it's all screened, and that's what there's elements that's the, the high roof, the screen, the parapets, and screening to screen all the rooftop equipment. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll accept. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, that was actually specifically done to screen that. In a normal prototype, yeah, you would see rooftop units, exhaust fans, and such. Uh, we're screening all that. Jeff, can you go through some, some thoughts you have that may, uh, one, as to how you came up with some of the elements that are on here, but also in terms of some things you might be able to do to address some of the Planning Commission's concerns? That way we're not just kind of coming well, back and Yeah, I mean, that. again, a lot of things we looked at as far as uh, in the, the town center guidelines was, um, you know, the uh, four sides and in incorporating plane changes and color changes and material. Um, breaking up. There's no long, there's no side that's longer than 100 feet, which it talks about in the design guidelines. Um, there's changes in plain color and materials uh, throughout uh, throughout the elevations. Uh, we identified the entrances um, with the tower features, uh, along with the uh, use of the horizontal uh, canopy awning type of setup, um, and then incorporated the glass. Um, with the awnings, uh, use the awnings throughout uh, up in the retail area. Um, all the materials are all exterior commercial grade. Uh, we're using hardy plank uh, with a variation of colors. I have the colors here that are all earth tone, uh, earth tone palette. We can put that under the monitor or pass that around. Um, Could you, on your rendering up there, oh, your, your, um, the one that shows the awnings. I mean, the problem is that doesn't really, to me, look anything like this. This looks like Disney World because this all looks flat. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not connecting the dots between where these awnings are on this building based on what you're labeling these elevations. I see this orange thing going around there. What, what the heck is that? That's just a uh, horizontal bump out change in plane in the building. And actually, the we are not going to have the <coughs> vertical piece that's shown on the color drawing. Okay, so that so that so that's the, out now. So so this piece coming up here is out. Is not here, and this is actually an awning. No, that's just that's just a bump in the architecture in the building with an orange finish on that, and that wraps uh, horizontally from the one tower to the other. And that's below the that there are on the left of your elevation. Below that are awnings. Okay, so there are awnings below yes. that. Where, where, they, where the stone appears on your... This is an awning here. Th so this is a horizontal element that's up high, and then this is an awning that's mounted no, I, back on this place. Not, this is let, me, let me just jump in here. That I got. Yeah. What I don't get is where, where that is on this. So, so what's facing the highway on your rendering? On the, on the one that we can understand, which is the one on top, where is the highway? The big patio in front. This, this yeah. is parallel to Route 50 right here. Okay, and, and the right side is then facing Hardy's. Hardy's, Correct. yeah. And the drive-through enters on this side and comes out by the bank? Yeah. They yes, it goes around the building. here, bill. around the back, and then the pickup window is on the back side facing the bank. So I find the orange, um, is that what you're calling it? It's the Dunkin' Donuts orange? Yeah. Is a little strong. And... I would like to talk about your signs for a minute. Okay. Uh, the signs on the building as well as the sign that was on the, the in, in the plat that's 30 foot high. Yeah, I didn't see I'm wondering if we could make those more subtle in some way. I mean, certainly you want to brand your building. I love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I like to, to, you know, if I'm driving down the highway, I like to be able to see them. But we're also trying to make something that blends in and is not, you know, is not a beacon on the side of the road crying out, here I am. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. At, at the same time, trying to maintain some brand identity and, I mean, purpose of signage, not necessarily a beacon, but it's identifier to let it, people it know. It seemed so. like we had a, a gas station. Was it the Shell, Shell Shell gas station where they had a color that they wanted, but they, they offered to make it a less it strong a, color? It was a Shell yellow that um, was... They made it white. 
white and red, I think, or yeah, something, it, with the yellow one away. So, you know, there, there's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, How about the awnings? What color are they going to be? Uh, they're, they're brown. Board. They're on the board. Okay. Are they polka dotted? No, there's some uh, written graphics at that, so, but, but, well, but that's just that little piece of that. But they're, they're like a cloth material. It is. Yes. Yeah, and so over time that will need to be replaced compared to the, the stone or whatever you have going on there. But that's the EF, that's the EFIS finish that's on just part of the building. But yeah, the, it's a it's a Sumbrella product that's a, kind of a standard awning product. When this was shown to me the other day by Joe Stevens, um, Part of Joe, why this faux EFIS product is seems to be preferred when you have faux brick products that you could use. And for example, right behind you, you have the old Tidewater Bank, which is now Bank of America, which is a brick building. Well, now this is a stone base with the hardy plank. This is a plank. You just mentioned an EFIS product. Uh, that's what's on the board, but that's the only place that is is next to the drive through window. Okay, well then, fine. The faux stone. Is seems to, for some reason, to be preferred when no such thing exists around here, and you're right next to a st uh, brick bank. Uh, Would it make any sense at all? And I know they make fake, fake brick. Well, again, this isn't even fake. This is real stone. This is a stone veneer product, so it's not fake. Maybe not the right word. Okay. But, um, uh, well, the stone was chosen to be more compatible with the earth tone and the browns and the hardy plank, as opposed, it's a little bit more subtle and a little bit more compatible. Um, aren't bricks brown? Uh, brick is a more, it's a more standardized fix, and, and you can get it in some brown colors, and, uh, but again, the shape and the texture here was trying to go with the earth tones and the, and the plank. I, I, just um, brick, I mean, brick, brick is fine too. I think it'll stand out a little, it, it'll clash a little more okay. in my mind with, with the that's earth right. tones. I just, because whenever we see these, it's always the, the, the stone that's proposed when you have to go 100 miles to find a stone that you could use. <laughs> so from my standpoint, some of the things I would like to see different um, I would like to see the orange be toned down in some way. Um, I would like to see your signage be toned down in some way, as well as the pedestal sign that's 30 feet in the air. Okay. Um, I would like to see some sort of a, a sloped roof uh, incorporated somehow into it, other than the, these canvas awnings that are going to fade in about five years. And, um, and I think that's all that I really have. Aesthetically, I would agree with all of that. And it would have been nice to see the landscaping on top of this. Um, and I have larger concerns about the signage on the pole. Is there not going to be anything on the back road with regard to signage? Mm -mm. No, the back's quite a way. It's a way, 18. So you're not right. You're not going to do anything there. Mm -mm. No, no, no signage on anything. I, I mean, the, the pylon sign is within, what we're showing is within the signage regulation. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I do have to say, I frequent this Dunkin' Donuts probably daily. <laughs> Tends to be a gathering place. It's, it's horrible where it is. However, I think that, and it would be nice to hear from the first responders, you, we have big trucks that try and come in there in front of Acme, which is an eyesore in my humble opinion right now. Um, and it can take some maneuvering. And then the other one is down at the end by the little car sales and the... Um, tire shop. So I, if that's going to be the only in and out, and we do have those big trucks now, I mean, was all that taken into consideration? There's not going to be any way to enter except the existing way now by the old, well, what is soon to be maybe the old Dunkin' Donuts from the back side? Are well, you familiar? You say back side, you mean Route 18? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, route, if you, the, the road, there's a real road that goes down between the car salesman and right. the drive through liquor store, mm -hmm. car salesman, right. tire, and then the bank. That's right. And then that is open. the Pizza Hut and Hardee's and Acme. Mm -hmm. So there's that way to come from the back, but there's nothing on the parking lot until you get all the way over to the Dunkin' Donuts now, which is an anchor in the bank. Mm -hmm. And is that going to remain the same? So there's really not going to be an entrance other than what is there now. That's that's correct. The shopping uh -huh. center and what is serving the the restaurant now. That's correct. And and have you obviously frequent your own establishment? I would assume. 
sometimes driving there is hard because of the big trucks that are coming and then they park right there in front of Hardee's. Yeah. And it, it's an interesting maneuver in the morning and we're all stupid without our coffee and when I say we, I mean me. So in the morning it does sometimes create a problem, I think. But there is going to be the cross access. You can't enter from the from the parking lot backside, correct? Yeah. There's we're not access curbing in the that. back that comes from um, the current Dunkin' Donuts where it is, right? Yeah, or yeah. the Acme area. Oh, there, from the Acme parking lot, there's right. a little bit, there's access in the back corner. To this lot. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. You can come across oh, yeah. Acme and go straight into here where Dunkin' Donuts is going to be. Right. But the site was reviewed right by here. DPW, the state highways, uh, the fire marshal, and there were no concerns with regard to fire safety. And one of the problems is, is that this piece of property uh -huh. is not owned by the same people as the shopping center. All right, I'm understanding that right. quite, quite well. <laughs> right. So that it's not as if they, the owner of this property Can do anything. could use shopping center property to create an, <laughs> another access without the shopping center's consent to create they, another access on a But they have it on the site plan. Yeah, so on the site plan yeah. that you're accessing that. I think mm -hmm. what Chris means is on to 18 from 18. the area that the, the, right. the, right. the um, there is only uh, going McClendon's. to remain one entry into the shopping center and it's down by the That's current correct. that Dunkin does not Donuts. change at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you're expecting traffic then to come down the little road where the drive through liquor store is and that so way. You're so you're, act, you're or accessing off 18 is what you're saying. Is there not going to be any yeah. other than what just, is there now? Just what exists. Okay. I mean, that is sometimes problematic because big do trucks do park in front of the Hardee's. So when you're exiting 50, most people actually, I think, would exit the first exit so that you're turning right in front of Acme and then the trucks are right there on your left versus the second one, which a lot of people don't even know about. So I think that that's a, a concern of yours. I guess ours. I would think that a major, I mean, like Perry said, it had been reviewed by all the agencies. Nobody raised that concern. And I would think that a great deal of the traffic that comes there is going to, that's, that's moving from east to west, is going to get off the highway where I get off now to go to Dunkin' Donuts. But only I, you know, swing back around and kind of swerve into the where it is right now. And now they'll come off of that, take a left instead right. of a right, and move that way. Um, I don't know to what extent there's going to be a great deal of traffic coming from the entrance in front of the bank to go, you know, to go to Dunkin' Donuts, but they, they may well, very it's problematic well be. for me because I come from the back road. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon can't get line. to the Soon Dunkin' Donuts. I go there every day. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm very excited about this because sometimes parking, uh, not parking, but waiting in the drive-thru is horrific. Well, I'm not going to lie, but I... I just am concerned that the, where it's located, it's not going to be set back any further than Pizza Hut, is it? I mean, the is footprint's it? pretty much going to be the same. I, it's actually, essentially going to be the same, but just slid over to the over Pizza Hut. The middle of the property line. Line. Right. Yeah. Slid yeah. over towards the bank? No, towards, towards the heart. It's towards because the we have our drive through lane and our escape lane. There's 20 feet of drive through That's right there. on the property. Yeah, it's right, right, on, right the property. on the property line. If I could ask you about the brick con uh, discussion, because I want to, is, is, is that's going on. And from what I understand, I'll, I'll ask Jeff again, I mean, there's not an appreciable difference between no, the two, you know, cost-wise no, as well. No, we can certainly put brick there. I mean, so, uh, so we'd want to hear what, what the, the uh, planning commission the starts topic, To me, it's not brick, and I kind of agree with you that the stone will look more modern, but the, the issue is you're right next to a very colonial bank, and you got a very modern building. And if you could make this modern building look a little less modern and a little more traditional, then it would fit in better. Granted, Parties is not a colonial building. Nor the whole means. shopping center, frankly. No, that's yeah. true. <laughs> here's, what's going, here's what's likely. I'm sorry, Barry, but at some point, Hardee's, like McDonald's, is going to come in and want to tear down that old 30-year-old building and build something else. So is the bank. Pardon? So is the bank. Or the bank. Yeah, and you'll get like the First National Bank at the other end, which is very much more. That was before we had uh, design standards. Oh, well, um, okay. Uh, but Hardee's is not going to be able to build the thing it has there now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have to build something that meets these guidelines. Well, and this designer proposal wasn't playing down to the existing around it. I so. understand that. And Acme, whatever it turns into, mm -hmm. is going to have to be redesigned right. architecturally. Absolutely. So. And I, so 
we should not spring from the thought process that because what's around us is crap, we could design no, down right. to it, as no, you no, said. No, no, no. Well, that was not my point. My point was what's right next to it, the closest building to it, is a very right. colonial building that is more in line with our design guidelines than, than this. Sure. I don't care what the back of this building looks like. There's nobody to look at it who's not already got their coffee or ordered it. <laughs> so it can be whatever you want. It could be one flat thing, as far as I'm concerned, be perfectly fine. The front, which is this top one, yep. I think, yep. facing 50. I think that you could do something with that monument in the front and the blank wall on the left of that mm -hmm. to incorporate some degree of, of a shingled, sloped roof that would be able to still hide the stuff behind there like, uh, like we made the medical center do um, on their approval. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I understand you're Dunkin' Donuts. You want to look like Dunkin' Donuts. You want people to drive down the road and say they're Dunkin' Donuts because they see it. We just want you to come a little farther in the direction of what the guidelines here are, which we want to look like the Eastern Shore Dunkin' Donuts, not like New York City's Dunkin' Donuts. So like a, I, and I love prefacing it like, like Luke does. I'm not an architect. <laughs> and, uh, but something to the form of a uh, sloped mansard in the front. Mm -hmm. I mean, On three that, sides, maybe? I don't know about just that. throwing that out for you itself. a little bit, I mean, but yeah, I, I, I understand. But you can make it look yeah. like it's got a roof, right? That doesn't. And it, mm -hmm. yes, you're right. It's sort of like a mansard roof, but mansard roofs look like forty year old. Others. I was going to say that's right. 1970. Yeah. Duncan right. had a, a version yeah. called the oak, but, and but back I think in the you 70s, could make it look what they had. <laughs> like was, we you know, you don't have the space. Now. I understand you don't have the space. It's safe. We had to make it look like a little village. Right. It could look like a Munchkin village, um, <laughs> which might be okay for you, but um, I, I, I think you could do something with that to make it look a little more Eastern Shore like and still get what you want out of it. Aaron correctly points out that Chick-fil-A was approved with the application of the design standards. And that's a flat roof with some flat roof. parapets. Yeah. Take a look at it. Yeah, they, I took pictures of it. I mean, they were kicking and screaming. Yeah. It's pretty rectangular, too, though. They don't have a lot of change in plane or articulation, that's for sure. That. Right. Right. I mean, there's been in the variations. I mean, there's the, the gas station right next to the Cracker Barrel, and that has some of the stone and also some of the brick. So there, there are different variations and it's been, it's been quite a it's bit. not going to be perfect. Right. Trying to do something. And, I, and there has been a theme, so you understand, about this, what is perceived to be garish um, colors. Mm -hmm. Right or wrong, whether you perceive them to be garish or not, um, there's been an effort to try and tone down those sorts of um, uh. right, and, and again, I think the the majority of the palette, a lot of earth tones and everything. So, um, from a go ahead, I'm just sorry. on that, um, for example, there wouldn't be sheet? a sheets. The sheets would not show up on Ken Island mm -hmm. like it does show up right. everywhere else. Purple, I mean, orange and yellow. To me, yellow, if, the, it is. if the awnings were your color and the building wasn't, I, that would be more tolerable. Um, I don't know whether it would be everybody else, but that would seem more appropriate. Introduce the orange in the in the awnings. Yeah. I, okay. I I would find that less garish, but once again, I mean, I, I I just think you need to come a little more in a direction of making this look like the Eastern Shore, um, because that's what the guidelines ask for. From a from a procedural standpoint, and uh, there, I don't believe there's any, except for the discussion, which I'm not sure if we're, if there's still concern about the tractor trailer aspect or the sort of singular access. But I don't didn't hear any other comments, you know, stormwater, traffic, any of those other things. It's landscaping, but you'd like to see the landscaping incorporated into the into the perspective, into the architectural perspective, so you can see how that that all works together. Um, um, uh, the tone down of the orange, perhaps, and just the awnings. Um, the um, uh, something done with the with at least two to three of the sides, three of the sides, in terms of some sloping of the roofs. Right. I'm just trying to recap. Right. I, I, I'm, the one I'm facing not sure that, center that it needs to be three of them. You may shopping have trouble with the narrowness of the building making that work, but okay. if I think if you make the front of that building 
look more Eastern Shore, you might be able to get away with the rest of it not being objectionable. And it might be easier to do with with just that. Right. Okay. Incorporating the brick into instead of the instead of the uh, stone veneer product. Uh, yeah, it's a suggestion. That's all. It's I. I like you just got to make it look Eastern Shore. Whether huh, that's, sorry. I like the stone. Yeah. Whether it's stone or brick is not as important as having it not look like a modern city building and have it look a little bit more like a something that you would find in the country. So I, I, we, I know that's not very good mm -hmm. guidance, but it's the best we can give you. Um, and I think you got. I think yeah. you understand what we're, what we're looking for, mm -hmm. and that's what you do. Signage too. We talked about the signs. Look at that. Look at the signage. I yeah. believe everything was designed the within on the signs. I mean, because the square footage and everything I, is compliant, right. or it is, or it isn't. Obviously, but you're you're talking about the colors. Okay. Colors. So well, the graphics in the windows. You were worried. Right, about. and the graphics in the windows seem. Uh, yeah. Obnoxious. Okay. Yeah. We we had a we had a um, presentation by one of our staff. Um, couple years ago and it talked it showed this McDonald's uh, in Freeport Maine and it didn't even look like a McDonald's and I often think about that example whenever we're looking at these buildings no, so right. uh, you know just uh, my client and I were talking about that that's why we're, why we're the talking about sign it the on the pole is it going to be illuminated yes Is this, um, with these comments, is this something that, that, that the Planning Commission would be acceptable to us working out with staff, or is it something that the Planning Commission is going to want to see us come back I would with? like to see you come back. Agreed. I, I think that there, there are no other issues that I'm hearing from us, so I don't think it will be anything that you need to bring the whole team out for. So we'll just bring um, the architect. Could, uh, here's a suggestion. I don't know if this helps or not. You could say we grant site plan approval if you're inclined to do that. I don't know if that gets them moving on bonding or financing, uh, but they're not to move forward with construction or something, which they're probably not going to do in 30 days. Well, that's what I'm thinking. That would be very helpful to us, quite frankly. And then we come back while we're working on that, because we can be doing our bonding. We can get, you know, we can get our grading plan in, all that kind of stuff, but we won't start construction of the building until you guys have approved the, uh, the building. Before we discuss that, we're going to see if there's anyone from the public that would like to comment on this. Anyone from the public like to comment? Shelves. It's hot. Yes, I'm always on the hot seat. <laughs> uh, Jody Schultz, I'm here for the Ken Island Volunteer Fire Department. Um, I just want to convey to you that I met with Todd this morning, and um, I didn't get a chance to email you, but that I'm um, dissatisfied the county regulation 18-1-160D, that, that uh, he has satisfied that with our department. Um, so I just want to convey that to you. What is that? How long do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Which one is that? It's a regulation that, that mandates that, um, without going all through it, that, that any major or minor site plan approvals meet with the, their local volunteer fire department that provides service. Okay, can I ask you a question, mm -hmm. your first responder? When you come off of 50 to get to, say, the Hardee's and the current Pizza Hut, don't you find that that's kind of wonky when you're pulling in off of 50? You either have wonky. the technical term. Uh, like feng shui. I threw it ugly a minute ago, so hey. Um, but I mean, don't you feel like that's kind of, and then those big trucks parked there in front of Hardee's? I mean, you don't see that that would be any sort of problem for a fire engine or the like? Well, I guess I'm not speaking on my behalf. I think the whole truck park in there is horrendous. Can we get that changed? But I. You know, I, agree. I, I question that. Who I don't even oh. know who who owns Shopping Center Road there. At that point in time, I'm going to bet the county does. And I, really, I county truly county? do go through so there every morning. Road? It's kind of uh, pretty sure. Yeah, it's I did chore. title on all that. Got a it's got a speed limit and a stop sign on it, so I'm assuming it's the county. I don't know. I mean, when we respond to incidents there, it's Shopping Center Road, but it 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 looks more like a. The, the worst thing that happened there was when they blocked off the access we used to drive through there with the curbing. I don't know what rocket scientists came up with that. 
that but was that was, uh, that, was the that was horrible. <laughs> but if he that owns that, right that, that was the question. If he owns that, how could he block that off? Which was if that's really a county road. I have no idea who owns that. But the tractor trailer deal, I remember when Safeway came in in a, in a similar discussion was about trucks delivering a Safeway and coming through 552 intersection. And if I remember correctly, deliveries to Safeway could not, coming from the Western Shore, could not use 552 intersection. Now they had to go past. They had to go down to. Um, the old Pont Safeway. The new Safeway. They had to go to. Um, I guess Piney Creek Great and come back, around, or if yeah. they're heading out, they got to go to the Narrows and, and wheel out that way. And that, which is a, you know, I don't know who monitors that, but you could do the same thing there. Just have trucks go on and off 50 and go turn around that way and keep them off the back roads. Perhaps that's something we could explore. It really doesn't have any bearing on right. the applicant. Yeah. Right. This particular so, property yeah. is yeah. the only person we know does yeah. not own that road. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, no, actually, they, we were shown a. Um, um, an aerial uh, that shows that actually the fee is, o is owned to the state to Route 5301 right of way. So the fee is owned by whoever, G Galasso, whoever owns the property now. I don't know, however, whether there's a dedication of Shopping Center Road to the county. I'm pretty sure there is. I did title on all of us back there when. And I'm pretty sure that there's a dedication. I can bring it in for you if you want it, just so you can have it for information. I'm okay, so and so we've had public comment. We've heard from everybody. I think I we're done. Think with so there's still, oh, yeah. there's still more. Yeah. Come on up. How are you, Stan Rudy, uh, resident of Chester, work out of Stevensville. Uh, don't want to go on record as being opposed to absolutely everything. I think it's a great idea. The um, present... Uh, location now is a hazard with a drive-in window. Uh, people back up into the entrance into that shopping center and you can't turn into the shopping center the way it sits right now. So that drive-in window was really ill thought. That whole parking lot was, uh, like um, Mr. Schultz said, is, is awful. It's, it's a crazy design. You're going to put a uh, active business into a place that is being underused downsizing the building slightly that parking area is not being uh, used uh, very much especially with the acme closed and um, it would be an improvement to the uh, community so uh, it's a good idea and uh, yeah at some point i hope the uh, uh, joining property owners were notified about this plan and the there's something wrong with that the design of that parking lot it is crazy and Hope nothing happens before something's improved with the flow of that, and and uh, look forward to closing that um, blockage at the entrance where it is now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm Nick Store from Chester, and I just want to make a point on the current project for Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, to draw two lessons learned from that that will pertain to your discussion of McDonald's. Uh, the point that Mr. Rudy just made about the backup uh, onto Route 18 going into the Dunkin' Donuts was one of the motivating factors, I believe, for the people to want to have a new separate site uh, out in place of uh, uh, the Pizza Hut. Um, so keep that backup onto a main road in mind uh, doing a U-turn to get into a, 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 a fast food uh, restaurant. Uh, the other is the, the point that Mrs. McClellan brought up about trucks. Miss. Uh, Miss McClellan. Thank you. <coughs> um, Worked hard for that. <laughs> I, no comment. Thank you. <coughs> um, and I enjoyed working with you on the planning board, on the Public Works Advisory Board. Um, the other is the point that she made about uh, truck traffic. Uh, it's unclear what McDonald's, when McDonald's attracts a lot of input. McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts? We're, we're, we're dealing with this project. Right. If you, if you want to draw conclusions for this for some other project, you should make that testimony then. Okay. Because it, unless it pertains to your, uh, your, your, some suggestion that we could take under advisement for this project, it really is irrelevant. I'll put that in 
any comments I have on McDonald's. Okay, but just drawing the connection between the two. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public on this topic? Okay, we're going to close public comment. Mr. Drummond, could you clarify what our options are that you were referring to before? If we were so inclined to grant um, site plan approval, but want them to come back and get their building approved. Could we not just not add as another condition? Well, a condition, I suppose, would be that if you're inclined to Typically, what has happened is it pushed it off to the next month to bring back the revised architecturals. Um, if you want to grant site plan approval, but it's conditioned upon, for example, no the, no permits will be issued until they come back with an acceptable um, architectural rendering. Permits, by that I mean building grading permit. permits, building permits, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but they could perhaps begin to put financing in place. Uh, they may not get financing in place from could, a. Could we simply condition it on no building permit until? We no, because that. you let's say they you know they tear the place up and they never come back and they insist upon what has been described as ugly and they never get site plan approval but the uh, parking lot's all torn up oh that would be bonded that, that would all be bonded it, it, yeah then we got to chase the bonding company it, it seems it. It, it, i would really like to see you guys to have a situation where we have a road to nowhere a parking lot torn up right and then they disappear, and we got to chase a bonding company around. But I, I, I would like to see you get started as soon as possible. But things happen, and it seems to me that we should follow the protocol that we typically have followed, where you just need to come back so we don't get the ball rolling and we don't put the cart in front of the horse. Um, it, it, I, I wish there was an easier way of doing it, but in my opinion, I think that's what we should do. Um, being in a time-sensitive business dealing with weather, I understand that when you have the weather with you, you need to get rolling with things. But uh, it, it, this this building is so far from what you know we we think fits in there. Um, I I think the idea of uh, replacing the existing building and building this building is awesome, and I'm very much in favor of that. Ali, what's the schedule if they were to go back and redesign this building in the next couple of weeks? When could they get before us again? Next month. Next Can it be month? here they next could, month? Yeah, they could submit actually anything they need to submit, get all of the approvals ready to go. Um, 25 day is uh, tomorrow, 25 day submittal tomorrow, so we get them on the agenda for July right away. So we, we wouldn't have to have the public. submittals in tomorrow. No, no, you wouldn't, but you, uh, well, you could do a placeholder with a letter. Yeah, we can get another public hearing. Is what it have to be. Not a public hearing. No, well, this is not a public hearing. This no. is just a project approval. So um, I think it's fair to say that the design of these buildings is shouldn't have been a surprise. Okay. okay. It sounds like you're going to have to come back next month. Okay. Um, and does anyone have anything other than that that they want? to see anyone have anything they would like to propose as a motion, whether it would pass or not. Okay. Okay. Um, you're going to have to go right. back. We'll okay. see you next month. Okay. Um, for anyone who has returned, uh, we have diligently worked to get through um, the projects that were uh, before the one that I know a lot of you were here for, but we are going to have to take a break for lunch. Um, we will limit it to 30 minutes. We will reconvene at 1.30. Next on our agenda is um, <coughs> minor site plan 0413010005 C, uh, McDonald's Thompson Creek Mall. Um, before we start, I know there's a lot of people here um, on this. So I apologize that uh, we were delayed on other projects, but uh, we're working through them as fast as we can. Uh, just so everybody knows how this works, after the staff report and presentation by the applicants, we will take public comment from anyone who wants to speak before we deliberate. That will we'll go first with people who signed up and anyone else who wants to speak after that. To be fair to all speakers, everyone will be limited to three minutes, which will be strictly enforced unless uh, one of the commission members asks the speaker a follow-up question. Uh, I will say that we received a lot of emails, again, um, on this project in the last 10 days. Every one of them is part of the um, file for this agenda item. 
uh, but I must say that most, if not all of them, failed to address any specific actionable issue. Uh, I think it's important for the public to understand that as members of the a planning commission, we do not propose any specific use any time. Owners and tenants propose individual development projects. The planning commission is charged with a specific task of determining if a project conforms to the comp plan and the zoning ordinance and evaluating the evidence presented by staff, applicants, and the public to determine if a proposal presents specific threat to traffic or public safety that exceeds the legal limit. We can only apply existing laws and regulations in our deliberations. Uh, most of these emails address things that don't exist. Um, and the, the reality is that uh, the time and place to address if you want to ban a specific user from Queen Anne's County, or if you would limit how many businesses of any specific type should be allowed within X number of miles of each other, um, or uh, any other regulation that doesn't currently exist, the time to deal with those is during co community planning processes. Once a project comes before us, it's already been determined by the staff that the use is permitted by the zoning code. Our authority is limited to does this uh, proposal meet the regulations. This is not to say that our votes are cast before we hear anything, um, but the fact that I don't personally or do personally like a proposal, or even that everyone in the county loves or hates a proposal is not adequate um, justification for our action. We are simply limited to does a proposal meet the regulations. So with that, we will go ahead and take um, the staff report. We will follow with the applicant. And then we will hear from everyone in the public who wants to be heard. Holly. Okay, great. Before Ms. Tompkins starts, and this might be a question for legal counsel. During our meeting this morning, we've received emails regarding a certain issue on our agenda. I'm wondering, obviously they are sent to us as a group now, and we've discussed in the past that emails become part of the record. So I don't necessarily know that that decision needs to be made if the ones that <coughs> come to us after are part of the record here today, or if we just want to make note to the public that indeed we haven't seen them prior to our meeting today. I would say if they weren't received prior to the meeting, they're not part of today's record. They can still be made part of the file. Thank you. But <clears throat> Holly? Okay, thank you. As, as noted, this is the minor site plan for the McDonald's at Thompson Creek. Specifically, that property is located at tax map 56, parcel 251. The location is 300 Thompson Creek Mall Drive, south of 5301, along Thompson Creek Road in Stevensville. The parcel size is a little over 21 acres. The pad size itself is 1.04 acres. The zoning is urban commercial and the parcel overall exists with, uh, within the critical area portions of it, uh, um, IDA, intensely developed area, and a little bit of LDA, limited development area. The applicant is requesting to replace an existing 8,642 square foot commercial building with a new 4,140 square foot restaurant with drive through and they're looking for minor site plan approval today. The applicant submitted their site plan in January of this year and staff comments were returned to them uh, in February of this year. Um, regarding the site details, the proposed development is occurring on a pad site or lease area within the Thompson Creek Shopping Center. The center has direct access onto Thompson Creek Road at multiple points as well as access onto Marion Quimby Drive. The UC Zoning District permits 40% floor area, the subject property will permit up to 8.57 acres. The existing FAR is 2.86 acres. The existing commercial building will be demolished and a new building will be constructed. The, revol the resulting FAR will be 2.76 acres or 13% FAR. The impervious surface permitted in the UC district is 80%. The Upland IDA, well, I should say critical area together, permits 17, a little over 17 acres. The existing impervious is a little over 12 acres. And after redevelopment, the impervious is ever, actually slightly reduced. The proposed use will be served by existing public sewer and public water. The existing structure to be demolished is not a historical structure. The maximum building height is 45%. Feet, and the proposed structure is to be 21 and a half feet. 
The lighting on site is proposed to consist of the same or similar match fixtures that currently exist, which will be relocated with the redevelopment, as well as new lighting for the signage and proposed structure. The proposed signage and calculations have been provided on the plan and reviewed by staff. The parking required for the proposed use is covered via the code <coughs> under 18183C12 Shopping Center. The required number of spaces is 482, and there are 507 spaces provided. Stormwater management will be provided on site via ESD practices and is fully described on sheet 6 of 14 on the plan. Regarding environmental details, the subject property does not have any area in the 100-year floodplain, has no hydric soils, no steep slopes, no streams or wetlands, and no existing habitat or threatened or endangered species. This is a redevelopment of a pad site, and there is a reduction in the amount of impervious area. The landscape area has increased. The landscape area required in UC zoning district is 20% or 4.2 acres for the parcel. The resulting landscape area is 9.34 acres. There are no forests or wetlands affected or required by this redevelopment. The street buffer and on-site landscaping have already met by the entirety of the shopping center. However, the applicant is providing additional on-site landscaping. The applicant is also providing parking lot landscaping mm -hmm. for the number of cars that park within the pad site or lease area. Due to the reduction in impervious, the existing 886 square feet of landscaping will become 4,563 square feet after redevelopment. Under the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance, the applicant submitted an APFO study in November of 2012 to address intersection capacity and public water sewer adequacy. The county requested the applicant study the standard AM and PM weekday hours as well as midday peak hours on both Saturday and Sunday. The study was approved in January of this year, finding that all of the public facilities would be adequate to support the redevelopment of the pad site. Regarding the urban commercial design standards, the applicant has submitted a narrative that seeks to address those standards, and that is out, as outlined in the TCUC Design Standards Handbook, and those responses to that are attached to the staff report. The applicant has also submitted color architectural elevations for review by staff and the Planning Commission. Under the 2010 Comprehensive Plan, the proje uh, project, the pad site redevelopment is um, <clears throat> covered by MAP LU5, it's commercial. MAP LU6 is in the County Planning and Priority Funding Area. MAP LU7B, commercial and mixed use. MAP ESA6, it is currently served by sewer and water. MAP DBT1, Economic Development and Tourism in Stevensville. And lastly, the 2007 Chester Stevensville Community Plan. MAP 24, it's in the Stevensville existing land use of commercial. MAP 51, the planning area 2005. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, Joseph Stevens, Centerville, Maryland. Um, I represent McDonald's, the applicant before you. And so that you know, uh, we're going to uh, give you some information on a few things. We're going to focus on just a couple of things. We're going to focus on uh, traffic and circulation, both within and outside, immediately adjacent to the center, um, the existing center. Um, for for the McDonald's proposal and then architecture um, so that's who I will have is uh, the traffic consultant and then the architect I am going to ask Perry Otwell who's the engineer just to talk a couple minutes about the ESD you know the new design standards how they were incorporated in improvement of stormwater quality on the site um, and so on for this actual reduction of, um, of, of, of the existing building by about a half and uh, increase in um, in um, pervious surface and a decrease in impervious surface on the site. So I'll start with him, but I do have those other two, so I know that that's where probably the bulk of your questions will come from. So, Harry? Do you want to just go to the plan? Will that be easier for you? Or no, you can speak uh, to that it? That is an overall plan. Let me, give, let me put it down. Regional stormwater management facility 
that is over here on the west side of the property. Excuse me, can you identify yourself? Uh, Perry Otwell from hey. McCrone. Uh, so the site, the entire shopping center is served by a stormwater management system. We're reducing the impervious area on the site. Uh, we increased the, the pervious area, basically it had a little over 800 square foot and we're a little over 4,000 now, so it's a substantial increase. Uh, we have state-of-the-art water quality inlets that will tra uh, trap the stormwater before it enters into the storm drain system that runs along the front of the property and discharges down into the pond. They are until fair uh, water quality inlets. We have two of them, one located here and here. So they use a filter media and a actual plant inside the inlet to help uh, treat the water before it enters into the storm drain system. Uh, we'll have extensive planning along the sides and back. This side, as you remember, had no planning on it, so we have a good amount of plantings over here. It's a nice open area in the back and along this island. The reduction in building size will greatly increase the visibility around the building. Uh, we have Increase the water line from the back of the building. We're in an eight inch line around to the front and placed a fire hydrant out front to increase fire service. The site lies partially in the IDA district, about 5,000 square foot. We treated the whole site for the 10% pollutant reduction rule and we exceeded that by almost three times the requirement. Uh, we did a nice dumpster screening pad. Right now the dumpster has a basically an old deteriorating board on board fence and they're going to do a brick and block wall fence which will screen the dumpster extremely well. Uh, the building size is about 48 percent of the original size so it's a substantial decrease uh, and the parking is adequate for the shopping center. So site-wise that's pretty much sums it up. All right. Thanks, Barry. Um, Mark Keeley. Mark is with Traffic Concepts. He did two things for us. Um, first, he, um, he did the APF study, so he can talk about <coughs> adequacy of roads. He can talk about increase in traffic as a result of the McDonald's over the restaurant and the, I guess, service uses that are there now. Um, and, um, and then he can go through internal circulation and talk about each of the movements internally um, as well as the queuing um, for the McDonald's and how many queue spaces there are and so on and what he anticipates. Uh, also, I didn't mention earlier that uh, the, the franchisee, the owner, uh, is the same person who owns the McDonald's out here right behind us and the one up in Chestertown and a couple in the Annapolis area, um, Jerry Gimblestaub. And he's going to be here, and he can talk about function and deliveries, okay? That's not really Mark's area, but he can tell you what his deliveries are like and functions, and he's the best person to talk to in that regard. So um, so with that. He doesn't own the other McDonald's on Ken Island. No, he does not. Thank That's you. corporate, I believe. That McDonald's on Ken Island, I believe, is corporate. Okay. My name is Mark Healy. I'm project manager with Traffic Concepts, and I conducted the uh, traffic impact study. I'm just going to go through quickly the, the impact study, and then I'll talk about the traffic circulation. We received a, a scoping letter from the county, and that's with the, the traffic impact study is based on, on the traffic scoping letter that sets the parameters for the study. Um, the trip generation is, is determined with the ITE trip gen manual. It's the ninth edition. It's the latest edition. It's uh, the standard in the transportation industry. Um, we looked at weekday a.m. p.m. 7 to 9, 4 to 6, Saturday 11 to 2, Sunday 11 to 2. Saturday counts were conducted uh, in the month of August. Uh, we did not subtract out the trips generated by the existing building, so we left those in, creates a worst case scenario. All traffic studies have three basic components, an existing traffic condition, background, and future. The existing is performing the uh, traffic counts at the study intersections. We looked at Maryland 8, at the uh, Thompson Creek Service Road, Pier 1. We looked at the uh, Thompson Creek Service Road at the shopping center access nearest to the site 
we looked at the roundabout, uh, Marion Quimby at Thompson Creek, and then the access, uh, shopping center access on the Marion, um, Marion Quimby. Um, so that, that's the, that's the uh, existing traffic conditions. Just to let you know, the, uh, the traffic volumes that we counted at the uh, Thompson Creek service road at, at the access point nearest to the site, we had 35 uh, total trips during the a.m., 86 p.m., 68 on Saturday, and 43 on a Sunday. So, now, which which entrance is that? This is, is that the, the one roundabout or is that closest the to the roundabout, the access into the shopping center. I'm sorry. It's this one right here. Okay, you're talking about directly into the shopping center. That's correct. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so 86. That's right. before this, the this circle? Nothing to do with this. Yeah, this is just the yeah, entrance. It's right the here. Shop. It's Got one it. of the counts that we Excellent did, one of the station. key intersections. Okay. And, and that's the gas over what period of time? Well, it, we, a per hour, per 15 minutes? That's an hour count. So that equates to, if I, if I uh, multiply that by, divide it by 60, that equates to about uh, 1.4 1, 1. trips per minute. Turning so, into the shopping center. Turning in and coming out. That's total vehicles in and out. During which hour, Mark? That's the PM, the weekday PM, and that was the highest that we counted. And I'm bringing this up. Just, it's not a high volume traffic flow at this at this intersection into the shopping center. Now, that's an actual count. Not that's an, an no, that's that's an actual field count. And what were your time frames again? Monday through Friday, AM and PM. What were your study your study hours? Well, a.m., weekday a.m. is 7 to 9. 7 a.m. to 9 a.m.? Right. And then okay. in, within that 7 to, 7 to 9, we determine what the, the peak hour lies somewhere in those two hours. Okay. So when you we, say peak hour, you take the most trips that came in within an hour period, and that's what you use? That's what we use. Okay. Right. So it could be 7.15 to 8.15. It could be 8.30 to and that's or 8 to 9. a.m.? That's a.m. No p.m. during the week? Well, then we counted 4 to 6 p.m. Got it. And then Saturday. 4 11. to 6 p.m. on a Friday? No. It was, it, traffic studies, we have to count on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday because that represents typical traffic patterns. In the state of Maryland or in Queen Anne's County? In and the specifically, state. Okay. The study is done specifically using the county regulations, guidelines for traffic studies, and the state highway. We meet both. Okay. So you don't. And, you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and then I'm sorry. No, pardon sorry. me. Saturday and Sunday. Saturday. Hours or just Saturday. Saturday and Sunday, 11 to 2. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Yep. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Stevens. I forgot now. That's all right. That's all right. So that's existing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the background is. Oh, wait a minute, but that includes those that <laughs> may be using the businesses in the existing building right that's we count all traffic <coughs> flowing along the thompson creek road coming in and out of that one of, yeah this entry. is a study intersection this was one this so was all one. of them you looked at or just that one no all of them we counted we okay but the yeah. numbers you're talking about right now are just, yeah just, I'm, just, yes. the, okay. that 86 was in and Correct. out here okay so i just bring that up to represent that mm -hmm. it's not a high volume movement now mm -hmm. on a weekday um what would high volume be well it's hundreds different for well you, you say this isn't high volume so well, this, for this area what would high volume be i can't give you a number i mean i can divide that by well, 60 and that's one trip a minute that's not high volume well high volume saying, might be I don't know. Twenty-five trips a minute. It's it's okay. different for every person. I mean, if you live on the western shore, your perspective of traffic is going to be different than if you lived well, in. Well, well, my point is, you, you're you're saying it's not high volume, so you must have some kind of uh, yeah, graph right. or something that determines what's high volume, what's not, or is this just your personal opinion? It's, it's my personal opinion. Okay, that, that, there you go. That answers that. Okay. All right. Background. We received five developments that have preliminary plan approvals but aren't aren't constructed yet those trips we we so we take if it's a residential say it's 50 units we uh, use the ITE trip gen manual determine peak hour trips for a.m. p.m. Saturday and Sunday um, create a distribution pattern and then assign those trips to the study intersections so there's five different developments and on top of that 
we use a growth rate of 2% and the site has a two year build out period, two, two year design year. So we, we apply the 2% growth in traffic um, and, and that creates the background traffic conditions. And then the future traffic condition is simply the square footage of the building. Um, the square footage of the building is 4,140 square feet. We use the same methodology, ITE. Um, which is the? Which is, it's the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Gen Manual. And that's what the county and the state requires. That's what the county and the state okay. requires to use, correct. So those, those uh, trips... Just, well, you know, I, I hate to... That manual you're talking about, is it... This, is it uh, if we have an office building, if we have a, a pet store, if we have a fast food, if we have a townhouse uh, development, I mean, there's got to be different amounts of vehicles that will frequent these different locations. So, so when you, we talk about that growth, is there, is there different levels there? We, the, the manual has many different types of land uses. Mm -hmm. So for uh, the McDonald's, we use a fast food with drive That's with the drive so the, Good. Yeah, and, and the statistics are, are taken from across the United States in urban, rural, suburban areas, and they come up with what's an average rate. So we use that average rate applied to the square footage of this building and come up with our trips, peak hour trips. So then we combine the trip, we combine the existing, the background, and the future trips, the growth rates, the background trips, existing trips, and then um, we perform a capacity analysis. It's, it's used, it's the critical lane analysis method that's required by the county and the state. So we determined that all the intersections operate at an acceptable level of service, which in the growth areas is a C. Um, I think the only C we found was the uh, Maryland 8 Thompson Creek Service Road P Pier 1. So all other intersections, including the roundabout, operate at within that A, B, or C level. The, uh, it might be helpful because there's a large crowd to explain what level of service is. Well, level of service... Do with the amount of time you sit. Yeah. Le level of service, it's based on capacity and intersection delay. Delay at an intersection. Level service A is essentially free flow traffic movements. Um, a B is there could be some wait time. A C, um, there's, it's, there's still um, capacity at the intersection. You may have to sit through maybe a, a, a signal phase. Um, level service D, which is probably ex it's acceptable in probably 90% of the counties in, in Maryland. Um, and then E and F are, represent failing conditions where you're, you're waiting at it. If it's a signalized intersection, you're waiting maybe multiple signal phases, signal cycles. So, but in, in Queen Anne's County, it's a level service C, and this is peak hour traffic. So um, that's a pretty good level service to maintain. That means you have adequate capacity. There's not, not a whole lot of delay time. The roundabout was level service A, and that's simply because at a roundabout, you don't stop. It's, it's a yield condition. Um, so, so when you have a yield, you're, you're moving through the intersection without delay. Roundabouts can, can handle a greater flow rate, therefore more capacity, and the intersection works well. Roundabouts also control travel speeds, and they reduce the type of more they, they reduce uh, crash types that are severe. So if, if this was a traditional T intersection where you have a stop sign, um, that's more likely to see uh, an angle type more severe accident. So roundabouts do a couple of different things, controlling <coughs> speeds as I mentioned, and that intersection works fairly well. So you're saying that roundabout intersection, just so I, I'm clear, with the if the McDonald's, the future McDonald's bill, with your numbers that you use, has an A rating? Yep. Okay. It does. Um, on, on that particular topic, there's, there's a lot of people who sent us emails telling us that it was intolerable now and that there were frequent accidents there. What, what's, 
what research do you have on how often accidents occur now? Well, the state doesn't give us accident data. It won't give public or consultants accident data, but... Did they used to give you accident data, and they now did, they stopped they that policy? They okay. did, and we, we had some older traffic data, and it's this is not a high accident location. Would the county give that information to you? The, the county, county doesn't uh, compile they it. They don't have it. They don't compile it on state roads. Well, why do you think they don't give it to you, Mark? I'm just curious. <clears throat> I think the, the state doesn't want the public to know which intersections are high accident locations. <laughs> right? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, again, the, the state reviewed the study. They would have told us okay. if that was, you know, a high accident. Well, that was my and next then, question to you. I'm sorry, Jim. And the state concurred that that's an A rating on that roundabout. They re yeah, they reviewed the study and concurred with the and study. found no, no fault with the study. Now, that's typically what they do on these APFs. First of all, the state and the county establish the methodology, not the consultant. Um, then they require a scoping meeting for the, for the consultant to go to where they actually expand on what the rules actually say and say, well, this is important over here. We want you to look at this, too, and that, there. And then they review it, and they review the data, the methodology, and then they, they send a letter back and say whether they agree with the conclusions. And, you know, oftentimes they have comments or want eva additional evaluation, and then the consultant goes back and revises it and then submits it. And not until that's done do, do we get out of what's called APF review. At that point, then the county's APF technical advisory committee sends us a letter and says that you have passed APF, assuming that we passed. If we hadn't passed, we would have then had to propose mitigation measures um, in order to bring the, the various intersections up to snuff, so to speak, up to A, B, or C level of service. But my question for you, Mark, is back on the accident stuff. In, in your experience in doing studies throughout the state, they, don't, they won't divulge where high accident intersections are or anything like that, or accident data, let me put it that way. But if you do a study in a, for an inter, and includes an intersection where they do have accident concerns, do they tell you about that in their review? One of the, yes, we would find out. Okay. All right. So you just can't call them and say, give, give me your accident data. But right. when you do a study for some place that includes a problem area, they, they identify that they won't, I can ask and they can say, and a private citizen might be able to call up to my uh, um, I don't know, district engineer and say, is this a high accident location? And they, they'll tell you yes or no. Okay. Mr. Right. Stevens, if I could clarify, are you saying that our, we have county representatives involved at the very beginning that are able to identify the various differences in our regions within our county? You mean for? Prior to the study? Prior to the? When they're looking at the setting perimeters for the study? Because I also do live down this street. And so this is near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. Yes, the answer is yes. The county, the county, and the state are the ones that establish the parameters for the study. So and Queen Anne's County is represented before the seven. Oh yes, yeah. Board of Pub I mean the, the Department of Public Works, as well as county county staff, but planning staff. Is that accurate, Mark? Yes. All right. Um, any other site circulation. I think everybody understands that. There's different driver expectation um, when you're driving in a parking lot as opposed to public roads. I mean, in a parking lot, you have you have pedestrians walking through drive aisles. You have vehicles backing out of drive aisles. You have or parking spaces. You have parked cars pulling through drives. You know, a parking space and maybe coming in if if it's not a curb or race curb, they could be coming through the other end of the drive aisle unexpectedly. You have people waiting to park. So there's different maneuvers, there's there's yields, which which is different from public road where everybody has a place, pedestrians, bikes, um, left turn vehicles. So that being said, I, I think the the proposed location on this pad site is it's very similar to what you find at some older shopping centers. In fact, the uh, existing KFC down here has a drive-through at the main access where you're coming out, and and you have the main drive aisle here. So it's very similar to here. And there, I think it's very similar in what you find at, at other um, shopping centers with, with pad sites. Um, we, we think that the the, um, the proposed building, because yeah, of the okay. elevation... You want to, do you have a visual that well, helps with that? This is, the, this is the plan I was going to use for okay. to talk about the existing okay. site. 
Um, well, there's an existing site. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. I just wanted to show you this is this. So this is the existing 8,000, what is it, 462 square foot commercial building. You have parking spaces all along here, so you have vehicles backing out here. Um, yeah, you have parking spaces on either side. Um, and then also you have the building, and we, we think the sight lines would actually be improved with the McDonald's because this is the corner of the building right about here. So I think there's, there's limited sight view if you're driving up the drive out this way to, to the north to exit the traffic, exit the parking lot. So we think that's one improvement. Um, <clears throat> this is just a better plan sheet showing the proposed building. When we looked at this, originally we had a full movement access into the site here. No, we Go ahead. I'm sorry. When you say full movement, explain that for everybody. Inbound, outbound. Okay, so uh, along that lane and in, in the initial plan proposal, so you have people going out in both directions, north and south? Yes. Okay. So we changed that <clears throat> to an inbound only movement. And what that does is reduces the vehicle conflicts here. So it's, it's a left in only. So that's that's one improvement. The other one is we looked at the drive the drive through lane. We widened that out. There is a dual water board. I'm not sure if that's the right terminology. Um, and what that does is it creates more efficiency for people ordering their food and coming up to get their food. It also creates a, a greater stacking for vehicles. So it's hard to see here. This is not color, but. With the site the way it's laid out, you can store 18 vehicles in the in the drive-through island. What's typical for a fast food restaurant? Uh, maybe, maybe Lee could answer that. I'm not sure what. Maybe 10. Ten to 12. Ten. Ten. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we did was delineated the uh, the parking area from the drive-through with raised curb and then landscape different landscape um, bushes, so it, it, it guides pedestrians to the areas where McDonald's wants them to be to access the store. Um, the drive aisle here, coming out onto the, the parking drive aisle, there's a stop bar here, there's a stop sign, so people coming out, they're going to be able to look both ways um, and be able to make this this right turn and then out of the parking area. And as I said before, based on our counts, the peak hour, it's this this movement was fairly minimal. And, uh, we didn't count the main drive aisle because uh, that's not impacting our our project. So this is this is the key intersection and we don't we don't believe that's gonna be an issue. Well can you talk about that, how someone would have to look back in the instances they're coming out um, and uh, and look into the parking lot and, and, and see if there's an oncoming car. Explain that movement, please. Well, I, I think this is fairly typical in a, in a parking lot um, for a pad site. So you come through, you get your food, you pull up to the stop bar, you stop. I mean, you, you have a clear sight line here. There's not going to be vegetation or shrubs that we're planting. So you're going to be able to, to look back when you move up here and you, you'll have a clear view sight line this way, so you wait for a gap in traffic and you pull out. Okay. And what's the, is, is that the exact, or not the exact, but essentially the same 
the same design as the Kentucky Fried Chicken? It has? is. Okay, so it has the breakup then of landscaping between the, the pickup window and the drive aisle. Right. So there's this pickup window, drive aisle, landscaping, and then there's the main entrance to the shopping center. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Could, could you not have brought that out back in that parking lot? The problem I see with that is you come out to the end of there and you people right in front of you, you have a clear sight of them. But anybody coming from the parking lot on the other side who thinks they got a straight shot to the entrance, they're obstructed by the cars that are parked right there. And to me, that's, I mean, it's less than one car length, I think, when you turn out from there before you, ha you have to come out to the right and then turn back to the left. And it just seems to me that that's, that's a, not a very good design. I understand well, you, you're captured by what you got, but if you could bring those cars out further back in the parking lot so that you only had two directions traffic could be coming from, not three, it would seem to be a little safer. Now you lose some of your stacking of cars, and I don't know how you're going to get them their food, so that's a total different story. But, uh, but you're saying come out this, come out. Somewhere over there would at least, you only have two different directions of traffic. Right now you got three directions Well, of you'd traffic. have to come out. There's no way you could come out here at a right angle. You'd oh, have I understand. To, you'd have to have, you would have to make that one, one direction as well as the other side. Yeah. Why, anyway. couldn't, why couldn't you come out where you just put your finger? Right here? Well, well you, that, you'd, have to, you'd have to create you know, some, type, some type of channelized movement yeah. where you're, you're coming out at an angle. Why? Why, was, why couldn't it be 90 degrees? If you well, got, there's not enough room here. There's, not, there's not no way you can turn a car. Further north. Well, still, here's the wall. I mean, I don't think you'd have the turning radius to, to come out and tee up into that drive aisle. I think this is the best solution that that we have. I mean, the existing traffic conditions, I, I don't, you've got people backing out of here. I mean, I don't know that that's an issue. If this was such a high-volume movement, you would never let this happen. And it happens today, and it works, and it works for the KFC. Oh, I understand that. It just seems that it would work better if you didn't have three directions of traffic coming, and if you have any option, it would be well, preferable. I think it works better for vehicle queuing, which I think is a concern. And it, I don't, I can't think of a design <clears throat> where you'd have people coming out at an angle, and it would be an angle. I, I just don't, I don't see that as a, a solution. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Mr. Keeling? You were talking about drivers and characteristics within the parking lot. Did your traffic study consider the parking, or is that somebody else in this? That would be, that's, um, we didn't look at the parking. Uh, thank you. And secondly, you had said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you looked at Saturdays in August, and perhaps Ms. Tompkins can also address this if this is uh, incorrect. It says it's, um, an APFO study was submitted in November 12 for the intersection capacity and then the study was approved in January 2013 and yet in August doesn't fall between November and January. Can you answer that or clarify that for me? Yeah, you did. Yeah. You do the counts before you submit the study. Do the counts way before you do the study. The counts have to, as long as the counts are, are with a year old, they're valid. They can't be any more than a year old. So sometime in 2012 in August, you were there doing your count? Yeah, we received, I think the scoping letter was dated, when we got the scoping letter, that was dated August 2012, but we, we started discussing the key intersections probably June or July, probably July. So we anticipated, I've had this comment before, summer, we need to count in the summer in Queen Anne's County. So, well, it's not necessarily Queen Anne's County, but Ken Island is very unique. Right. Well, regardless, we I know to do my summer counts, my Saturday counts in the summer, and that's what we did. Your, your counts um, take in the existing traffic plus what you anticipate is your new traffic. There's, there, there was a lot of concern in the emails that we got that McDonald's will dramatically increase the amount of traffic. Do you have any information on what the difference would be between what we have now and what McDonald's? You want might, to know what the McDonald's generates? What are they going to add? Add over what's existing now. So you'd have to you'd have to have taken out whatever 
is using their, I don't know how you do that, but I'm just curious as to whether you have an idea of how much additional traffic McDonald's would cause over the existing uses. Yeah, as I said, we, we left the existing commercial building, we left their traffic, I counted, I didn't subtract their traffic, okay? Now, and we used the, the trip generation to determine peak hour. If I leave, if I subtract out, and this is, I took the, the existing building, 8,462, 42 square feet, come up with a trip, peak hour trip generation, it's take subtract that from the McDonald's. The AM new trips would be 97. PM new trips would be 36. The Saturday new trips would be 160, and Sunday would be 189. Okay, so so they're clear. So the the you did AM peak, and that's the additional trips with the McDonald's AM peak, PM peak, Saturday peak, and Sunday peak right. hours. Okay. So those, those, what I just said, that's trips generated during the peak one hour. Could I ask, Ms. McClellan, I didn't understand your question about McClellan. when you asked him. McClellan, I'm sorry. About the, um, the, if he had done a traffic study in the parking lot. I, you made mention of the fact that there are driver characteristics, i.e. they have to back up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with regard to the parking there within the lot. So I wanted to know if it, it was this individual or this company, Traffic Concepts, that actually looked at the parking in that center, and he answered, "No, it was okay. not." Do you mean in counted spaces and? So, okay, no, that was Macron. Okay, all right. I, thank my, you. My comments are general comments regarding flow. I'm assuming yeah, parking lot. Got universe. it. Mark. It, uh, from your evaluation of circulation and so on, does the site plan as proposed create an adverse or a hazardous situation in, in the shopping center? And, and, and explain your answer, please. Not in my opinion. I mean, I think we try to design roadways, drive aisles, drive through lanes um, to best handle the traffic volumes and to eliminate. Um, situations that aren't expected so and I don't believe that we have a situation here where drivers wouldn't expect one of these movements within within a an existing parking lot even a driver coming up and you going to the entrance and heading north is going to see the McDonald's in the drive-through aisle there right they're going to see the drive-through aisle they also have to notice as I said before vehicles backing out so, and that's, that's why I started off. Your expectation as a driver when you're in a parking lot is different than when you're on a public road because you, you have to be wary of, you know, people crossing the drive aisle. You have to be wary of people backing out of a space or coming out of a drive through lane. So then let me, um, uh, allow me to take you out to a public road. There's a traffic circle there. One would assume that people coming from the west to the east are going to see the McDonald's and that would be probably the most used exit to get to the McDonald's. Mm -hmm. That's a precarious circle as is. I was in the military and lived in Boston so I'm familiar with the circle but I also go on that circle every single day and it, not everybody is that familiar. Especially when you have larger trucks exiting from Route 50 and so I'm, you, I'm assuming that you considered all of that in your traffic study because that would be the most likely exit to go to this McDonald's, correct? I would, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the traffic circle is designed to handle truck traffic. It's, they're not going to stay in their lane. They're, it's, the traffic circle, they're meant to drive their back wheels, well, you know, mm -hmm. across. If, this is a, this is a painted island, but in a, uh, most roundabouts you have a raised curve that's meant to be driven over by tractor tra trailers. If this was a stop condition as it was before, mm -hmm. then you have increased delay because you are stopping, and then you're going to have vehicle queuing on the ramp. I think the, the roundabout, because it's a yield condition, it eliminates or reduces vehicle queuing on SHA's ramp that they don't want. And when we put this roundabout in... We don't want that either. Yeah, nobody does. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So 
You know, this didn't go in without SHA approval. Um, you mean the roundabout? The roundabout, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in your experience in regards to other older shopping centers that you've dealt with or, or shopping centers with pad sites, is this an unusual circumstance, an unusual or, or an odd circumstance in terms of how the, uh, how the um, McDonald's is located, the pad site and the, and the design of the circulation? No, I'd say it's fairly typical of a new pad site in an existing shopping center. Okay. And pretty similar to the one that exists already? Yes. Okay. Have anything further from Mr. Keeley? Okay. All right. Well, then I was going to ask if um, Sarah Wexler could please um, come forward. Okay. Why don't you go here, and that way, then is that okay? And then you can be close to that, and I can help you with whatever you need. Hi, my name is Sarah Wexler. I'm with Chesapeake Design Group Architects. Um, so I wanted to start off a bit uh, with our historical involvement with this project. Um, we were brought in after previous submissions were made of drawings from Oak Brook, which is the McDonald's corporate, and they tried to come up with a fitting kind of custom design for this site. Um, so th that, that was the point that we kind of came in after the previous submissions had been made. Um, as I mentioned, I work for CDG Architects. So we're a local for uh, firm out of Baltimore. Um, CDG is about a 30-year-old uh, architecture firm, and they've been doing work on the Eastern Shore for many of those years. As you may know, um, we were brought in for the other Kent Island location and worked very closely with many of the same people and were successful in developing an approvable design. Having worked across the road, we know the importance of developing another unique design for this location. Due to the fact that the footprint was dramatically different, the earlier designs prior to our involvement were encouraged to be contextual to the location as where it stands now. So to get a little bit into our design, um, we felt that the massing of the previous design was somewhat uninspired. From traveling around the Eastern Shore, which we really wanted to have a feel and, and have this building create a feel that it belongs on the Eastern Shore, many buildings had a core building with porches, bay windows, additions, all kind of added on so that the current product, the massing articulation is broken down. Even though the, the, the design guidelines don't require a building of this size to have the massing requirements, we felt that it was appropriate. And so as best as we could with the elements that we have, we've broken down the main mass, providing smaller elements that are very contextual to the buildings along the Eastern Shore. Furthermore, we articulated the textures and elements on the building, such as the brick base, utilizing a Chestertown brick um, at the base, which I do have samples of, if anyone wants to see samples of the materials on the building. Um, which is in harmony, harmony with, yet contrasting, the sage-colored clabbered, which is a hardy plank material. As is fairly traditional, we've trimmed this hardy plank with a white and a prominent cornice. Being that this is a McDonald's with an often utilized storefront or butt glazing, um, we did take the opportunity to use a divided light in this location, which are the mullions that divide the main windows into smaller ones. Um, so, but yet in scale with the overall building. We've utilized a stone that feels right for the part of this country that's trending along the corridor um, in a lot of the new construction. And per the design guidelines, we're trying to provide various textures and materials. We're also detailing these in such a way to increase the dialogue of the massing. We're very happy with our proposal and we hope that you are too. You, you, I see you use brick in the, in the building. Can you discuss that a little? Yes, so the brick base, um, uh, as is in your design guidelines, um, a lot of the buildings are, are asked to have a base, a core, and a top. Um, so we, we definitely use that approach, which is very common along the Eastern Shore to have you know this kind of brick sill um, and in a Chestertown brick. So I do have a sample of that. So this is a sample from Chestertown brick and tile, and this is the brick we're proposing to use. I guess everyone wants to see. 
did you um, did you take elements from various um, other newer projects that were approved in the county and try to incorporate them in here? And can you talk about those a little bit? Yes. Um, so just you know, as as you drive down Route 50 in the corridor, you see, you know, a lot of the the stone elements. Um, the stone selection that we ch we chose was we felt definitely a appropriate for this part of the country. I mean. We didn't want to use a, a stone that looked like it belonged in the southwest or the northeast. So, um, you know, this this felt very fitting. It, it um, definitely is is complements the brick and the hardy plank um, very well. And so that was one of the main features that we used. Uh, in comparison to the other McDonald's, what mm -hmm. features are the same or different? So the general idea of the other McDonald's is kind of where we started our approach at the point that we came <coughs> in as architects. Um, we broke up the building massing by, you know, lowering some parapet heights and just making it seem as if this was an original base building that had these additions put on, you know, which is kind of a, a, a trend on the eastern shore. Um, so we played with the parapet heights and, and just the massing all around. That's what we were successful in in the other Kent Island location. Um, but this is a, a definitely a smaller building, a, a much um, different shape overall. The other one is kind of an L, so it, it creates a, a different feel. So this one is very unique. Um, we've, we felt that it, it relates to the overall shopping center. It's um, more specific to the area. So it was just a general idea of playing around with the massing and the heights that, that we brought over from the other Kent Island. And how about the roof line? Is that, is that, um, does that, um, um, hide any rooftop um, um, systems that may be up there? Yes, it, the, our parapet will always conceal the rooftop units. Um, you know, being that this is a restaurant use, there is a lot of equipment on the roof and um, these parapets will conceal all of that. How does it compare to the roof line used at the other McDonald's? I'm sorry if you already oh, said that. No, that's, um, the, the coping treatment is very similar mm -hmm. and again the the heights, um, the varying heights are okay. in the same treatment. So pretty much the same line though? Yes. Okay. The other one I believe is a little bit of a taller building, um, okay. but relationship wise it's the same okay. to the rooftop units. Did you go through the design guidelines with McDonald's and, and, and try to discuss each and every element that, that is in the guidelines? Yes. Is that what was submitted with the application, do you know? Did you help prepare that with Lee? Yes. Um, yes. Okay. All right. So it's really section four of the design guidelines, which, which apply to individual buildings more than anything else. Correct. Okay. So, so you tried to piece by piece go to and respond to each question. And, okay. And we, essentially, were you able to comply with all of those? Yes. To, to my knowledge, yes. Okay. On that that you're just talking about, mm -hmm. the design guidelines where you tried to comply with everything, it's, uh, in 3B it says the sloping roof with overhangs and brackets, and, and then was written in there that to a lesser extent um, building is, proposed buildings to further define with use of a sloped roof overhang. Where, where is that? 3, I'm sorry, uh, 3D on roofs? 3B. I'm just wondering if there, if I, I interpret that to mean there's supposed to be a slope roof somewhere, and I don't see one. Well, or a slope roof overhang, if that's somehow different than a slope roof, I, I just don't know what that, where where that was on this design. So we have revised the design a bit since th this was drawn in March, or this guidelines was was um, okay, so developed I didn't in March. It's not there. No, no. Um, okay. But if in D, um, I believe it's. What is this? One, no, 8D, which is uh, in roofs. It also does say parapets concealing flat roofs and rooftop equipment such as HVAC uh, units are appropriate. Um, so, we, you know, we do feel that this is the appropriate, treat appropriate treatment for the site. Um, it is the same way we handle the other McDonald's location. If there is a sloped roof, you would see that unsightly, those uh, rooftop units on the roof, which, you know, especially from the Route 50, you don't want to be able to see that. You want to have this attractive, detailed cornice um, that conceals all those. Now, now I know that this is a, a new <coughs> building in an older shopping center mm -hmm. with, with shopping center built to no design guidelines whatsoever. Right. Um, so you've, you've moved away from trying to emulate what the shopping center is. Could you right. discuss that a little bit? Um, right. We, we wanted this to be new and fitting, to, to, but also to fit in with the existing shopping. We do a shopping center. We didn't want this to kind of, you know, stick out like it wasn't appropriate for the site. So we wanted to, you know, derive some of our, you know, approach 
from this, the shopping center is, but in a new and appropriate way. Um, that also, as I said before, you know, really fits in with the new construction that, that is happening in this area. I don't have anything further, sir. Thank you. And I'd like to ask, um, is the last person as part of the formal presentation, the owner who will be the owner, uh, Jerry Gimblestop. He's uh, the owner, as I said earlier, of the McDonald's right out here, the owner of, uh, of the McDonald's in Chestertown, um, as well as um, several McDonald's in the Annapolis area. So I just think it's important <laughs> to, you know, to see who's going to own it because there's, you know, often you think you're dealing with a corporation, but and McDonald's is the lead in terms of the development aspect of it, but but Jerry is the owner and going to be the owner of the, of the facility. So, go ahead, Jerry. All right, thank you for letting me come. Um, so, it's just, I, I asked to uh, speak here because I want everybody to understand that this is not big, bad corporate McDonald's coming into Ken Island. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we currently own the McDonald's in Centerville. We uh, redeveloped the McDonald's in Chestertown, uh, and we own some sites in the Annapolis area. So this is our local business. I mean, we, I live in Arnold. Uh, I have my managers and people who will be running uh, this restaurant all live in Queens Anne County. Uh, currently, right now, we have probably over 50, 60 of our employees that are from Queen Anne's County. Um, and this, to me, is actually an emotional thing because this is our family business and we are the local owners. I, mean, I don't live, I'm not an absentee owner, I'm in my restaurants, I know our managers, I know our people, I know our customers, uh, we take care of our people. My average manager in all of my restaurants has been with me over 10 years. I have some people who have been with me for 15 and 20 years. Um, so we, we take a lot of pride and what we do. And we're really involved a lot in the community. Uh, for people who uh, are familiar with our Annapolis stores or Chestertown, uh, we have a program set up with all the ARC, uh, uh, with the ARC community. We have kids with uh, disabilities that work. We have at least one to two to work in all of our restaurants, to work in the front lobby, uh, to give them jobs, to give them training. Uh, that's an important part of what we do. Uh, our Ronald McDonald House, we have donated on the Eastern Shore, well over $100,000 to different uh, community events here on the Eastern Shore. Uh, that's an important part of what we do. We're active with the Providence Center, which is another activity that we do with, uh, with kids with disabilities. Um, I met with uh, Jody Schultz recently. Uh, I made a, a partnership with him, a commitment to him. And uh, I could tell you that we're going to do a bigger partnership with him than probably any business on, on Ken Island. And uh, it's something that I feel strongly about. I have a long history with Ken Island. Uh, a dear friend of mine owned the Ken Island restaurant 20 years ago before he sold it to the company. And when I used to come back from the Eastern Shore uh, with my wife, we used to jump in the kitchen and help help, help him on Sunday nights because they, they were busy. So I know Ken Island. I go back 20 years with Ken Island. Uh, I was going to ask, Jerry, could, could, could I ask you about the deliveries? Because I know that's something the Planning Commission is always interested in. What type of trucks, how often, yeah, so, and in so, your estimation, can they circulate the parking yeah, so, in there? So we get a uh, truck delivery uh, once a week. Um, Tractor trailer delivery. Yeah, once a, once a week, and I believe there's space between in the back part of the restaurant between the drive-through and the restaurant where that truck could pull in, and we always want to have that truck in on off hours. So sometimes we'll get that delivery at maybe 12, 12 o'clock at night, one in the morning. Sometimes three or four in the morning, because you know obviously we don't want to unload that truck and to have that you know with with the traffic in the peak hours. So we always get that truck in off hours, uh, either late at night or really early in the morning, and there's a dedicated space for it. Uh, also, I don't know if you have an interest in this, but the way the trucks are now, you don't even unload it uh, piece by piece. They have pallets, and you just pull the pallets out, and you bring them in, and you put them into the restaurant. Um, and the other thing that, uh, and again, this is a, an emotional thing for me, is our culture in our, in, our, in our restaurants, in our organization, is we run restaurants. We actually are cooking the food. 
doesn't appear miraculously. You know, we cook the food, we serve the food, and our culture is we, run, we, we want to run great restaurants. Yeah, they're called McDonald's, but essentially they're a restaurant. And that's the culture that we have in our restaurants. You know, it's no different than any other restaurant. You know, we get the food, we cook the food, we want to have great service, clean restaurants, and run the restaurant at a very high level. Uh, we have some of our managers here. We have a multiple of our managers here. Three or th four, three of them have been with me over 15 years, and they've won the highest awards that you could win in McDonald's for running restaurants. Uh, my uh, director of operations has li lived her whole life in Queens Anne County. She's been in McDonald's for over 25, 30 years. And she would be the director of this restaurant. So, I, I, but I, it's just important for me to uh, relate to you that that's really the culture that we have. You know, we run great restaurants. Yes, they're called McDonald's, but they're restaurants. No more and no less. And we are gonna be locally owned. Uh, our people live in the community. I live 15 minutes from this, the restaurant. And, uh, you know, I think that's important that everybody understand. All right. All right. You, I have okay. a couple. Mm -hmm. Is it Mr. How do you say your last name? Gimbalsta? Jerry. <laughs> That'll be easier for you. <laughs> I get it right. Okay. Mr. Jerry, um, you said delivery at approximately 1 a.m. and then you mentioned off hours. What are your expected hours of operation? Right now, I think we're going to operate at 24 hours. <laughs> How many people do you employ? Right now? If you were to have this McDonald's, how many employees would there be? We're, we would probably have anywhere between 55 and 65, 70 people. So overall, right now, with all our restaurants, we employ close to 500 people. Really and, just interested okay, in Okay. And just to let you know, so all these people uh, on our on management level, on the crew level, are offered insurance benefits, vacation benefits, bonus benefits, and I think that's why we've had such high retention rates in our organization. So understand, and I don't think a lot of people understand this. We're like I, I don't own the one on Ken Island. That's a company-run store. That's a different operation. I'm locally owned. Anybody need anything? They all they got to do is pick the phone up, and they could speak with me. You know, I'm not some mysterious company in Chicago. Yeah, I'm here, my wife is here, my kids work in a restaurant. You know, that, it's a locally owned restaurant. Okay. I don't have anything further. Yeah, I would just like to say one thing about the design of the building. So I was involved with the design of the building and it was important for me that that building look really sharp and look where it belongs. And, you know, I think we made a really nice uh, restaurant. And I could tell you this as a fact, there's not another McDonald's in the country that would look like this, because this was a unique design that we worked with the company. I worked with them on uh, what we wanted to do. And I think it came out pretty good. It's not the same exact setup, but you said you're in your restaurants every now and then, right here behind us, McDonald's. How, how often do you, do you experience cars stacking up in the road trying to get into your restaurant or stacking up trying to get back on 213? You're talking at the Centerville restaurant? Right here, yeah. Yeah, we don't have, I don't think we've had a problem with that at all. My manager is actually here from that restaurant and is uh, the supervisor. Sure. Now? Yeah. 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 Shannon, the way you come in, it's better than that's worse than that. The demographics in Centerville are extremely different. So this is the manager, and Shannon is my supervisor. Do you know how much traffic to density from Centerville to Ken Island. I think it's, I think it's the, the beach traffic. I, I'm, I'm curious as to how often you get traffic stacked up outside your parking lot in the uh, McDonald's. Here at the Centerville location. Can you identify yourself? I'm sorry, my name is Randy Epling. Thank you. Um, and I'm a general manager for Jerry's group. Um, I've been working in and out of Centerville for you know, the last year or so. Um, at the Centerville location, uh, there are times during the lunch period where we do have considerable backup that goes up into the shopping center main entrance. Um, my experience with the two-lane drive-through, like in Chestertown, uh, we had experiences where it went out the shopping center to 213. But with the two-lane drive-through, it considerably dropped that uh, vehicle queue down um, because we had that second lane that was able to double the capacity. Yeah, Centerville so only has a single lane. Chestertown, uh, 
Well, that's, that's uh, why. Can I, uh, can I was have two lanes? Because it's not the same. Because it's not the same. Going back yeah. out yeah. Right. With the single lane drive through, you have a longer queue with the double lane. It significantly brings that down and allows your queue to actually be longer with no considerable impact to the um, entrance to the site or to the uh, uh, shopping center itself. How, big, how many cars could you queue here in Centerville with the single lane? Um, here, it's single lane uh, from the order point, uh, probably only five or seven before it impacts uh, traffic to the site. Mm -hmm. um, in Chestertown, which has a similar queue size, but now has a two-lane drive-through, you're looking at 15 cars before you have any impact on uh, traffic into the site. Yeah, the, the, the double lane really, really uh, is, is really efficient. It really works uh, very efficient. I agree with you. The, um, I go to the bank in the uh, shopping center at Chestertown. And since you redid that McDonald's, oh, you're it, 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 it's it's a much nicer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there. so yeah. so that was just so you know the background. That was a company restaurant. That was a corporate restaurant. I purchased it. We rebuilt it. We put the double drive through in. We redid everything. Actually, if you remember, I mean, we completely redid everything. And uh, so I think you could have a feel for how what or how we do things. Okay. I'm from Centerville. I frequent this shopping center quite a bit and I don't think there's any traffic problem at McDonald's Coles. Yeah. 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 You know, as a drive through business we're a little bit more passionate about keeping that line down too so we have a little bit more <laughs> that means we're coming through. I mean, I mean honestly and this is with any restaurant honestly you know operations are important on how efficiently you're going to run it you know how efficient you're going to run the inside and the outside that I, I can only speak for me personally. I'm not concerned with your food or your drive through. I'm concerned with the traffic that is going to exit on my street every day. Yeah, I understand. And especially on Saturdays. I work in the city, so I drive, when I say city, Baltimore City, so I drive every day. So. And that circle, and then to get to your entrance, which is very slow moving now, I couldn't agree with you more. Same with probably that side of the gas station entrance off of that service road or Thompson Creek Road or whatever we're calling it these days, that yeah. one that runs. You know, something, and this is just common sense, I think we all could, uh, recognize this because, like, I'm so super familiar with the area and you live there. So I don't think we're going to have an issue with big trucks or anything like that because all the big trucks and everything, they're pulling into Cracker Barrel. And if you go into Cracker Barrel, they actually have, like, you know, home uh, rigs that, you know, stay there overnight. And, we're, and that I think that we're concerned with the additional traffic. Yes, we have a problem. I, I'm not saying that we have yeah. a problem. I, I love Cracker Barrel as much as I love McDonald's. Yeah. I'm American I understand. Jane. But that being said, I think that we're anxious about the extra traffic that you're going to bring to our circle. So, and especially during peak hours. As I said, King Island is very unique to Queen Anne's County and probably the state. And I, and I, I understand that. And I understand that. Uh, one thing I would say to that is I think this McDonald's, unlike the one on Kent Island uh, on the other side, I think this McDonald's is going to have more local business than the uh, transients because a lot of the transients coming to the beach are going to hit the, uh, the Bay Bridge McDonald's on that side uh, of the bridge. Do you follow what I mean? Uh, the, yep, that's probably the busiest so, McDonald's yeah. I've heard. No, it's and one of the busiest. In the, not anymore. Used, used to be, be before they cut the road. And our yeah. Cracker Barrel yeah. is also yeah. noted. Yeah, yeah. but that, that McDonald's is, has cut off. But my point is, I think that McDonald's is going to get a lot of the beach traffic. This McDonald's, just so you know, which it's half the size of the current restaurant. I mean, it's half the size of it. This McDonald's is considerably smaller. Like, like. Have you considered not having a drive through? No. That's a high percentage of your business, isn't it? Right. Yeah, it's a high percentage of your business. Plus, if you don't have the drive through you're going to have even more traffic right. with people parking and backing up out of there. Okay. I'm, I'm not asking a question. Okay. Um, unless there's other questions. Oh, I just want here. to, you know, have you folks have a feel that this is a going to be a different animal than okay. what's on Kenan. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks All right. Very we're going to take thank public you. comment now. I'm going to call uh, two names at a time. If whoever is first will come up and sit down and the other person sit down next to them. When they're done, I'll call the next person and we'll keep people rolling through there. You have three. Yes. Um, you have uh, three minutes to tell us anything you would like. Um, and we will start off with uh, my glasses. Uh, Timothy Thomas and Terry Ringel. 
Our clock is broken one not minute. working. Okay. I got it. Oh. Okay, thank you. Can we put the traffic map back up? Sure. Oh, I sure. think we un understand. Um, you mean, the, I don't think you had a traffic map. I think you just had a site plan. It's still up there. Yeah, I think it's just a site plan. If, if whoever's going to speak, um, you, need to, you need to be at a mic and identify yourself. My name's Timothy Thomas. I live in uh, Cox Creek Landing. Is that, is that one good? Yeah, that's the one that was talking about circulation. It's okay. Um, first of all, it was interesting that they chose this particular intersection to do their traffic study. Um, this service road comes all the way up to uh, Route 8. Route 8 services well over a thousand homes that have no, no shopping, nothing, except to come up Route 8 and come down this service road, hit Kmart over here, come into the post office, into the main, main entrance, and hit the food line. <clears throat> From there, they'll roll out of this, of this main entrance and come down this way, past the entrance that they studied, hit this circle, which is interesting, and, and a lot of times go to a lot of other locations because they don't have any other, any other services off of Route 8, so they need to, you know, go to the post office, they'll, they'll go to another store, uh, they'll go to uh, another gas station, they'll go to lots of other locations during that, during that trip. So to use this intersection, uh, which, by the way, really only serviced uh, primarily ours, which, which wasn't open 24 hours a day, um, just isn't a, a, an adequate study. This circle, um, the circle has uh, inherent problems. It's way too small. Um, you have people rolling down Route 50 and coming in here not really realizing that they need to actually yield. Um, People don't understand that they need to actually yield to the people that are in the circle. Many of the people on weekends <clears throat> are coming to Cracker Barrel. They have no idea where Cracker Barrel is, and they're looking around like a deer in the headlights while they're circling around the circle. Um, it, it's unbelievable. Additionally, as you come, as you come down uh, the service road, Thompson Creek down here services... Uh, Cox Creek Landing, uh, Anchorage, uh, there's several single family homes, there's a whole uh, uh, condo community, there's well over 200 homes back there, okay? I mean 200 homes if you take the average household has 1.5 children, that's 300 children. And to me, McDonald's, nothing against McDonald's, but in this particular situation, I believe from a liability standpoint, they're, they're an attractive nuisance. Um, 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay. You can do uh, just the marina, the little public landing down there, which is also brings in a lot of traffic. It does. It does. Hours. It does. Now, as far as as far as uh, emergency vehicles, they can't. There's a there's a Zodiac uh, here that has tractor trailers coming down Thompson Creek Road. There's another large marine warehouse that has tractor trailers coming down. They can't make that turn. They actually. Ten, ten seconds. They actually roll through the middle of the intersection to get around to go down Thompson Creek Road. What's a large fire truck going to do? Okay. You have children that are going to be walking up this service road. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we have a lot of people to speak. Okay. And we'll be here till midnight or later. If All right. Well, we go thank you. I've been here since 730 this morning, by the way. Yeah. So. As have we. Thank you. <laughs> Let them speak. <laughs> change the right. tape. Uh, change the tape. Monger, change the tape. Change Chairman, tape. we got to change the tape. Judy, you, you'll be next. Judy Monger. Yeah. After Terry. Uh, uh, before, before you're Terry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before you start, I just want to say that Jody Schultz was here earlier. And he had to leave. He said he did meet with the uh, McDonald's reps uh, to con, you know, to, to convey the fact that they're more than willing to work with him. And he also had no comment on if he thought this was an unsafe or safe environment uh, for his first responder personnel. Okay, my name is Terry Ringold. I've lived on Ken Island for 13 years. I live down Route 8. I use the stores and the road of the proposed McDonald's. I have great concerns. The parking area is quite congested and difficult to maneuver no matter how you look at it. The parking, there's also, I noted on the site map that there is parking behind the shopping center, which I rarely see people use. So if that's included in the 507, 
um, they're sort of useless little places. Um, there's no area for cars to line up at the drive up. Yes, it's going to be two lanes. I still have great fear that it's going to encompass the entirety of uh, Thompson Creek Road. Um, where would the large tr trucks park? You say, oh, maybe they'll only go to Cracker Barrel. I don't believe that for a second. They're going to be parking here and there and everywhere. Uh, we have wind warnings on that bridge every other day. And the last time it happened, they were parked everywhere. You couldn't see around them. It was really an unsafe situation. Um, the trucks, like everybody else says, they drive right over that traffic circle to get to Cracker Barrel now. Um, it, it's kind of calling it a circle is questionable. On summer weekends, um, we can't get any place on summer weekends, and that is the only place that I can get to that it doesn't take me 45 minutes to get back from or 45 minutes to get to. Um, it's got a grocery store. It's got my post office, things like that. Um, the traffic study, when it was done, um, the peak times I noticed it really had very little to do when the peak times are around here. Many people work over the bridge. When they get back here, it's not 4 to 6 p.m. Get real. People are going to the grocery store and doing all their shopping and everything at 7 o'clock at night. On the weekends, um, 11 to 2, well, that's really nice, except that we have horrible traffic from 10 in the morning to 7 in the evening. So I don't think that um, really followed it. Our worst evenings are Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays in the evening. Neither, none of those times were ever even looked into. Um, and also, when he was saying the number of visits to this new store, um, he used some sort of a calculation that involved um, the number of communities and the number of homes in the communities and determined that. But most of, our, most of the traffic, I believe, going to that McDonald's is going to be flow-through traffic. They don't live here. They don't, they're not going to go to the other stores. They're coming here. They're going to eat at the McDonald's, and they're going to take off, and it's just going to be a huge mess. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Judy Monger and um, someone, German. Jackie. Jackie, thank you. Yes, hello. I'm Judy Monger, and my family owns Ars Americantina. And since Mr. Jerry could get emotional, I would like to get emotional um, and tell you a little, about, a little bit about my family and how we got into this restaurant. Um, my daughter and her husband had um, invested in Ars Americantina and soon found out that the previous owner was not paying bills, running it into the ground. The liquor license was not going to be renewed. So they went through the courts and they took over. And we have worked for two years to build this business back up. And we are running fine now. And then we get this hit in our face. We have no idea how this ever happened because we started hearing rumors back in December, January, we called the county, we called Hyatt, and nobody wanted to tell us anything. Finally, we got a little bit of information which said, well, you know, it's a minor site um, plan. We don't really have to have any kind of public meetings or anything as long as they're going according to the rules and regulations. We can't say no. Well, I have some um, petitions here, and these are about the traffic. I have 521 signatures. I have 608 electronic signatures. I have some comments, but most of these are, you know, they'd rather not have another McDonald's. But also on our website, I hear we have 10,000 people that went on there to express, you know, their concern. Because we live in the community. We do community events. Uh, some of them are Bosom Buddies, Kent Island Fire Company, United Communities Fire Company, Chesapeake Cats and Dogs. We do fundraisers for a lot of sporting teams. The local schools have, have a night where between 5 and 7 we give them 10% of what we make in the bar area and the restaurant. And, uh, you know, we feel that we're part of the community and the community supports us. And most of the people that are coming, that are going to fly into the McDonald's are just passing through. They're hungry. They want to get food. They're leaving. And we are very concerned about the traffic. And we're also concerned, one of the reasons why we took over was because we didn't want those people that work there to lose their jobs. And we wanted to build the business back up, of course, try to get our money back that we had invested in it. 
but mainly, you know, <coughs> we wanted to keep those people employed. Now, we don't have as many as McDonald's will have. Right now, we have 16 full-time and 20 part-time. We did have more than that, but when this came up, we lost people because they're concerned. You know, what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? And, you know, we have people that are hanging in there with us, but we don't know what to tell them. So, I'm sorry, but... I'll let, I'll let some other people talk about it facts but this is personal thank you I just could I ask you a question yes so you don't own the building you've been leasing the building right. correct so I'm just curious as to what you you know obviously has your lease expired or well, what kind of lease did we're you on a month you, to month only because when we took over well the first year it was a year but we didn't know if we were going to be able to pull this restaurant back together because it was so bad that they owed everybody. They weren't going to renew the liquor license. They owed well over $100,000 to the state. We actually had to apply for our own liquor license so we wouldn't be tied to that other one. And they agreed to do that for us. And, you know, we, we just... I don't think McDonald's came along and said, hey, that's a, that looks like a pretty good place. I think... Our landlord Hyatt contacted McDonald's and said, hey, I could probably have a building empty for you over here if you want to tear it down and rebuild. Because Hyatt did not want to tell us anything. And all they said to us was, well, you know, all we have to do is give you 30 days to vacate. So we own everything in the building. We own the air conditioners on the roof. We own everything except the shell. So what are we supposed to do with all of that equipment? Well, just to dovetail. So you're on a month-to-month -month lease well, right now? Right now, right yes. Well, it just renewed in... It, well, yeah, why didn't you, you, you renew would, you by would, the year? Well, and they and didn't. assuming that the McDonald's does not get approved, your landlord then can still yes. evict you within 30 days, correct? They wouldn't give us more than a 30-day. But at most point, we just renewed on May 1st, or April 30th. Okay. So we're on a month-to-month. -month. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, would you like to have these signatures? It's up to you, ma'am, if you'd and like. And these are all related to the traffic, traffic situation. Thank you. Okay, and while uh, Jackie is speaking, um, maybe Mike Wilton. Um, I've been here over in Ken well, Island. Second, if he's not here, call somebody else. And Jackie, can you give us her last name? Sure. Jake Herman. Um, it's Jackie Herman, H-U-R-M-A-N, and I reside at 145 Main Sale Drive in Anchorage and also own a property in Creekside Commons, a condo over there. I've been here for 15 years, and I want to discuss the, mainly the traffic and the flow of the traffic through that circle. We call it the psycho circle in our family because it is so bad as it stands now. Today when we came here, there was one pylon still standing out of the eight. One pylon. Means people have run over them, run through them. So there's obviously a problem that needs to be addressed. Whether ours is there, which I certainly hope they are because they're our local restaurant. We are loyal patrons to them. We support their charities. We can walk there. We ride our bikes there, so on and so forth. Um, they're great for our community. Our kids, go, our kids go there for fundraisers. And I think what's happening here is, is awful. It's not that it, we don't like McDonald's or think that's a beautiful plan, but I can guarantee you it won't be somewhere that, that we would frequent. Uh, in our in my community where I live and I just don't think there needs to be another McDonald's on this island we're being polluted with more commercial businesses more commercial businesses when we moved over here it was supposed to be we called it the land of pleasant living it was very rural and now we're just polluted with more and more commercial businesses strip malls and I just I think at some point those who have the power need to address that and stop move it further out there's, there's no reason the McDonald's can't be further out of Kent Island, Graysonville, or further. All, all the access of the beach traffic, they'll still have that business. But I don't want, I really do not want to see McDonald's go up where I live. I look at a Cracker Barrel now. And that's all I have. Jake Herman, Dwayne Atkins, Peter Mullingard. Right ahead, young man. I live on right around there. And if I had your job, I would do
do whatever I could to help the community, my family, and all my friends. And I already have a Cracker Barrel in my backyard. I do not need a McDonald's. And that's all. Thank you very Thank you. much. Hi, my name is uh, Peter Mullenhart. I uh, live in Thompson Creek Colony, which is one of the condominiums that's right off Marion Quimby Drive. Um, and I also uh, am on the board of uh, directors for the, uh, for the condo association. Uh, the circle that everybody is talking about, that's our only access to anywhere we want to go on the island or off the island. There are no other access points. We go through that circle to either go east or west. Uh, it is totally inadequate. It's too small as it is now. Uh, you've heard from everybody basically of people coming off at that circle and you and you have you currently have the road that's shown here you have the uh, the people coming off the road there's gas stations on both sides just beyond the one gas station is the Cracker Barrel and then there's another small strip strip mall with a few stores in it beyond that all of those people converge within probably about five car links six car links on that Thompson Creek Road there and whenever you're going through there, it's, it's like running the gauntlet. It's just the most dangerous thing you can do because you have large trucks that are making lefts or making rights into either the gas stations or into the, uh, into the uh, uh, Cracker Barrel. You also have people that are not familiar with the island because most of the people getting off there are going to the fast food places like Cracker Barrel or the proposed McDonald's, as they're saying here, and they don't understand the whole traffic flow so they're looking around and it's just a real nightmare and i believe based on what, I, what i've heard here today that the traffic study was really totally inadequate and i ask all of you to actually go there and see what it's like to go through that circle because that circle is is you can fit that whole circle within this space right here that's how small this traffic circle is how often are there accidents there that you see I have not seen that many accidents there. I mean, I, I will admit to that. I've seen a lot of near accidents there. Uh, I've seen a number of people that have driven through and run over the pylons, and you see the remnants of accidents it look like small fender benders because they're, you see uh, parts of light, you know, headlights or taillights and stuff there. So. And do you spend, um, how many days a week do you spend stacked in traffic to get into the circle? I mean, we, you see, our problem here is that we have an expert telling us that it functions at an A level, and we have you telling us it doesn't function at all. Right. The, so, so I'm trying to, to, to get to as, as the expert said, the function of a traffic circle is such that you're never supposed to have to stack up at a traffic circle, pretty much. What happens at that traffic circle is, because the people that don't understand how to use a traffic circle, because they are mostly transients moving through the area, some will stop before they get to the traffic circle, and sit there even though they have the right of way because they're looking to see if anybody else is around and then when somebody gets in the circle they'll keep sitting there until finally nobody leaves is in the circle anymore then they'll move through so probably when I go through if it's a busy day on a weekend uh, it's not uncommon to sit there for, for you know two or three cars stacked up for for a little while until somebody decides who's supposed to go into that traffic circle I mean it 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 is Traffic circles are not a bad thing, but when you get a traffic circle that small, it's really difficult because people don't understand it. And people are entering that circle at such high speed coming off of Route 50 or coming down the access roads that there's no, there's no deceleration or acceleration there as you either get on or get off because you're, you're basically coming in, people come in at high speed. And if you go into the circle, if they're coming in at high speed, they're right on top of you by the time you get into the circle because there's really no, no distance at all there. And, and it, like I said, I, I'm in the condo association. Our whole community is back there, and that's where we have to go. We can't go anywhere without going through that circle. And, and it is, since, uh, since Cracker Barrel moved in, it's gotten much, much worse because the uh -huh. Cracker Barrel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Laura, Nickman, and Stan Rudy. Megan, Robert. Don Robert. I'm not Laura. Go ahead, you're up. Uh, okay, um, my name is Stan Rudy. Um, I wanted to just bring up a, 
uh, procedural issue is that uh, there are a lot of people that came at 11 o'clock or before expecting to be heard and that at the very least I would hope that this board would delay their decision for a couple of weeks leave the record open for those who have not been able to be heard today um, I love McDonald's too it is an, an emotional issue for me I hold McDonald's in my heart right here it's uh, the cholesterol and uh, uh, I don't know if you would hold um, McDonald's as in general as a uh, hazard to uh, community health but um, it does it will change the character of the neighborhood and the area uh, it will lower property values because people will not want to be uh, having to say to people turn left at the McDonald's turn right at the McDonald's and watch out in the circle and try to get down the road after you're being extra careful um, there are some flaws in the traffic study um, this the um, chart that's up here if I may um, is showing three lanes uh, on the service road there's there's two lanes now so I don't know if they have asked to put in a, an extra lane they did say that at some times when they get deliveries they're going to have a tractor trailer block this area here at the bottom which is the fire lane so um, some other um, uh, plan needs to be devised where they can get service and I don't see a service building in here uh, another problem is that uh, the present use um, is that the post office stores trucks here 24 hours. They have over a dozen trucks uh, at night, um, which means that the people who are going to use this, the traffic that's being counted is behind the building in the alley, which no one knows is there, or it's uh, maybe, I'm not sure, a half a mile away in front of the food line that's being counted as parking for this. So people who are local that are not going to be driving through it are going to be parking eons very far away and uh, there's no uh, crosswalks, sidewalks they could be um, asked to put in sidewalks on the service road so that people could go from parking or at least crosswalks or expand this crosswalk. Other than the safety issue the um, developer is displacing existing businesses and um, is creating a hardship for these the people that uh, do own as you've heard these other businesses um, the uh, other part of the traffic study is that it's um, uh, in all due respect to this study I'm, I'm surprised the, the gentleman did not have the uh, numbers that the new McDonald's is going to produce so you might consider independently going and uh, to the McDonald's that's there, or the one in Chestertown you'll see that it's in a huge parking lot where if the traffic backs up as they said on the 213 uh, or on, onto uh, the service road that would gridlock the island and that traffic circle you wouldn't be able to it could, could back up traffic and so the, sir, the traffic study needs to be improved from C and he said pretty good to uh, something I know I just want to point out too that I think that that's a turn lane I mean I don't necessarily think that it's designated but there, we do use two there just um, so you know President M McClellan, it, it's a, a, it wasn't a question no, right, right. no there's a lot of people I, waiting I, I, no I, I do have a question for you you, you indicated that uh, property values would fall is that just your opinion or do you have some um, read a study somewhere that you could provide to us any information on that let me get you some information about the site in West Street of Annapolis. I, Thank I do you. have some information about that, yes. Okay, and uh, you're Megan, is that correct? Megan Robert, uh, yes. Is, is John Robert going to speak? Yes. You can come on up. Go right ahead. Me or him? You, you first. All right. You're here. Um, good afternoon. I, um, I've written and rewritten, and I'm probably just going to go off the cuff now and stay within three minutes. Uh, my name is Megan Robert. I am an active voter. I'm a mother of an employee that does work at ours who tried for a year and a half to find employment and was unsuccessful before they finally went to ours. Um, I'm also a resident off of Thompson Creek, um, and I'm a 20-year veteran of law enforcement from Prince George's County. So I come to you today not as a mom and necessarily a citizen. I come before you today to talk once again about the circle of hell is what I call it. I am a professional driver. I have certifications to say such. I never in 20 years had an accident in a police cruiser. That's with coffee, talking on the radio, and driving about 100 miles an hour because I was busy in Prince George's County. 
the first time I went into that traffic circle, if I'm allowed to swear a little baby swear word, I'll say, holy hell. Okay, it is not in any way, shape, or form designed for a knowledgeable, experienced driver to understand what is uh, needed of them. In every traffic law book, which is this thick, it always says the right of way comes from a major highway. It's there. I'm surprised there's no trooper here. I'm surprised there's no sheriff's department representative here. I'm shocked, actually. I'm actually a little bit annoyed because I pay their taxes. I heard that 20 years. It was nice to finally say that. But the, the problem with that is you have a too small circle that's not wide enough in the lane, it's not marked enough well from Route 50 coming off, and it's not expected. It is not expected. You're coming from 50, 60 miles an hour down to, you really have to be going about seven miles an hour to do it well, or else, yes, the cones will pop off, um, or more. Um, it is expected to give the right of way coming off a major highway. We teach our kids this. You also yield the right of way to going right. You have both of those situations, and yet still professional seasoned drivers have that Maalox moment every single day at that intersection. I believe anyone who lives off that road, we are all now ambassadors, the friendly drivers, because we're yielding their insanity or their confusion or their moment they're stunned they don't know what to do in the circle so we're yielding because we're used to it at this point but it's it's not funny it's not amusing because at this point you do see car parts around there you do see the cones off i see the big state highway administration that we can't get statistics from because i drive for two weeks also and i know who to call you can't get them just like you can't get how many people jumped off the bridge last month you can't get them they don't give them out so I ask anyone who's about to approve this, just do it on your own because you live here. You all live here. Park at the, get a coffee at the local place. Watch it. Don't watch it long. Watch it for five minutes. Watch it. What precinct? You'll get it there. Prince, I did domestic violence at Prince George County Sheriff's Office. Um, and also, Jackie forgot to tell you she was in an accident at that intersection. I don't know why she didn't say it. So, um... I All right, conclude. Perry Otwell, you can come up as well. Uh, He's a McCrone. Nick Star. Store. You can go right ahead. Before my time starts, I just want to say I, I do have uh, studies that, that I can provide to you on citations about the volume generated by a McDonald's on average, um, dating back to 1980, and it's the same ITE organization that generated it. Um, their statistics show that about it generates about 700 additional trips. Um, more recently, the city of Durham did a study for this very purpose, similar hearing to this, and they determined that in their particular location, which was a little more urban, that it generated roughly 400 additional trips on average. Is that per hour, uh, per, per day? Uh, per day. So at, at peak times, um, there, and I'll, I'll get to that in my remarks, but you could dig into the details of the study. If you want that, I would offer it. So I, I can if, provide if you the citation. If you believe that it's substantially different than what we heard, I, I don't think it is. I believe I you have not heard anything to do with the numbers that are going to be generated in addition to what was observed. Because that, bear in mind, that's steady state. What was provided is steady state. What go, they didn't right tell ahead. you is, is, your, is you, the addition. Your three On minutes. the clock. Okay. <laughs> All right, Commissioners. I'm John Robert. I live uh, with my lovely wife, Megan, who you just met. Uh, many of us in the immediate vicinity of the proposed project, as well as the community at large, have very significant concerns about this project. I am specifically concerned about the impact of traffic on the local area, and I have concerns about the traffic study that was conducted as well. This is an especially important and critical aspect of this entire endeavor, especially in light of the fact that we had a 14-year-old local young man, Gage, who was killed during peak traffic season a few years ago, on the side of the very roadway that most will use to access the proposed McDonald's location. Specifically, I find it troubling that the traffic study, um, it was dated November, there were different dates proffered for when it was conducted, uh, but we all know that peak traffic season is approximately May to September in our area, with an estimated 800,000 additional vehicles transiting the Bay Bridge on peak weekends alone, such as Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, and that's according to the Maryland Transportation Administration. And that's just on a weekend, on one of those weekends, 800,000 additional cars. Make no mistake, McDonald's accounted for this additional traffic in their business plan, and it is the very reason they wanted to desperately place McDonald's on this site. So why would they seek to conduct a traffic study at one of the low, slowest times of the year when their real business interest is in the traffic at peak times of the year and they haven't talked about? 
I think we all know the answer, and that is that any traffic study which was done during peak travel season and therefore showed us the true impact of the proposed project would have shown you numbers that would never result in approval of this project in Queen Anne's County. The plain fact is the study does not account for the additional traffic, commonly referred to as beach traffic, and the results of the study therefore cannot be considered statistically valid for your purposes. Additionally, I would like to point out discrepancies in the numbers generated for the Cracker Barrel traffic study and this one. Do we really believe that the number one gross in Cracker Barrel in the eastern United States has had no impact, no impact upon traffic in that area? Because if you take the numbers for the study you were presented, you would have to accept that conclusion. I don't believe that's the case. Uh, has the Planning Commission compared the two documents to identify any discrepancies before you make a potentially unalterable decision affecting potentially thousands of Queen Anne County residents? If you have not, then you should not make any decision on this project until you've done so and have assured yourselves that you truly and fully assess the worst potential impact of this project and at its very worst, you deem it both acceptable and in the public interest of the citizens of Queen Anne County. In addition to public interest and the specific results of the traffic study, I think the following questions are important to the public. Is the study area large enough to include all significant impacts from development? Does it include all critical intersections? Were traffic counts taken during critical times? Are traffic counts recent? Have all assumptions used in techno technical analysis been clearly identified? Do calculate. Right. Yeah. 15 seconds, Mr. Rapid. Wrap up anything okay, else you well, can tell me. Okay, uh, wrapping up some of the flaws in traffic study were pointed out. What I would say to you is you don't have the available information you need to make a decision. You could either table this or you could say no, but you don't have what you need factually to make a decision in the best interest of this county. And I'll come back at the end to give more remarks if I need to, and I can't provide you those citations I offered earlier, but those are uh, seminal documents and authoritative sources that I can provide to you. Okay, Any questions? You. Nope. Um, Bridget Lun Lunfeld? Right ahead. Hi, I'm Nick, Nick Storr. I live in Kerwin's Landing in Chester. Uh, I'm here, uh, I have a 40-year career in transportation, but uh, the thing that's relevant here is uh, I lived in Rockville for 30 years. Rockville is the county seat of Montgomery County. It's a, an incorporated city. We had our, uh, has a population of 60,000, has uh, well over 100 traffic lights. Uh, uh, I, I chaired the Transportation Commission there for several years. Uh, we ran into these kinds of problems often. Uh, we had several McDonald's. Uh, we, uh, we concluded, uh, based on data as I recall, uh, that uh, McDonald's tend to generate anywhere from three to five times as much traffic as comparable uh, fast food restaurants. You can do your own measurement by looking at the McDonald's on Kent Island uh, and uh, a quarter mile away is a Hardee's. Uh, clearly McDonald's has generated far more traffic uh, there. Uh, uh, I think this is a, a nice design, um, and McDonald's is a good product. I shop there. I, I eat there uh, from time to time. Um, but it's not the right place. Uh, the traffic circle that everyone's complained about uh, does not meet the standards of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. They have their own green book design standards for roundabouts and circles. Uh, this does not come close uh, to meeting those kinds of standards. The biggest one, which Mr. Roberts just mentioned, is so-called site distance uh, or intersection site distance, uh, which is how far in advance on a road can a driver anticipate there's a traffic circle and he has to, he or she has to modify their driving behavior. So if you're coming down Route 50 at 60 miles an hour and all of a sudden you want to turn off of Thompson, Thompson Creek Road and you find this little dorky traffic circle there, everybody gets confused. Uh, the other thing is that's not addressed here is people come around that if they want to go to the Sunoco station, they're going to have to turn left across traffic. The presentation earlier uh, by Mr. Healy assumed everybody leaving that the, the McDonald's will turn right to go someplace. What about all the thousand homes or more down Route 8 if they want to go back down past uh, Kmart to, and turn left and go down Route 8? They have to turn left getting out of McDonald's so that the numbers are all screwy. Uh, numbers are grossly understated, so that understates the magnitude of the problem you've got. Um, there's no comments in here from the State Highway, uh, uh, State Police. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Boardman, who lives uh, in uh, Marling Farm, uh, deals with the State Highway Administration all the time. They get involved in accident investigations. 
on Route 50. Uh, he would have a, a view, I would assume, of the problem on Route 50 of backup. There's a photo of the backup, of traffic that backs up going into uh, the current um, Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, shows traffic backing up onto Main Street. A similar kind of a, a U-turn to the right. So this is just a disaster. I will, pro I will type these up and make them available, but my recommendation is that you table this and advise the applicant to find another site uh, in Queen Anne's County. Do you have some um, studies that you can provide us to show that McDonald's has uh, four to five times the traffic of other, or is that your opinion? My recollection of the discussions that we had in, in when we were laying out, this is now tw over 20 years ago, that, uh, that McDonald's was a significant traffic generator. You, there was some discussion about the Chestertown situation and the Centerville situation compared to Kent Island. Uh, my daughter went to school at Washington College. I know those, those sites up, up this way. Those are not major thoroughfares. Neither Chestertown nor Centerville is on a six-lane interstate highway that would generates the kind of traffic that would feed this particular McDonald's. So that's apples and oranges to look at the traffic there. You could easily do your own comparisons by uh, getting traffic counts at Burger King or at Hardee's, uh, and co compare that with the existing McDonald's. But the numbers are significant. McDonald's does, uh, the Golden Arches have always generated a lot of traffic. And, um, and, and the configuration and the layout and the conflicts with all the other uh, stores and traffic movements in and around that shopping center uh, are going to create a, a traffic nightmare. I, I just got to ask because you do have a professional background here. You, I'm sure that you understand that we can only act on on facts that, that are presented to us. We, we don't go out and do traffic studies. We don't have that. Expertise. I understand that. We can't do that. And, and faced with a consultant that tells us that everything's operating fine, what is it that you would have us act upon? Your opinions, the public opinion? No, I, I, I can, I can, what can we, what I actually can we remember act? the name of our traffic engineer in Rockville. Rockville had its own traffic a, a expert, Joe Kutro. I can call him and, and he's still in business. He's now doing consulting for other, other uh, municipalities. There's a, there's a large amount of data that was not presented at all in, any, in the traffic studies that address those kinds of issues. And I, can, I will try to get my hands on some of those kinds of studies and make them available. Um, but I, I know, for example, the, the one that I mentioned about the inadequacy of that traffic circle, the reason everybody complains about it, because it is poorly designed. It's, it was not built by the State Highway Administration. It was built by the county. The, the county is not in the business of building traffic circles. I think it would perhaps would have been helpful when we're looking for facts. For example, if we were presented with just a it's an observation, perhaps photographs of the McDonald's on the other side of the highway at six o'clock p.m. on a Sunday in the middle of July, with cars backed up into the off the property but we don't have that I understand and I've been out of the country until Tuesday so I didn't know that this meeting was on I understand I'm not being until today I understand. but you know but uh, at any rate um, th that, that's a fair line of inquiry mm -hmm. I understand that perfectly um, in terms of the metrics of the, the key metric I mean you can talk about impervious area and landscaping and building design, but the real gut issue here is all about traffic issues. And there is virtually no discussion in the county's presentation at the beginning of this meeting about traffic issues. It was all about uh, square foot area ratios and things like that. Well, but so, to be fair, the, the county defers to the state to set those guidelines. The consultants have to do what the state guidelines tell them to do and then they present something that the state then gets to look at and once again we're faced with the situation where the, the experts and the governments above us are telling us this is going to be fine and I agree with you that that traffic circle is ridiculous but that is not enough for us to say some user can't can't be there unless someone can prove them to us that that user will create the problem that'll be the straw that breaks the camel's back or maybe there's some reasons that we should be looking at 
how do we improve what's there? Because whether McDonald's gets built or not, you all have told us you have a problem right now. So, you know, maybe that's what we should be looking at is how do you improve that long term, whether McDonald's goes in there or not. But anyway, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, Bridget, you're next, and then Mike Arms. Hi, I'm Bridget Lumpfout in Chester, and basically what I have to say, because I don't have facts, is irrelevant, but to say that that is, you know, a grade-A circle, I mean, I don't even know how a consultant could come up with that. I mean, it's just, it's insanity. I mean, I'm in there every other day, and somebody doesn't know what to do there. And what's going to happen is it's going to back up, it's going to cause more backup across the bridge, there's going to be fender benders left and right, and then the taxpayers are going to have to pay to fix that road after the fact. And, the, and, it, and I'm really just dittoing everything everybody else said because I'm all for a McDonald's further up the road. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have the rest of your time? Yep. Ellen Bennett, you'll be next after Mr. Arntz. Go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mike Arntz. I'm a resident of Chester, Maryland. Um, I think we've heard sufficient public outcry here today to at least encourage you as a uh, planning and zoning board to reevaluate this project. Um, you say that there's been people that have come, or experts or consultants that have said this is, that, that it's okay. Um, those consultants work for the franchise McDonald's that want to put this franchise there am I correct uh, that's like having an expert witness come to your trial and testify that the person's insane well they're gonna you know they're gonna say whatever that mr. Arch to be fair that would be like saying all loan officers falsify documents that's not true I'm not saying that I'm just saying that and then I and I and I, and I, and I take exception to that comment Barry um, however just as he should to yours well, <laughs> but does he not work for McDonald's that traffic circle is the main issue. Whether or not um, McDonald's goes in or not, I, I absolutely agree that, that something needs to be done with that. It needs to be moved. It needs, needs to be re-engineered. Um, Maryland 835A, which is the access road. <coughs> traffic circles, and, and everyone that I've ever seen, and I've seen them in Europe, I've seen them a lot of places, typically have a road coming in from north, south, east, west. What 835A does is it comes in parallel, or, or Route 50 comes parallel, basically. So you've got Route 50 and 835A coming up to that traffic circle at a, at a parallel. And then you get off the exit. I mean, any person with any amount of common sense would see that that's just not going to ever work. So you either need a slow down lane on 50 and a stop sign or a traffic signal to, to control that traffic as it comes in. Every roundabout ever in existence, the car to the left in, in America, where we drive on the right-hand side, has the right-of-way, but yet that traffic circle doesn't do that, does the opposite. If you're like me and you had a broken neck 25 years ago and you have limited mobility, in order to, to come to that traffic circle and, and go in there in a safe manner, you've literally got to turn in your seat and look back like this at, to see what cars might be coming off of Route 50 because they're coming off at 60 miles an hour. I, sp I had an opportunity to speak to Sheriff Hoffman at lunchtime on the phone. He, he told me that there's been two fatalities at Thompson Creek Road and he told me I could quote him in saying that he feels that unless something's done about that traffic circle and if a McDonald's is put in there that with the increased traffic that there will be an increase in accidents and ho hopefully not fatalities. So my recommendation to the board would be that you seek further studies or whatever it might take to show what the reality is of that traffic circle. And I have a solution to propose to McDonald's, and that would be that McDonald's voluntarily find a different location at any of the Graysonville exits a little further down the road. Thank you. I just want to point out from my recollection of driving that, that I do think there is a slowdown lane off of 50 and that there is notice on 50 of the circle. So while I realize the points you made, and I'm wondering, I can't remember for the life of me if there's those little rumble strips on 50 the, to get off, is there? If there's a slowdown lane there, it's there not is. very long. It's, and, it, I and, agree with that, but it is there. 
but I don't think the little those little rumble strips. It has small rumble strips. Does it? Small rumble strips. Thank you. You can take them at 60 miles an hour. I will. So I probably probably do. And and the the bottom line is, it's a dangerous, dangerous. I'm not disagreeing with you at all. The next time somebody gets killed there, shame on you. I just, you know, I want to make a note that it it seems like you know that circle and the traffic is an issue, and you know we've gone through similar things here at Route 304 in Centerville where we've lost young kids lives crossing over the highway um i love to see that everyone has gotten together and what we did in this community was went to the state and they've fought for over a year to get something to happen with that intersection so i'm just trying to figure out you know if the mcdonald's there is going to solve your traffic circle problem or we need to figure out something else for you guys to do to solve that problem for that circle yeah, okay, um, you're Miss Bennett, is there correct? Yes. And after that would be Kimberly Mills. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Helen Bennett, and I've only been in this area for three years. I came from Arlington, Virginia, and worked in D.C., so I'm familiar with traffic circles and traffic as well. And I was also in the Marine Corps, so I've driven some big vehicles. And I want to address the safety. I know you talk about that you want facts, but I'm not sure that the highway person, the, the traffic study person, did facts either he frequently just referenced we think we think we think the people that you're hearing from are here and we know we know we know what we see okay and so to i would think that your law enforcement officers the people who worked in the highway um they probably are just as much an expert and would stipulate i would stipulate that i think they're just as much an expert as maybe the traffic person who though i think that what he thinks is accurate we are seeing this stuff all the time and so the traffic concerns me. I have the traffic circle in Chester, and it's not a yield, as he's mentioned. People don't necessarily know how to use a traffic circle, and they don't yield. And it's frequently the people who live here, that the locals who stop and wait for people to circle the entire till there's nobody coming, and then they go. It's backed up frequently just from that. So it's not necessarily accidents, but traffic is bad. The two service roads are used whenever the Bay Bridge is backed up, which is pretty darn frequently. So in respect to Jerry being local, he's still Western Shore. He's not experiencing what we experience on this side. I experience traffic here like I never did in Arlington, um, and it should be more rural, and it's just not. Um, 7 to 9 a.m. is not peak time. There's no stores, I don't think, open in the mall at 7 to 9 a.m. for that entrance. So I'm not sure what, of course there's not any traffic. Why would I go to Thompson Creek Road when there's in the mall when there's nothing open at 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning? Um, regarding the neighborhood flavor, though, ours cantina, I'm not, I have no family, friends that work there, but I respect what they've done to this community. Um, there's not a whole lot. Our community is split down the middle with 50, and I can so respect and want to keep local stores who want to be a part of the community. Jerry has his share. It's no respect. Jerry, he has several stores, so he's doing okay. Ours Cantina does fundraisers, they participate, you can get free gift certificates, all kinds of stuff that, although he's not, doesn't own the other McDonald's, I've never seen them do anything for our community. And that's just so important. That's the neighborhood flavor that I think we want to keep in here and, and, and not with uh, corporate, because I do consider him corporate, four or five stores, it's kind of corporate, and he's not the Eastern Shore. So, but that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. After, uh Ms. Mills, Mark McConnell. Right ahead. Hi, my name is Kimberly Mills. I am a resident of Queen Anne's County. I also work at Ars Mary Cantina. I am a former employee of McDonald's. I left McDonald's Corporation to work at Ars because the pay was not sufficient for what I needed. Um, Ars Mary Cantina has followed me through the years, um, has supported my decision to go to college, get my degree, and has accommodated my schedule. Um, coming, commuting from across the bridge and arriving past my, I guess, tour of duty hours. Um, we do do a lot of community service and a lot of fundraiser, fundraisers in the community. We are a very diverse family. Um, we employ every, a diver, diverse religion, race, sex. Um, we have two special needs people that work there right now. Um, 16 full-time, 20 part-time. We used to have more and they all dropped off because they're unsure about their jobs um, and I just I can't imagine losing my job 
that I've had for six years since day one <coughs> and walking away from the wonderful people that I work with. Um, we're all a family. We're all in this together. We work together. We do fundraisers together. We're all here representing Ars America and Tina together. Um, and we are concerned about the community and the traffic together. Um, it was really hard for us to deal with the loss of Gage when he did um, get into that accident on Thompson Creek Service Road. Um, we, it's just, it's a really big issue to us because we know how big the building is and how big McDonald's is. And to put that in a shopping center that the shops are so close together with the post office as well. Um, you can look at the McDonald's in Centerville and the McDonald's in Chestertown and see that they all have their space centered pretty much far away from the Food Lion and from, I guess it was the Super Fresh and the movie theaters in Chestertown. Um, this shopping center obviously will not be like that. It's going to be closer to the shops, closer to the road, and more traffic since you have the Bay Bridge traffic and people commuting to Ocean City. So with that, I ask that you guys please, you know, taking personal consideration and the bridge traffic and the, the overall traffic issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next will be, um, after Mr. McConnell, uh, Janine Mullenhardt. But we had him already. Oh, white. Okay. My name is Mark McConnell, and I'm, uh, I live in Annapolis, Maryland, and I'm not here to talk about the traffic circle. I'm not here to talk about the traffic. Uh, but I am here to tell you that I've known the operator of these restaurants for over a decade. Uh, our families have known each other for over two decades. And um, I think it's important that what Jerry was saying about being a family-owned business, I've seen, uh, I've seen him run his business. I've seen him and his wife, Sandy, run their business uh, day and night, uh, Monday through Monday, so, you know, seven days a week. When the ice machine breaks on West Street, they're the ones going out to buy ice from whoever it is that has ice. It's not a, it's not a big corporation. It's not, it's not a megalith. It's not a faceless, nameless group of people. Um, I know that they employ dozens of people at these restaurants, particularly, as Jerry mentioned, the developmentally challenged kids through ARC, who I have a personal stake in personal relationships with a couple of them. And I just want to say that that type of community effort, that's a community effort, and that type of effort has changed lives, at least in the stores where, uh, where Jerry operates. And I'd just like to close with complimenting you guys on challenging the architects and planners to come up with something that is uniquely Kent Island. I think this design is, uh, I think it's pretty appealing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ms. Mullenhardt will be Robert Mills. Go right ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Janine Mullenhard. I'm a family nurse practitioner and a resident of Thompson Creek Colony. You heard from my husband earlier about the traffic circle. I'm not going to talk about the traffic circle. He already said everything. But what I would like to address with you, though, is um, some concerns about public health and safety with the addition of the McDonald's. The traffic study, although it was presented well, did not take into account but traffic, pedestrian traffic. There are a number of communities, as you've heard, behind that shopping center, and a number of people walk to that shopping center. With the addition of, on a Saturday, potentially 160 additional visits to that shopping center, there is increased risk for pedestrian safety. Um, there was no mention of looking at sidewalks and what the traffic flow would be like if you're coming off of Marion Quimby. There's also that. Um, the back entrance, what I call the back entrance, that leaves the shopping center out onto Marion Quimby, the road that kind of comes and snakes around back to the condo communities. As the traffic, I fear, may back up at that traffic circle that we won't talk about, people will figure out that you can come out the back way. And that's going to dump a lot of traffic into the communities behind the shopping center. There's a little walking sidewalk, uh, not sidewalk, but a little walking lane that's kind of painted in there on that road on Marion Quimby. But there's no barrier there. So, you know, somebody who's trying to figure out what they're doing, not paying attention, it puts people at risk. There are no sidewalks back there to walk on, just that painted walking path, I'll call it, on that road. Mm -hmm. So I would like this commission to think about re-looking at, at uh, pedestrian safety in regards to the additional traffic that this McDonald's has already admitted that they perceive having addition tra additional traffic there. 
in addition to the already um, dangerous safety that you've heard about from the traffic circle. Real quick, as a nurse practitioner, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Queen Anne's County has seen a significant growth in its obesity and diabetes rates. And although McDonald's does offer some healthier choices, um, that, you know, we're, it's a restaurant of convenience. And so having that drive through makes it even less likely that people will even burn the few extra calories to get out of their car to go get their food. Um, thus increasing the risk to, to the community and the traveler's health. So I appreciate your time this afternoon, but I do encourage you to look at the pedestrian safety issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I might, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I, that's my running route, my short running route. I run down to the little winery, vineyard, back around. And um, very little pedestrian disruption from this this McDonald's or anything there quite frankly there there is a little tiny strip and while I agree with the safety hazards of the circle um, I don't think that that would create a, a much of a problem behind the behind the center okay after mr. Mills Sandy uh, Gimmelstab go right ahead yes, sir um, I'm a resident of Centerville and I'm a soldier stationed at Fort Meade I'm a soldier of the United States Army um, one thing that I've noticed about ours since it's been there, when I was in high school, they've supported all the community values. They've supported my high school baseball state championship team um, over at Kent Island in 2008. They've supported all my military duties, and I've seen them do fundraisers to help people in the community with needs, such as a fundraiser they did about three years ago called Bucks to Help Chuck. This guy was uh, facing a severe disease, and they met his needs. But also, if you're looking at a business perspective, some people may lose their jobs. And it's going to be difficult finding another job that can meet their needs. And also, looking at the traffic, if there is an accident there, it can tie up the emergency responders for hours, which would limit the people of Ken Island from seeing other emergency responders to meet their needs. And then looking at more traffic coming off of Route 50, it would tie that up for hours. And if you look at the surrounding businesses, such as Domino's, their delivery drivers might not be able to get out because of the traffic needs that the McDonald's may occupy. And there's multiple locations where that place could go. There's a McDonald's on 213 right here, and there's one on Kent Island. So if you find a spot in between, such as Freer Lumber, or some location like that, that would work out great. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandy Gimmelstad is not here. Lynn Guy, uh, Shannon Hoover. Oops, you got somebody here. Hi there. My name is Lynn Guy, and I have lived in Queen Anne's County since I was seven years old. So while I understand the concerns, I remember the days when I had to wait five or six traffic cycles to get across Route 50 to see friends and family on the other side. So unfortunately, I think there are certain things that like in parts of the county where you sign the waiver when you move into the house that we raise chickens in this county, that if you choose to live over here, there are certain things we have to deal with like the bridge traffic. However, the circle does seem to be an issue and I don't think that really has anything to do with McDonald's. I've worked for McDonald's for 27 years. I started when I lived on Route 8 and worked on Route 50 because I couldn't find a job on Kent Island. Uh, I'm the director, so while Jerry may not be a local, as some people have stated, I've been in the county longer than I believe anybody who spoke today. Um, hiring special needs, giving community support, doing fundraisers, giving jobs to any individual that would be displaced. I will personally leave my name and phone number and I will help those employees get jobs. My parents both live in Queen Anne's County and I don't, the, the health statement about the choices is we all have personal responsibility. So it doesn't matter if it's an R's restaurant, which I probably has comparable, um, calorie choices at McDonald's, we all have to take responsibility. And as far as the traffic circle, maybe if we were all paying more attention to the traffic instead of texting and doing other stuff, that wouldn't be as much of an issue. 
My children lost about six friends on the back roads here at Queen Anne's County where there is no traffic, hitting traffic poles, drinking and driving, and all of those other things. So while I think it's a concern and I think the county needs to look at the circle in general, I don't think that McDonald's in any way will be detrimental to this community, at least from the family McDonald's perspective that we're bringing in. Ms. That's Guide, all. You work in Annapolis now? Um, I work at all the restaurants. I'm the director for the organization. Okay, so your job would not change. You would still have to travel. My job would not change, and okay, I travel from three or four across the bridge now. Uh, Ms. So Hoover have... will be next, and Kennedy Sizer, maybe? <laughs> Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Shannon Hoover. Um, I've worked for Jerry Gummelstadt for about 12 years. Um, I've worked for McDonald's for almost 22. It's my first and only job. Um, I am Jerry's supervisor, uh, newly this year. Um, I do have the Centerville and Chestertown locations. Um, Ken Island would be my store. Um, we have done many things for the community. Um, we work with the schools, we donate food, orange bowls, ice. Um, we're always looking to be interactive with the community. Um, I, my family actually lives right there in Stevensville. My twin sister, brother-in-law, and one-year-old niece. Um, we actually frequent ours, which is, you know, a great, great restaurant. Um, and, you know, I don't think that that we're going to be replacing them. We're still a restaurant. We're still trying to be part of the community. Um, but we really want to be involved in the community and, you know, create jobs, create stability. You know, I go to that cantina with my sister and I don't see, again, I go maybe once, maybe twice a week or something because I meet with them for dinner, but I don't see as much probably somebody that frequents there and lives there, but I don't see as much problem with the circle or a lot of traffic through there. Um, but I do drive past the actual highway to 50 towards the Centerville and, and Chestertown and don't see as much traffic probably as somebody would live here, but I don't see that there will be a problem. Um, but overall, Jerry Gimmelstop, you know, really is a great owner and he is family oriented and really creates a great atmosphere. And I know just like Glenn Guy, but just had mentioned that, you know, we'd be willing to look at any applicants from uh, the new Ars Cantina and, you know, we are always looking for great applicants and managers, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Randy Ebling. Uh, my name is Randy Ebling, and this is Candy Suarez. Um, we're actually um, husband and wife. We um, both have a unique situation, uh, kind of as Lynn Guybe does. We both work for McDonald's, and we also live in the community. Uh, we both live in Chester. Um, and. Um, travel across the bridge daily. Um, so we're very familiar with the uh, traffic situations. Um, we don't, we're not experts, we don't have studies, um, but we frequent that shopping center uh, several times a week as we go to Food Line, Radio Shack, you know. Um, we've, I've been to, we've been to ours several times ourselves. Um, so uh, earlier there was mention about a, uh, a long slow down lane on 50. I think there's one actually from the overpass down, so it is pretty significant um, from the ramp coming down off of eight. It's a short one. Um, so we've never, and are personally never experienced um, any major traffic situations. Um, working for McDonald's, uh, we are very community based. Our organization is very community based. Uh, I apologize, uh, we're not affiliated with the other McDonald's and they may not participate in the community as much as um, some would like, um, but we're very involved. Um, we donate portions of proceeds uh, for certain hours at different organizations, have schools. Family, family nights at right, we have family nights, kid nights where we offer discounted Happy Meals and free crafts and we have events. Um, so, and we welcome all suggestions and um, things to be able to, like Shannon said, to be part of the community because we are very community based, very family based. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. you two currently work across the bridge? I work in Annapolis. He works at. I was Trinity primarily on here on the Eastern Shore since 2008. Um, I'm actually from Delaware, so I used to travel from Delaware to. I actually worked at Ken Island for a short period of time for corporate. Would you work at ours now? You live in Chester? 
Mm -hmm. Correct. Five minutes away. Would you be working on the Ken Island store? Should I will this be working. At, we'll I, be helping with training. We always work mm -hmm. as a group, as a store that needs Correct. training or developing or Thank you. anything. Yes. If that's everyone that's signed up. Anyone who has not yet spoken is welcome to come up and speak for three minutes. Please identify yourself and have at it. I'm Michael Palmasano. I'm a Queen Anne's County resident and a real estate developer for no. 35 years. I can't believe that. Um, anyway, um, I just want to say that I have the next subdivision up in Graysonville, and um, uh, I had reason to be out uh, measuring the circle uh, on my site uh, this week. And I'm 40 feet wide dead of center, which is 80 feet. The circle over here would no way get approved by the state of Maryland or by the Department uh, of Traffic the way it's designed. And I think to allow the traffic to come off of 50 on that circle is a bad move. The also, th the also the other thing I want to say is that this design is a stealth design. It's designed for high-speed traffic. The cars are, that a patron is site will blow Cracker Barrel away. The number of cars at Cracker Barrel uh, daily versus the number of cars here because of the drive through it's all based on size, it's all based on speed. That'll have a significant uh, impact on a traffic study much greater than Cracker Barrel because of the design of the McDonald's. And the fact that it's only, uh, it's, it's half the size of what's currently out there, they're planning to put cars through that circle uh, much greater than what the traffic study says. Do you have anyone else from the public like to make comment? address? No. No, unfortunately we don't do that unless there's a question for you. Um, although I do have a question for you. Yes, you indicated in your comments that uh, the traffic study did not take into account the intersection on Route 8 um, and, the, and the service road, is that correct? Uh, it, it did not. The, the main intersection, I don't know that it did. Uh, I, I don't remember specifically what you're referring to. Um, I thought he referenced a study in Durham that just spoke to the increased traffic. The complaints I raised were that the city of Durham, uh, for a special major special use permit, did a study that indicated that 400 additional trips in a 24-hour period was the norm for that location uh, in Durham. And then the ITE, which the expert also cited, uh, their own study indicated that uh, it could be closer to 700 plus additional trips on average with 110 such trips occurring during peak hours around traditional meal times. Uh, the name of that report is Fast Food Trip Generation, another book by ITE.org. I can right. provide those studies for you. Uh, that'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Traffic Expert, I'm sorry. He, to there was more. He, he told us there was more than, the, than that, that fellow's Well, that was my question. Did you not tell us? I, I thought what you said was that there would be 180 people peak hour potentially coming through there. Is that correct? Well, that was with, that's, the numbers I gave you were with the specific number of people that you told us you thought would be generated in McDonald's on the peak hour. That's what I want. Yep. They did. Yes, he did. The numbers that I gave you were the McDonald's traffics with uh, the trips subtracted from the existing. The the number we just heard was too low. The the actual numbers. Um, well, let me get. Can I get my notes? I'll give them to you. Sure. Sure. Than yeah. The other yeah. Said. All right. The actual numbers are actually, let's see, 188 a.m. trips, 135 p.m. trips, 245 Saturday trips, and 301 Sunday trips per hour. Per hour. Peak hours. Peak hours. No, no. And then did you deduct out our? That's with ours. That that's McDonald's trips only. So when I deduct the existing traffic, it's 97 a.m., 36 p.m., 160 Saturday. 198 Sunday. But my study represents the 188, 135, 245, and 301 without subtracting the existing traffic. An hour. But that's what extra. Per hour. Right, we're not having a good debate here. It's in the study. Is this a time for the Planning Commission to ask whoever they want to questions to clarify the position? And, um, and then we're going to deliberate and decide whether we're doing anything and what that might be. So just so you all know, that's what happens now. This is not um, 
this is not a question and answer session and and that's the way we always operate this is no different than any other person who's ever been before the planning commission any project all right any other questions from can i ask a question <laughs> what well my question pertains to what you just asked i don't recall the traffic study being a study being done coming in from route eight down the service road. Yeah, that's what that's, I just that, asked him, and, and his answer was that he did take into account that, that intersection. Into account? Okay. That all, what, what his study said, as I recall, was that all of the intersections in this area, which I believe were the one behind uh, Marion Quimby Drive, the going on to Route 50 through the circle, and the going in and out of the shopping center, and Route 8, all functioned at a A, B, or C level. Is that what you told us before? That's correct. Okay. So, whether you like A, B, or C, uh, it's clear that no one here likes what happens in that circle, regardless of whether the state says it's an A or not. And we understand that. Um, other, other questions from, from us? Okay, well, now, now we're going to have discussion. I'm going to start the discussion with a couple things. One, I, w I first want to thank everybody for coming out and giving us um, your thoughts on this. I will tell you that a lot of the thoughts that you gave us today um, had a little more meat on the bone than the 100 emails or so that we had before, which basically had nothing that we could act upon. Um, I am sure that the current owners of ours, who I know and have been there many times and have seen some of their um, uh, giving to the community, and the people who would like to do this McDonald's are all wonderful people. We can't care about that. We are not here to decide who wins and who loses. We are here within the very specific scope of what state law says the Planning Commission has done. We are appointed volunteers. We have no stake in this other than to do the best we can for the community. And our decision will be whatever we think meets the requirements. Because if we were to simply say, we like Judy better than we like them, so we're not going to approve this, they'll just go to court and get the approval. Nothing good comes from that. So we have to make our deliberations based on things that we can actually do something about under what state law says we can. And they're very, very specific as to what we can and can't do. So who's the greatest? Who's the best? Who provides the best jobs? Who provides the most income? Those are all, they're not irrelevant to us as a community, but to us as the Planning Commission, we just can't take that into account. So I appreciate your thoughts on all of those, um, but they're kind of an aside to what's before us. Um, what's before us that, that I do have continuing concerns about, um, and I would like to see something more on it, I'm not exactly sure where we get it, um, because we're not in the business of going out and doing independent studies. Um, but there were a few things that were brought up that I do think I'd like to see addressed in some way, shape, or form, and you may be able to address them now, and you may have to address these in the future, um, and we'll see. The first is the off-ramp from Route 50 onto this circle. All right, the circle is a little tiny circle. All right, I know about this circle. Um, my family developed one of the communities where some of you all live on Thompson Creek Road, and, and to do that community, I don't know how long ago it was in Anchorage it was developed, we had to uh, give the county a, a, a pile of money, a pretty big pile of money, to do something up there, which the county didn't do for years, um, as did the developer of the, the community next to that. So I am familiar that, that something was, was done there, and I go through that circle several times a week myself. I am aware that it is small. Um, I am not so sure that some things couldn't be done immediately to alleviate the problems you have now, regardless of McDonald's, if there's not a speed limit reduction and, and a lot of speed limit signs that, that come on that ramp coming off of there, if there's not dividers um, that, that divide the, the off-ramp from the highway so that people know they have to slow down, those are things that we don't have any authority over, but we can certainly send that off to um, um, state roads and ask them to do something about that. So I'd like, to, I'd like to know what that situation is and whether there's things we could do to fix that. Um, the, um, there was a comment made that the, sh the sheriff uh, said something. I'd like to see the sheriff come in here and tell us um, that, if that's true. He said he'd be happy to. Um, I, I'd, I'd, like to I'd, like to, I'd like to see that. Um, there was a comment by um, Mr. Rudy and the lady with the lovely necklace on. Um, about the, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, about pedestrian traffic, and Mr. Rudy made a comment about crosswalks. I don't see anything on the site plan 
that will protect pedestrians that are walking over to McDonald's. If it's there, you guys can point that out to us. If it's not, I think that it's important that it be there. I understand that most of your business is coming through a drive through but but I, I would like to see something on on what you're going to do because you're circled with a driveway. There's no way in without that. So so what are we going to do? I'd like to hear something about that. I would like to see what the accident numbers are. I don't know how the heck we get them if uh, they're not available. We had an uh, ex-policeman tell us they're not available. Um, if there aren't any accidents in this circle, it's really hard to make a decision that the circle doesn't work. If there are plenty of accidents in the circle, then then we know that we really have a problem um, that that we need to deal with. Um, and that's it. That's what I had. Other members. I'm guessing uh, Lieutenant Boardman can give us that information. If I mean, I'll be happy to call Dwayne and ask him. Uh, well, to, to piggyback to what Barry said, that uh, you know, with <laughs> what he'd like to see, I'd like to actually see a report that actually says how many cars McDonald's generates, uh, the Eastern Shore McDonald's. I, I'd like to see the one that's just been built. And how many cars go in and out of that thing at, on peak hours and weekends? McDon um, the Ken Island McDonald's? Yes, the Ken Island McDonald's, because I think that would be the fairest gauge to how many is going to go in and out of the eastbound one. I mean, if, if we're going to be collecting information, I think that that's something that's well worth collecting because I do agree that some of the, some of the study hours that were taken, the, the morning going in and out of that, not so much the traffic circle, was not an accurate... Uh, depiction of what may go in and out of there. So that's that's what I would like to see. Anybody else? If you want to respond yeah, to any I'm, of that, I'm you're welcome sure. to. I mean, yeah. Well, don't argue. If you've got the answers, fine. Right? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not sure I follow Well, you're not going to make an argument. They ask for information. No, I'm going to answer some questions because right. I think there's a misconception about what traffic studies have no, there's done. Not. They know what a traffic study is and they know no, that they know that there's a, there's a traffic studies in the file that are substantial and discuss each one of the times that, that I, I, don't, I wasn't going to make an argument. Okay. Except with you. <laughs> but, but, uh, if we could move past that. Right. <laughs> um, in regards to your, in regards to your, um, your first question, I think Mark, it, in regards to the circle, there is posted speed limits there now, I understand. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And what's that? It's posted at 15 miles an hour. Okay. And there's the D-cell lane that they have. Is that right? Yeah. Coming off of 50. Okay. Is there anything else there that, that could be done that would, you know, that could be suggested to the, um, um, to the planning commission that they might be able to work on, either from their end or from the county, and it might assist in some of the calming aspect of that there? We can look at, I, I know there's a sign, we can look at other measures. I don't know off the top of my head now. Okay. All right. What about the pedestrian? It, uh, one of us had discussed in a previous meeting about the linkage of pedestrians. Was it you that we talked about it with, Kurt? Right. Can you look at the plan and point out how we've accommodated or tried to accommodate for pedestrians moving through the landscape with the mm -hmm. landscaping and some other directional Yeah, I mean measures? the traffic or shopping center traffic typically walks through and from the driving aisles. I mean, we could strike the driving aisle from the shopping center over to the McDonald's. Uh, but Specifically, people walking down the um, strip center and then walking over McDonald's. How are they going to get there? Is there anything to provide some, some level of safety so they don't get run over when they walk across the... Are you the, talking about within? Well, the, there's nothing within, to yes. On the so like from the Luke's to the yes. McDonald's? Yes. Thank you. Yes, there's nothing marked directly on the plan, but it's no different from someone parking in the uh, middle of the shopping center and walking up to the strip mall. They're going to walk to and from. You could stripe an aisle, but they're not going to use it. I mean, we could definitely stripe an aisle. Uh, I'm sure there might be, you know, uh, some handicapped people might use it. Uh, someone who's really conscientious might use it, but the majority of the people are just going to walk where they want to walk. And it's typically in a shopping center right down, you know, the center of the... I'm not really lines. comfortable with that statement. People are going to walk wherever they want to walk. We have worked very hard in our society to, to protect pedestrians. Yeah, but in a and shopping center, when you park in a shopping center, you get out of your car and you walk to the... But what I'm hearing you say is that you haven't made any accommodations for pedestrians. and. It, 
our chairman's comments. I, I think. No, I mean we could make accommodations. We could stripe a, a walkway from the shopping center to the entrance to McDonald's. That'd be no problem at all, uh, and we'd be glad to do that. Uh, I think the majority of people will walk, you know, however they want to go. Yeah, that's certainly something that we can do. That's no, but you no know, we that. we would wouldn't hesitate to strike an aisle. Well, personally, I would like to see that you all come back with a site plan, among the other things that we're going to talk about, that deals with how are people going to get from one side of that to the other without walking down the middle of the road. Because they have to come down. Most people do walk up and down the sidewalk once they get there. And if they're coming out of their shops and they're going to go eat lunch at McDonald's, they're probably going to walk down the sidewalk, not down the middle of the road. And if there was a crossover there, they probably would use it. I don't know how they're going to get in your building from the other side because they're coming out the back side of it. And, and uh, walking down the um, drive through lane is probably not a great idea. But I'm sure you could figure something out there. Not, so I don't need an answer now. I'm just telling you that that's, that's an answer that I'm going to need. Okay. If, if you guys are going to move forward before that. Um, the I'm not sure where we go. I mean, I think everybody can agree, including you guys, that the traffic circle is not the ideal size that it should be in that location. doesn't mean it doesn't function, but it's not the ideal size. And I don't know whether there's an answer to that other than buying up two gas stations and getting rid of them, which it is probably not very likely. It was built by the state. I mean, that was not a county-constructed traffic circle. And, is that right? It was built by the state. It was done by the state. It wasn't built. There's nothing built. It's just right. strikes down. Designed by the state, done by the state. Laid out by the state. <laughs> Laid out by the state, right. Um, we can provide um, whatever additional information you want. Can, can, can we get somebody from State Highway to talk to us about that traffic circle? No. Or not? No, we can certainly try. Steve's saying yes. Yeah. And can we get numbers? Can we get an actual this weekend, next weekend, one of these weekends, a traffic study for Saturday and Sunday at that circle. I'm not worried about the, the shopping center. At the circle for Saturday and a Sunday to find out what the peaks are now and at the same time get a count at the existing McDonald's westbound. I mean, I hate to tell anybody to spend money. If you tell me you can't do it, you can't do it. But my point is then we can add that number and we can actually see how many more cars may be coming into that circle certainly can get you additional information in regards to those. We, the, 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 the counts that Mark did were for Saturday and Sunday peaks during August of 2012. So if, if, so if he's, already, he's already got that number that, with the Cracker Barrel being open at the circle. Yes. Okay, the so circle then that part of it's done. The second part in regards to the numbers at McDonald's, we can certainly get that, but is that applicable to this McDonald's, which is a small, much smaller building by about a quarter, and it's also shadowed by the McDonald's on just the other side of the of the bridge? So I, we can give that to you. Uh, well, I think we can take that into account. I, 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 you know what I mean? I, I'm quite I, sure that McDonald's has statistics on how many cars stop at one and how many cars stop at one 15 miles down the road. Richie Highway has one that has. Their I, I can't believe McDonald's doesn't have those statistics. What, what type of statistics could we provide that would? Be they must. Right? They they know how Just close they can put. Right here, oh, I know, but they, yeah. McDonald's knows how close they can put right. two McDonald's on the same road. I mean. <laughs> They ought to be able to pull from from your from your sales records how many customers you served. That doesn't tell us how many um, right. cars there were specifically, mm -hmm. but it would give us some idea. Oh no! I, I, my only point was is that, yes, we can get the one for Chester, and we just I was just cautioning that it sure. may not be applicable right. mm -hmm. necessarily to the to the right. Thompson Creek one. That was my point. Could I could I make a suggestion? First of all, whoever's speaking, I think it is best for the audience and the recording if you speak in the microphone. Okay, we're, we're kind of getting a little informal. Um, and two, it might be helpful if we, if we saw a summarized version of the traffic report. Yes. Because we're hearing numbers, and I don't think people are retaining those numbers in their minds. And, uh, and so when, if you come back, when you come back, uh, having a summary might really help. That, it, that the, the study is in the file now, is that correct? Yes. So, so us getting it or the members of the public getting it are all perfectly it's easy? all open to the public. That's exactly right, yes. Yes, and have been in the file since January or so of this year, of this year, yes. Mm -hmm. And that includes the scoping information and what State Highway required and the county required us to look at. Is everybody all right with the architecture? Does anyone have any specifics on the architecture that need to be dealt with? <laughs> 
I mean, we glossed over that because we knew that was not the elephant in the room. But um, if they're going to come back and talk to us about those other things, and hopefully for them, at least hopefully work them out, not the other side, but uh, we might as well give them all the issues that we're dealing Shannon, with. did you find it ugly? The architectural I, subcommittee. I don't find it ugly. <laughs> I feel sad. I found it a lot nicer than the duck and duck. I, I have to agree with that, but I will say that uh, it always intrigues me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that parking walks right in front of the drive through can't avoid that when it's on four sides. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, pedestrians are. I understand. What's the sound We'll go back. We'll look at that when we look at the the uh, um, the striping and the crossings and things like that. <laughs> I, I did find your your branding, the McDonald's signage, was very nice. Uh, it it blended in nicely, and I didn't think it stood out. And you're not putting any additional signage out on 50 or anything, big golden arches. There something. is. There won't be big golden arches, but we are going to have some space on the existing signboard that's out there right that's now. That's out for there the, now. The, is that accurate? The one at the very entrance of the to, of the mall, the Tom's Creek Mall, yeah. where everything is. That that's, one sign. Is that accurate? It's the existing signboard is where we'll be. Yeah, with everybody else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the existing pilings, piling side. Can I mention one thing about the traffic? And I, this is why I think a summary would be helpful. I thought I heard Mark Keeley say that a, and I've forgotten whether it was morning or afternoon, the peak count into the inner, to, into the entrance to the east, the farthest east one. Where you enter to ours now, right by the gas station. Yeah. One. Yes. Eighty-three movements. I heard 83. 86 existing. 86 existing. And the peak And that would include the uses that are presently there in that structure. Then you told us that a peak for uh, that McDonald's was 186 net, net of what's there now. That's just generated by McDonald's only. So that in a peak hour, assuming I've got apples and apples. And apples so I add the 86 add to my 800, add 100 movements attributable to the McDonald's in a peak hour. Is that? Uh, yeah, 108, whatever I okay. said. I just want to be clear. I was surprised it was that. I have 188. Much. So. So, so if you take 83, how many do you take off for the existing uses in the building that's proposed to be removed? I didn't take anything off. I if you did, if you were asked to. Um, 15, 10. That's that calculation of square footage. I think it was, I don't know, I could get that. That's what I'm curious about. I'm what, curious. You're going to have to come back anyway. Yes. That's what we, we right. want to know what the difference is. Yeah, and you know, it, it'd be nice to hear from other local businesses in that center, if anybody knows anyone, what they mm -hmm. think. The real estate, there's a real estate little office in there. And hey, Mark, I'm, just I'm not necessarily right interested in ours. They have a vested interest, and I know the nail place is already moving next to Luke's, but. Postal. I don't know if we can get the, the post office in here. And that, that is a nightmare parking there, though. We it tried is. to get the post office in when there was complaints about all the uh, trucks being, all the little yeah. delivery trucks. That was about, I don't know, 10 years or so ago yeah. when they were all parking there. And yeah. the question was whether they were permitted to park there as sort of an outdoor storage use. So the question was arisen as to whether or not that was permitted in the parking lot as sort of vehicle storage. And we couldn't get anybody to show up. Legally speaking, can me and a bunch of my friends just park our cars there when they're out in the morning and just leave them there? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right. Neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> unless, the, unless the landlord's. Oh. I'm just going to come hey. back in your driveway, though. All right. I got to go. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, is there any action that anyone wishes to propose at this point in time? Or we are just going like to table. table this until you come back to us with answers to some of the questions that we've asked. And if I come back, and I just want to be clear, if I come back with the um, the um, the uh, engineer, the uh, uh, McDonald's, and, and Jerry, and as well as Mark, uh, are we okay on architecture then? Because I won't have the architect come back. I I think we're okay with the architecture. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. And you're going to talk to the state police? I'll call guy. Dwayne, see if I can get it out of him. I'll see him in an hour. You can see Dwayne in the next. gym, yeah. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break. Thank right. you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, some people have been here a hell of a long time waiting to be heard, so um, those people need to be heard. Um, and some things we can deal with at um, a later time. So.
Um, next on our agenda is um, a map amendment 1310. We will be taking that. And the text amendment 1308, we need to deal with that. We then had a work session on comprehensive plan implementation and miscellaneous staff items. And while we certainly have had a day of planning delight today, um, we normally have a lot more free time than what we've had. So my, my suggestion would be that we take our, um, our, our work sessions and, del and just don't do those this, this month. Any, any other thoughts on that? Okay, that's, Second that. that's what we're going to do then. And that brings us to Map Amendment 13-10, Ms. Spinelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, members of the public. This is the second time this is before you, um, and to briefly review it, um, this map amendment is up in Price, Maryland, um, along 301. It's a uh, parcel that is 36.7 acres, and the request is a rezoning from suburban estate to village center VC for a portion of that 36.7 acres, exactly 14.43 plus or minor acres. Um, as I go through the previous staff report, I, oh, just to let you know, there was um, no change and no action on this proposed map amendment, and pen petitioner has not altered their request since the last time you heard this in April when there was a public hearing. Um, to review this again is to say that the zoning in this property, the background information is the zoning has always been residential on this piece of property, and that was shown in the background information. The also that the um, Department of uh, Planning and Zoning did a review of finding a fact, and that finding a fact, which is required under state law when you're doing a map amendment, you need to show one of two things, that there's a change in neighborhood that's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. So you would show a change, or the other thing that you may show in order to give a map amendment approval is that there was a mistake and that the zoning line was mistakenly put down in a wrong place. Neither one of those things was shown, I believe, um, by the petitioner on this particular parcel of land. Therefore, the staff recommends and still recommends that this 14.46 um, acres retain its current zoning of suburban estate. I also showed out one of the arguments that was put forth by the mm -hmm. applicant was, and the petitioner was that um, it was difficult to put residential zoning on 301. I think it was shown at that time that there was res much residential zoning along 301, um, one of them being right outside called Bishop's Meadow, and there was a picture showing that as part of the presentation that was done by the staff. And are there any questions? So we left this alone last time? Yep. yep. We just left it alone and just said we'll deal with it another time. And Contrary this, to my suggestion, this is another now time. We asked the this, applicant no. to consider whether there was another zone. And they considered it, it and, and did nothing. No, that's not accurate. Okay, well, let's bring them up and let's right. let them. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, is that the applicant, and, and Joe, we talked about this, mm -hmm. You did not submit any um, any change in application for this this property. Okay, so that's what I'm representing to you. What I have before you is what we had before in April. There has been no request from the applicant for a change in anything on this on this application, I, and I welcome any comments from Mr. Stevens. I think we should. Oh, okay. I mean, we I don't remember exactly what we asked him, but I, I also remember asking him to consider whether it was another zone that might be more palatable to the residents. That That's, they would uh, consider, like, and and whether it's obviously they're gonna. I, well, I'm not gonna pull words in your mouth. Tell us whatever you'd like. To tell. Also, right. there's yeah. public here to speak right. to anything. <laughs> we yeah. you we had gone through and quite a lengthy presentation about the zoning and about mistake um, in the zoning, and had presented quite a bit of evidence to Mr. Griffith um, about the narrowness of the lot, the percolation issues all being clustered in one location. Uh, that this was right next to the highway and not an appropriate place for suburban estate zoning. Um, and, um, uh, and I believe we met the parameters for mistake. I think Mr. Drummond concurred when we were here last time. Um, and we presented additional information in that, that regard. So the question then became, okay, do you rezone? 
okay? Just because you meet the threshold for mistake, and I think I gave you, you know, the cases on it and all that, doesn't mean you have to rezone. I did give you the cases on it. Um, because you could say that the zoning that's in place now is the one that's most appropriate and makes sense, or you could say that the zoning we're requesting, which was Village Center, and we showed you the plats on the wall about where the Village Center was located at this present time, is, makes the most sense. Or you could actually recommend another zoning district to the county commissioners. And, and uh, Mr. Waterman was, recommend, was talking about recommending ag. You had, you had said that the property's already ag and it's being tilled. I mean, it's being tilled and in ag uses. It did allow for some more uses that perhaps were more appropriate that close to the highway on such a narrow lot, and it allowed for non-residential uses, things like nurseries or kennels and some other things of that nature that were, you know, ag support uses, um, um, uh, landscaping operations, things of that nature would be allowed under the ag district. And you, and the way the conversation, at least my perception was, is you said, will you talk to your client and see if something like that would be appropriate? I did talk to my client, and that's what I was saying here. I'm not going to request another or put a request out for a different zoning district other than Village Center. That's the one we're requesting. But if this commission wants to not recommend Village Center and recommends ag instead, my client would probably then pursue the ag and not try to continue to pursue the Village Center. We think the Village Center is the most appropriate there. but. If you were to recommend the ag zone, then, then we would go ahead and we would do procedurally whatever we need to do, which I think is just let the county commissioners advertise for the ag rezoning as opposed to the village center. And that, that's why I didn't put anything else in my, in my request except to be back on the agenda because it was just a dialogue, essentially. <laughs> so we'd still like to have the village center. I believe we met the mistake requirement um, because I, I, it's not, I don't believe it's as rigid as where the zoning line is drawn. I think you mistake a fact according to the case law, can be things such as soil conditions, can be the things such as the narrowness of the lot. A lot of things that the legislature did not take, facts that the legislature did not take in consideration when they zoned. That doesn't mean the, the legislature was made a mistake. That doesn't mean that the legislature was, was, uh, didn't do its job. But there are often facts associated with properties that if brought to the attention of the legislators by the owners, they, they were facts that were relevant and then could constitute a mistake. And that was our argument. I, I believe that that's the case law, and I think that that's sustainable. I don't think Mr. Drummond disagreed with that. The whole question then became was, okay, should we keep it suburban, residential, excuse me, suburban estate? The applicant's requesting village center, but the applicant gave us no feedback on the ag district, and now I'm giving you feedback on the ag district. The uses are... Somewhat similar, uh, the use list under the, uh, under the village center allows a little more of a commercial type of uses, you know, small restaurants, things like that, whereas under the ag district, it turns more on the ag um, uh, support types of uses and something that's, you know, quite frankly attractive to my client, which is Severn Savings Bank, who took it in foreclosure and are trying to sell it and have nobody available right now, nobody's looking at it. But what's attractive to them from that standpoint is really things like, you know, landscaping, nurseries, type of things like that. That might be a suitable place for something like that. So that's where we are. My recollection of, of my opinion when we ended that discussion was that, that I didn't think you met the criteria for mistake. But I agree that suburban estate was a stupid zone to have been applied there. But that's not a mistake. That it's just was a poor choice. But that's what people chose. So that that was my opinion of where we were. A bad choice of zoning that didn't make any sense, but not necessarily a mistake. So, um, but that was my recollection. Um, if anybody has any questions for these guys, that's fine. Otherwise, I think we have some public who would like to speak. Not as many as we had 15 minutes ago. <laughs> or the last We might even let you go a little longer than three minutes, but uh, if you'd like to come up and speak, feel, feel free. You guys can actually stay where you are. You have to please sit down. Hi, um, I'm Cheryl Steinbeiser. Um, I live uh, directly across the street from the uh, property in question at uh, 116 Rabbit Hill Road. Um, I was present at the last meeting and uh, I do appreciate you all uh, taking, I know it's been a very long day for everyone, uh, the time to hear me again. 
When you met the last time, um, you did hear from um, several other resi residents of the neighborhood. Um, and although their con concerns are very valid, their fears of what may happen or, you know, how folks don't want things to change and so forth, that's not the basis that I'm approaching you with today. That's not what you all need to make base a decision upon um, people's feelings or emotions. It has to be what's correct by the law and what's correct for the communities and therefore the county. Um, in um, the uh, early 80s, whenever this was rezoned to be the suburban estates, they were actually, um, in my opinion anyway, correcting a mistake. Um, this mistake being that it was originally zoned to be a, uh, a more dense residential um, subdivision. And when that was shown to not be a, a viable possibility, it was zoned to accommodate larger um, lots. Perhaps you can't put 14 lots on this subdivide into to that for 14 residences per acre but that I don't think was the intention of the board the intention of the board was to preserve the open spaces of um, the the other the the whole residential neighborhood there that that has been zoned um, uh, NC1 where you have large lots um, low density residential housing so that was not a mistake on that part it may not be the best use of that piece of property but I'm not real sure that it's that that makes a difference I don't I don't think it's it's for any anyone to base this decision upon what may be most lucrative for someone or what may be most comfortable for the residents. It has to be based on the simple facts that there was not a mistake made and it has not been shown to be. Although things exist now, perhaps there are facts that have come to light since then. I have no idea what percolation test requirements were in the early 80s. I have no idea of, of uh, what was required for wells in, in the 80s. That information may have been appropriate at that time but since things have changed as we've gone along okay well that's doesn't show a mistake was made then um, I really appreciate your time I know you've had a long day thank you very much thank you very thank much you. anybody else Excuse me. Jumped up, you jumped up to like you were going to say something. Well, no, it's now if there's no more public comment, then there's a time for staff to come and hear what the Planning Commission wants to do. Uh, um, and if there's well, any help I can give you. Well, um, you can. You can you can flesh this thought out. Okay. I don't think suburban state was a good zone to start with. It's a high density residential zone. It's not a good place for it to have been. And changing the village center was very objectionable to the residents. Changing the ag should make the residents happy, should give you some more um, or happier than what's there now, um, or happier than, than going to a commercial zone. But I'm not sure whether we're on any better footing change, suggesting know, to change to ag just because it makes more sense if we don't believe that we met the mistake or change criteria. And that's really where I'm at, I, and I appreciate that you, you pinpointed that. I think if you haven't met the criteria for mistake, you haven't met the criteria for mistake, whether it's ag or whether it's village center or whatever. I do believe that there's an opportunity for property owners uh, when we do comprehensive rezonings to come in um, on a 10-year, it's now going to be, let me see, we're almost 14, in a six-year cycle that we be able to review this. That was an opportunity for the property owner, and it is. Um, we send out notices. Um, we post uh, information on our website to bring people in to do that so that they can correct or adjust zoning at that time. So I guess um, 
I, I, I really see the point. I also see that, you know, the, the landscape has changed and some state legislation has changed the landscape. And I believe that you may start seeing a lot more of these requests, but it doesn't meet the criteria for the law. And I think that, you know, sometimes if something doesn't work out one way, it doesn't mean you can just, that that's why we have zoning and that's why we have planning. So anyway, I, I appreciate, I, I don't believe that they met it, so that's. And that's new Barry, can I just interject that I have the minutes here, and you specifically, you made the motion. Um, and you asked him to consider an alternative zoning district. So I think there was some evidence provided at the hearing. Why, why would you do that if you didn't think there was a mistake? I don't know. Okay, I'm just... I, I, I don't know, that, but just my, my recollection at the time was that I... I thought that that might make the neighbors happy, give them something that would be more saleable, and we could hang our hat on what I thought was a very thin argument that there was a mistake. I mean, you made an argument that there was a mistake. Mm -hmm. It wasn't compelling. It wasn't non-existent. We have some latitude in that, and I suspect that that is my thought process was <coughs> that there might be something there. Uh, the, the way that I always look at mistake when when somebody asks me to move something like this forward is 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 it something that would be sustainable if we were challenged? Okay, and somebody mistook that as a legal threat last time, and I wasn't making anything like that. It was I was just saying that's kind of how I analyze these things. If we end up before a judge, are there enough facts to support it based on the cases that are out there? And and. And based on that and based on what I had looked at and what I had done in the past, I believed that, that and the cases are, are pretty clear, and one of the leading ones is, is, is the one I gave you, White v. Spring, and it says that there must be probative evidence to show that the premises relied upon by the council were invalid or the council failed to take into account then existing facts so that the council's actions were premised upon an erroneous foundation. I think the facts that I present about the percolation and the facts that I present about the narrowness of the lot that weren't taken into account next to, next to the highway are enough to get me over that, that hurdle, if, if that were to take place. <clears throat> I think that that's the case. I, I, def, you know, I, I think, and I don't want to speak for Chris because he's not here, but I had that conversation with him, and he can speak to it directly to you. So that, I believe, gets me over that hurdle. Now the next question is, is you know, what makes sense for you to do? And that's why I always look at these mistake arguments as, look, you could tell me, we agree you have a mistake, but we're just not going to rezone it. And there's absolutely nothing that I could do or tell my client to do. And, and that's all within the purview of you and the county commissioners. So I do believe I got over the hurdle for that for mistake and that if, again, if this would be looked at as one that was sustainable. The question then becomes, what do you do from a zoning standpoint? And as I told you, I, we did hear all the concerns of the neighbors about the village center, and I talked to some of them afterwards outside, and one of their largest concerns, which I can't do anything about, was they just didn't know what was going to happen there, and they wanted to know what might happen, and I don't know that, because there's no proposal on the table. Um, so th that's where we are. I think that the ag district, as opposed to the village center district, and one, it gets rid of our non-conforming use, which is farming, which we have on the site right now, which I think you had, you had mentioned to me during the hearing, um, uh, that we have that, that, that use on the site that's going on. So um, it seemed like, a, a you know, the. The other thing, too, is the remainder of this property is agricultural as well. This is a 36-acre parcel that was separated from Route 301 when the Starfield, Route 301 came in and split up Starfield Farm. There's 36 acres here. 13 of it was rezoned um, at one point in time residential, and then the remaining 18 acres is... Um, is uh, ag. ag so you know it makes all the property the same zoning district and 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 that i think is you know it's it's definitely preferable uh to me and my my client if we can do that but you know, i gotta defer to you all on your recommendation to the county commissioners if we if we say no mistake was made and we change it to ag aren't we saying a mistake was made well, you cannot say. You, you can't say, say that. You, you have to say, say there's a mistake. Say mistake. It's the yeah. only right. condition. You have to agree that we met the, th the threshold for mistake, and then you can recommend the ag on it. And, and uh, the other, I know that there's always a concern with the boards 
and, and rightfully so, about precedent. You know, are we establishing a precedent right. by finding that you had a mistake? And you know, and and I and I I, I respect Helen's opinion. I don't disagree with her that that, that it's I, I've made a better, stronger mistake arguments. I just think I have <laughs> enough here. You know, I've had better, stronger mistake arguments, and but I, I believe I have enough here for that. The precedent question. I think the county is always safe on it because no matter what the mistake is, you never have to agree to rezone unless there's a taking, which isn't the case. Right. You can always just say, you're right, you have a mistake, or maybe you're right, you have a mistake. We just disagree with the zoning. We think the original one is appropriate. And if you think that in this case, that's fine too. I guess I'd like to point out, um, just for your information, so that we have all the information on the table, is that Suburban Estate is primarily a residential zone. There's no doubt about it. It does allow um, non-commercial forestry, non-profit institutional as principal permitted use, uh, for-profit institutional, outdoor recreation, private stables, public service. As a conditional use, it allows agriculture. So it is not. Um, you know, it, it allows aquaculture, agriculture, bed and breakfast, uh, commercial forestry, for-profit institutional, fraternal organizations, funeral homes, group daycare, institutional residential, marinas, minor extraction and dredge uses, nurseries, private covered slips, and public utilities, telecommunication facilities. So the, I know it doesn't give you everything. But it gives you a lot of conditional uses. I know it's another step, and it's hard to sell things with. Con I, I've been down this road, but I, I do think that there you're not. If I go to ag, those are all uses in ag. So I think you know the amount of new uses. I, I just I think there's they're there, and I don't think they've. Mistake. Well, but that's that's all I'm going to say, and I think my argument's been made in my 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 uh, staff reports. I, I have to say that it wouldn't be the first time today that someone suggested that the marina might go somewhere. I know. <laughs> I know in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it's a permitted use. <laughs> <laughs> we don't usually put marinas, but sometimes, you know, there used to be boats up on 301. Did you remember that? Uh, up on that place on 301. I used to pass it all the time. <laughs> we, we simply have to uh, decide that we're going to um, give a favorable or unfavorable recommendation to the county commissioners. Uh, we could do s either one with some suggested alternative, um, or we can simply send an unfavorable or favorable recommendation. So if, uh, if enough people think there was a mistake, then... We can send a favorable recommendation, or we can send. I don't know what we would send if we wanted to send it up with a different zone. So um, let's just let's just find out whether enough people think there's a mistake or not. So somebody's got to make a motion to send favorable or unfavorable. Well, as an old country boy that's been around here for 60 plus years, suburban estate going up 301, I think, was a mistake. And I think we make a favorable recommendation to change it. Oh, okay, so then you're finding an, um, okay, fine. It's a favorable change recommendation. Change it to VC as they asked for or change it to AG? I think it should be changed to AG. And the reason I think it should be changed to AG versus VC is I th there's a very narrow road leading to that property after you turn off 301, even though the same uh, permitted uses exist. Uh, I think zoning, uh, ag zoning, is is the better alternative. If we want the county commissioners to only act upon, well, they can do whatever they want. So I should just say that up front. The county commissioners can ignore what we tell them and do whatever they want. But if we would prefer them to act on this, should we send this up with a favorable recommendation, but change it to ag, or should should we send it with an unfavorable recommendation? And a comment that it, that we think they should change it. How, how would we Mr. Chairman, I think the that we have we should defer to our um, applicant the petitioner because if they agree to change it to AG their petition, yeah, we'll then do. it'll go up with an AG petition. I would do that if if you make a recommendation for the reason for finding a mistake, but to AG, then I will amend the petition so it gets advertised That's as right. an AG and it does not go up as a. Um, we could do that now, and you will do that afterwards. Or I will do that, do that afterwards. Then, well, that would be the motion. You can make the motion a favorable. The motion is a favorable. For AG. For AG, yes. 
Is there a second? I'm going to second it so we vote. So any discussion? Yeah. So does this create an opportunity for other properties to make the claim that a mistake was made? Does it create a wider door for other properties to say a mistake was made on this property with the zoning and uh, you you didn't change it to village center but you changed it to ag so you you agree that the mistake was made um, and it create create a, a, a wider door for bigger problems and I'm, I'm not thinking about this property in itself I'm thinking about things that we don't know about so I mean certainly changing something to ag is something you know I would be in favor of but I don't want to create a situation that we set a bar and now we have to meet that bar. And, and I think I think the answer to that is what Mr. Stevens said that we can find a mistake and still not favor a change in zone. So I don't think that we set a precedent that because we did it once we have to do it again. Will someone make that argument? Sure. Yes. You did it for, the, for Joe. You need to do it for Sam. Right. But that, yeah, make that doesn't argument. necessarily mean that. We need to. Well, I, I, I think it, I would have a lot bigger trouble with this if we were increasing mm -hmm. the density mm -hmm. or uses on the property, mm -hmm. but we are decreasing the potential yield of residential units by doing this substantially. So suburban states, what? Two, two units to the acre or something? About two units. A, and as opposed to one per eight acres. Um, so the residential yield is is fairly minimal and the all other uses that they could use are all conditional uses in suburban estates. So I'm not sure we're doing you any great favor here other than getting you maybe out of the ballpark of having to go to the Board of Appeals. We're not doing a whole lot here though. If we were changing this to VC, we'd be doing a lot. We'd be changing the character and, and potentially of, of that whole area and, and I think in this particular instance we're probably not. So I don't feel like there's going to be the outcry on this that a McDonald's in certain areas. Might <laughs> 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 Is there also, and I'm just playing devil's advocate with this because um, I just want to get it through my head. Um, is there is there uh, repercussions because we're changing it to ag and that wasn't part of the original um, petition? I think it was said last month that, or two months ago that that could happen if the petitioner agrees to it. And the petitioner would then follow through with the petition going up to the county commissioners. Um, we've just... It's been done many times. Yeah, I was about to we've say done we've done it. things before. Especially with text amendments and things like that. I've rewritten all text amendments completely. Even though the petition came in one way, it went up looking like... Marilyn Monroe when it came in as something well, else. I'm going to say nay because I don't think there's been a substantial change. I think that in 2004 the property retained its uh, suburban estate. In 2010, once again, it retained. There was no request even for a rezoning. And to um, rely on the case that Mr. Stevens gave us, I don't think that um, it would meet that threshold. So I would I would say nay because I don't believe there was a mistake made. So I don't think that next step for rezoning would be appropriate. I agree with Shannon. Any other comment? Okay, we've had discussion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Wait a minute. Yeah. I voted aye. Okay, and those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, the motion does not, does not pass because we can't come up with a... Uh, thank you. Um, um, right. So I'm going to make a recommendation that uh, we uh, the 14.46 acre portion of parcel 143 on tax map 30 located in Price, Maryland, retain its current suburban estate zoning. There a second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 That's an unfavorable recommendation. Right. right. Yeah, we're Thank you. Uh, who is yeah. in favor? <laughs> Come on, Tim. Oh, okay. You can translate that. Okay. Thank you. All right. I hate to keep you, but we have one more. And oh, Joe, don't go anywhere. Who's <laughs> in favor of that? Of, of the last motion? Un to send an unfavorable? 
to, to was retain the in re favor of Jim's unfavorable I was. recommendation. Yes, yeah, it's him that's throwing you off because you would have thought. That yeah, you would have thought I voted against yeah, it because my motion failed. So every, everybody, it was unanimous. Did you, did yeah. you, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Barry's abstained, so five yeses. I didn't abstain. I just didn't vote. I'm yes, sure. that. Okay. Thank you, um, planning commission members. Okay. The next one is um, one that you've heard before, and again, it's a text amendment, and it's 1308. It's Light Industrial Highway Service, and the request from the one of the uh, property owners with LIHS, it's Gateway Commerce Center, and their property is on the, um, let me see, it's the uh, northeast corner, southeast corner of uh, 213. This. LIHS is only at the four corners in 213. Um, and their request is to add some additional uses to the LIHS. And at the last Planning Commission meeting, which was in April, um, the petition, the Planning Commission reviewed this and felt that some adjustments could be made. They heard from adjoining property owners and asked that the uh, petitioner go back and review what was originally in the 1993 zoning code um, and what the uses were. And I have put those in um, in, the, um, in the report I did. It was, um, it's page 416, and it, I highlighted. Sorry, Joe, you didn't get a copy? I didn't grab one. Okay. Anyway, the, the last page of the staff report, or the, the page before the last page, shows what was in the, it says 2003, but it was, um, that's as amended. So it was the zoning code um, that created the um, LIHS and the uses. So what I did was highlight those uses. And then when, if you see, go back to page three of the staff report, I have um, what is crossed out were the changes made by the applicant and, um, Blue is highlighting changes for changes added June 13th by petitioner. So the petitioner agreed to remove banks and other financial institutions, boat sales and repair, um, medical offices, and um, and re well add add professional remove medical offices and then complexes over 25,000 feet that would be removed. That was also removed from the before you, before you skip over that. We remove medical because medical and professional are the same, or, or because we don't want medical officers there. I think because we felt they were the same. Well, um, it's really unclear in the ordinance. I just I removed it because it was not in the original oh, right. one. I didn't stick exactly to the original, but it just didn't seem to make a, a huge amount of difference to my client. So I removed it to make it, you know, to have less uses there. And I think professional offices could include mm -hmm. medical, and I don't think we, we you know, what I'm saying. I don't saying, know that you've ever drawn that distinction. And said no. You have to, yeah, so. we, we, we allow, in, in Ken Island, we allow right. professional well, My offices. only point is I don't see any reason we would exclude that. I know. So if you okay. wanted to leave it, it would be fine. But I think they were being considered. I think they're part of professional. Yeah. And then uh, conference centers, convenience stores, with or without gas pumps, um, remove fast food restaurants, and then grocery stores and supermarkets excluding super uh, convenience stores because um, and then um, institutional uses new and used vehicle sales was removed and then the other ones that all remained were recreational vehicle sales re regional shopping centers all of which were in the um, the um, previous zoning code restaurant retail sales and stores and service businesses So uh, the only thing that I, I, I think I commented on was that I didn't, um, let me see, in keeping with the Planning Commission's direction to the petitioner, the uses that remain in the petitioner's text remission and were not in the 1996 um, Queen Anne's County Zoning Code are inconsistent. And then those, the two things that I found that were remained were the convenience stores with or without gas pumps, item six, and removing the excluding convenience stores restriction from grocery stores, item 12, and restaurant. None of those were in the, the 1996 as amended to 2003 Zoning Code. So I just want to point that out. It's up to you whether those are acceptable or not. 
right. That's right. Yeah. The, the, uh, the convenience stores were not in, and we added retail sales and stores. Right. Was not in there. And retail sales and stores is uh, retail sales and stores is defined under the ordinance. I didn't make it italicized, but it is defined. Yeah. And, we, and actually, I said service businesses in there. They, that could probably be deleted as well at the very end. Okay. Businesses. Yeah. All right. If uh, you want. And the one to. that I proposed. Okay. It's the last two pages of what you have here. Right. So. Um, okay. Well. So that's that's what we did. We went back and, 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 and narrowed it down some. A lot of it was in, but but those few things that Helen did mention were, were not in. I think probably the, the one that engendered the most dialogue from you all last time was convenience stores. Because there was gas stations in there before, you know, and now. So, you know, so I just wanted to point out. And um, Joe and I did meet on this, and, you know, we we, agreed. we saw more eye to eye than we did on the last one. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I mean, I I understand. I just wanted to follow through with what your request was, that and but again, it's if you think the accommodations been made or whatever. This is very. It's not like a map amendment. It's it's much more flexible. You can add things. <laughs> if the petitioner agrees. I would just agrees. throw out um, a comment that you're not gonna like. <laughs> But yeah, I'm like much of what happened today. Um, <laughs> I, to me, the idea of putting a regional shopping center or retail stores not in a growth area is defeating the purpose of what our whole zoning code has tried to do. Now, on the other side of that, that was part of this zone from the start. So I, I'm okay with leaving it in there, but I don't think that's the direction we should have gone with that. Well, you went with my first staff report that said it should be in a growth area. <laughs> That's what I said in the first staff report. Okay, oh, uh, right. Um, that's what it's been zoned for, though. So we do right. have to take that into account. That that's what it was originally planned for, and whether or not we like it or don't like it. I, well, I think that once you once you have fine. some rights, even though you haven't used them, and technically you're not legally entitled to them, I I personally believe that you're you should be entitled to rely that you can do certain things when you. Own That's a hefty legal question, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's really not because you're not entitled to squat until you actually start it. <laughs> it's but it's a, a moral, to me, question. it's more of a moral issue than a legal issue. Uh, it's part of your bundle of rights. I just, I think it's not the right thing to do there. I hope you do something else there. Do we have but, a quorum? I guess we do. Well, do we lose Luke? Yes. Yes. We have a quorum. Yeah. Okay. All right. We do. We got four. <laughs> okay. Any comments on this? If not, a well, recommendation for a favorable or unfavorable recommendation would be appropriate. Why not? Yeah. Uh, I, I recommend make a fav favorable recommendation recommendation for text amendment. This is 1308. Yes. Uh, uh, with the uh, the changes so noted. And I'm going to delete service business on number 27, just Thank so you. that you know, okay. because it's encompassed in retail stores. It really should stay retail stores. The definition is retail stores and service businesses. Okay. Got so it. I'm moving it to there. All right. And you're going to leave convenience stores in? Yes. Okay. Well, I say yes. Mm -hmm. To me, light highway, convenience store Absolutely. kind of go together. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. We all in agreement on the yes. media store? Okay. Um, we have a motion. We have a second. Second. Second in favor. Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that passes. Um, one out of two, ain't bad. One out of two, or one out of four. <laughs> 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 hey, Joe, you're not your worst day ever. Bad. Bad. But you know, I live to fight another day. <laughs> you're not beat up. You're not I live beat up. to fight another day. He keeps going up. Let me tell you, those other two, I, I, perfect. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll have it back next month with the questions that you guys all ask. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Helen, you got anything else? I don't. Cover? Um, Mr. Chairman, Steve. All right. Anyone from the public care to comment? It's down to you, Mr. Promisano. You're the only remaining public no, we have. No, no, no I'm, I'm gracing the station. I understand well, that, I, but you're the only member of the public here. I think, I, all I want to say is I think you guys did a very good job today. Why, thank you. Oh, that was very good. <laughs> <laughs> 100? Mr. Chairman, are we going to defer these to the discussion items? <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. did that without you. Shannon, you were out of the room. Sorry. Sorry. They, they Not a problem. Thank you. Yeah. All right, That's thank cool. you all. I have a motion that we uh, adjourn right here.